Honorable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Senator Cash. The Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. Thank you. Uh, and Senators, I wish to make a statement <clears throat> to the Chamber. After yesterday's debate, Senator McKim asked me to reflect on the right of Senators to raise points of order. The issue of points of order arose during the debate on the motion moved by Senator Faruqi and Waters. Senators will recall that at the outset of the debate, it was impossible to hear Senator Faruqi's contribution because of the level of interjection. I called senators to order on several occasions, asking that they respect the right of senators to be heard in silence in what was clearly a sensitive debate. I considered that the best approach I could bring to maintaining order was to require the debate to proceed without further interventions. This is not an approach I would ordinarily take, but I thought it was warranted on this occasion. I appreciate that some senators found this approach frustrating, and I thank Senator Waters for discussing these matters with me. I do recognise that senators ought to have the opportunity to raise points of order in relation to matters then before the Senate, as provided in Standing Order 1972. I remind senators that in raising points of order, all of us have a responsibility to raise those points of orders in a serious and sensible and practical manner. Of course, the parliament should be a place of robust debate, where ideas are put, contested and sometimes agreed, where these ideas are put in a respectful way and acknowledged in a respectful way. The Jenkins Review urges us to prioritise a safe and respectful culture and model safe and respectful behaviour. The burden of this cultural change in this workplace rests on all of us. It is up to each one of us to take positive steps and set the gold standard of what is and is not acceptable conduct. Thank you, Senators. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Mr. President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. And I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Military Rehabilitation and Compensation and Other Legislation Amendment Incapacity Payments Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Um, Senator Davia. Senator Davy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation and Other um, Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Uh, I want to point out that the opposition will be supporting this bill because this bill, in fact, mirrors a coalition initiative announced um, in our 2022-23 federal budget. Um, 
which we titled Maintaining Incapacity Payments for Veterans Studying. Um, I'm pleased to see that the government has effectively um, picked up our policy and will now deliver on it. Uh, this, pro this, this project is, is very important because it supports veterans um, in their rehabilitation, but particularly those veterans who are studying um, to be able to uh, ensure that they don't lose funding or that their funding is maintained for longer. Um, we established a trial um, to do this program, uh, which was to expire uh, on 30 June 2022, and our policy was to extend the trial for a further uh, 12 months, which we fully funded in um, our last budget, uh, to the tune of $7.1 million. Um, and that would extend it to 30 June 2023. Uh, this bill effectively matches our commitment. And um, what it will do prior to the trial, eligible veterans um, had their pre injury earnings reduced to 75 per cent after undertaking 45 weeks of study. Um, this bill will effectively provide extra financial support. Um, to allow those veterans to continue taking their further study. It's estimated that this bill will um, benefit 600 um, veterans uh, once it's passed. And I acknowledge that it also has a um, backdating mechanism so that veterans who've been on the trial, um, which expired at the end of June this year, uh, won't be worse off uh, and won't be out of pocket. Look, each year about 6,000 service men and women uh, leave the defence forces to return to civilian life, um, and many of them have a long, uh, an opportunity for a long career ahead of them. And a lot of them undertake further study in this transition to better prepare them for civilian life. We know that we need to support our veterans in this transition to ensure that um, they have the most chance of a successful transition to civilian life as possible. Um, we also know vocational rehabilitation equips veterans with the support and the resources that they need for this uh, most successful transition. Um, and we want to make it as simple as possible. We will not be standing in the way of this because um, support for veterans is not a political game, should not be a partisan game, mm -hmm. and uh, we really need to ensure that we support those who have sacrificed um, so much and dedicated their time to ensuring the safety and security of our nation. Um, when we were in government, the Liberals and the Nationals invested over $11.5 billion each year to support the well-being of around 340,000 veterans and their families. Um, and we want to ensure that this support continues and is improved on, because we recognise um, that we can always make improvements. We understand we have the Royal Commission into Veteran Suicides. Um, ongoing at the moment. Uh, but we know that those veterans who successfully transition to a uh, civilian career um, go on to be, uh, make vital contributions to our society. And so um, we thank the government for bringing forward um, this bill and we will be supporting it. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate we will be supporting the military rehabilitation and compensation and other legislation amendment incapacity payments bill. Uh, Mr Deputy President, the purpose of this bill um, is to, to make amendments to the Military Re Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 2004, as well as the Safety Rehabilitation and Compensation Defence Related Claims Act 1988. 
there was a trial, Mr. Deputy President, um, that had run um, up until the 1st of July 2022. Indeed, it ended on the 30th of June 2022. Um, um, and that trial um, provided that the calculation of incapacity payments would be based on 100 per cent of normal weekly earnings for veterans engaged in approved full-time study um, where that was a uh, under a DVA-funded return to work rehabilitation program. Um, as you would be aware, Deputy President, incapacity payments are compensation payments available under that 2004 Compensation Act, as well as the um, Defence Claims Act of 1988, for a loss of earnings incurred as a result of a service-related physical or mental health condition. Um, for many, for many veterans um, who weren't part of um, of this trial, they were literally making a choice between study and payments. Making a choice between study and payments. Um, incapacity payment recipients um, as, um, are in fact required to participate in a DVA rehabilitation program wherever they have the capacity to do. Um, this bill proposes to extend what is now a four-year trial, um, which was first implemented in, in the 2018-19 budget. Um, which actually removed um, the, the long-standing step-down for incapacity payments for veterans who were undertaking an approved study. And unfortunately, that trial ended on the 30th of June 2022. Mr Deputy President, for many veterans, being able to seek further study, to obtain qualifications, to further their step in a, in a, in a, in a, in a career post-defence, is perhaps one of the most critical measures that they can take to get their life back on track, to get their career back on track. And of course, these are veterans who have suffered an injury. And, and we've seen that the scale of the injuries suffered by veterans, too often psychological injuries um, caused by some of the uh, brutal conditions under which they served, some of them unnecessarily brutal, caused by the culture and nature of the Defence Force. Um, um, this bill provides, ensures that application provisions that student veterans who should have been eligible to continue to receive the higher rate of payment from 1 July 2022 um, and who received reduced payments after 1, 20, 1 July 2022 will now be eligible to also receive back payments to cover that period from 1 July 22 until today. So there's one of the reasons the Greens have supported this moving through as rapidly as possible through the parliament is because we've now had a number of these veterans engaged in study who haven't been receiving the full payment. Um, and that's tough. And the information that my office has heard from veterans' organisations is that, that, is, uh, that, that, that these veterans need this support now. I do want to acknowledge the um, ongoing work of my colleague, Senator Steele John, in relation to his support for veterans. Um, um, when I took over the portfolio, he raised this issue directly with me and said we need to do whatever we can to maintain those payments and to support the passage of this bill as rapidly as possible. And I acknowledge his work and the connections that he's made to many veterans and veterans' organisations in supporting their right for fair compensation and decency. So, Mr Deputy President, we support this bill. We support it rapidly passing through the Senate and we support the urgent restoration of these benefits to veterans. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, may I thank uh, the senators who have contributed to today's discussion. I note that um, both senators observe the urgency of passage of this bill. It's regrettable that uh, this bill was not, or the measures in this bill were not enacted in the last parliament, and it has, as Senator Shoebridge observed, uh, created the circumstances where people are presently not receiving payments who would otherwise be entitled to them. Um, I do wish to highlight to the Senate that one consequence of this bill will be to backdate payments for those veterans. Um, again, I acknowledge the significance of supporting our service personnel, veterans and families. Uh, I thank those people who contributed to this, uh, the development of this legislation and uh, who are participating in these um, activities. 
uh, and uh, particularly those who contributed to this debate who have served in our defence forces. And I commend the bill to the Senate. I put the question, question that this bill now be read a second time. Those questions say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. I put the question that the bill be read a third time. Those questions say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two. Defence Veterans and Families Acute Support Package Bill 2022. Second reading debate. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Again, this bill mirrors one that was brought in by the coalition in March this year um, that, had it passed, um, would already be in effect. Uh, it was due to commence on the 1st of July. However, unfortunately, it wasn't dealt with um, and lapsed with the last parliament. I commend the government for um, bringing forward uh, this bill. Um, which responds to recommendations from both the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee inquiry into veteran suicide, as well as the Productivity Commission's report, A Better Way to Support Veterans. We support this bill because it is reasonable and practical. Um, it harmonises veterans' entitlements across three veteran-related acts. Um, it extends the eligibility for support packages to family members of working age veterans and removes the requirement for them to have undertake, for the veterans to have undertaken warlike service. We know that we need to support our veterans. We know because the statistics show us and because of the harrowing personal evidence that is being presented to the Royal Commission into veteran suicide. We know we haven't got the best record when it comes to supporting our veterans, and we know we need to do better. Now, I don't want to put people off a career in the Defence Forces. And indeed, I spent um, 15 years in the Australian Army Reserves, and I uh, really I loved every minute of it. Um, and many, many of our Defence Force personnel have good experiences, uh, make a successful transition to civilian life and have a long and um, flourishing second career. Um, but unfortunately for some, they need support and their families need support. And this bill ensures that support can be provided and wrapped around the families when they need it. Importantly, uh, this bill allows programs to be tailored for unique family circumstances because we know everyone's experience is different and every family is different and what they need when they need it um, varies greatly between circumstances. Families are absolutely integral to supporting our veterans. We, we've heard through the Royal Commission um, that often it's the families who are left picking up the pieces when uh, our veterans feel isolated, alone and broken. And I, I thank our veterans' families who do so much to support their family members, but these people who um, have given service to our nation. This bill is designed to ensure that those families have the support they need so they can support their veterans. Um, support services can vary from psychological services to in-home services 
to gardening, and this is why it is a very important integral bill. Many of our veterans live in regional Australia, and we need to do more to support our veteran community. And that's why our government, when, uh, when we were on the other side of the chamber, um, we had committed five million to support um, veteran wellbeing centres uh, around Australia in areas of high veteran numbers, areas uh, like in Page and Cowper. Um, in fact, Dr David Gillespie made this point in the other place when he spoke on this bill in support of this bill, but pointed out that the government is yet to um, commit to uh, adopting that $5 million uh, grant for veteran wellbeing centres. These centres were going, uh, as I said, were going to be strategically located. They were to be established in partnership with ex-service organisations, like the Han Hunter Anzac Memorial um, uh, Association and like the North Coast Veteran Wellbeing Network. Um, these organisations that do so much to support our veterans, that are volunteer organisations, but who have come together with a realistic proposal for wellbeing centres that we were going to fund, um, that we announced prior to the election, but we've not heard from the government what their plans are for that funding and those wellbeing centres. We know that our veteran network are crying out for this sort of support. These wellbeing centres were part of our government's national approach to delivering integrated support services to veterans and their families by working with these local organisations, with our uh, veterans community and our defence community. So um, I call on the new government to commit to these centres, but also to commit to them where they're needed, which is where the veterans live, and not to uh, move them into areas of political convenience. Because the sacrifice our veterans and their families have made for the defence and security of our country is incredible. And I thank them. I thank all, all veterans and indeed um, current serving personnel. We need to make sure we look after those who've looked after us. And so I commend this bill to the chamber. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I might give Senator Fawcett the call. Yeah. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. Acting. Uh, sorry, Deputy President. Um, I to rise to address the Defence Veterans and Families Acute Support Package Bill of 2022. Uh, this bill, uh, as has been stated, uh, was originally uh, brought in by the former government, but it is in response, in large part, uh, by both the current government and former government, to an inquiry that was uh, undertaken by the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, uh, which issued a report in 2017 called The Constant Battle, Suicide by Veterans. Uh, that report made 24 recommendations after a fairly extensive period of engaging with veterans and particularly families uh, around the nation and hearing about the various aspects of interaction with the military, but particularly post-military life, uh, and some of the frustrations with the different legislation, the, the bureaucracy, the lack of resources uh, that had a, a significant impact on the mental health of veterans. I'd like to just talk a little about some of the background of some of these measures because it highlights the role that individuals have played in bringing about change and highlights that our parliamentary democracy does work. First off, the chair of that committee was the late Senator Alex Gallagher. And uh, Senator Gallagher uh, did a power of work uh, in this area. And it's a highlight of how 
the different political parties in this place, including the crossbench, can work very constructively on issues that are of national significance. And it's not the impression the Australian public often have. But the reality is, in some of these areas, uh, this work is very constructive. And so I thank Alex uh, for his leadership uh, of that committee. I just want to also touch very briefly on some of the statements in the chair's forward uh, to this report. And I quote, for modern veterans, it's likely that suicide and self-harm will cause more deaths and injuries for their contemporaries than overseas operational service. That's a pretty stark uh, observation of the situation facing some people. It does go on to say, however, in the forward, and I quote, it's also important to recognise that the majority of ADF members will leave their service enriched by the experience, will go on to be successful in their civilian endeavours. The members of the ADF receive some of the best training in the world and leave the service with valuable skills and experience that can be transferred to benefit Australian society in a broad field of endeavours. Veterans are an essential part of the fabric of our society. An inquiry has highlighted that a number of persons with military experience are contributing in politics, business, health services, public service, charities and civil society. Not all the examples provided to the committee have been negative ones. There have been many instances of veterans pulled back from the brink by partners, friends, advocates, health professionals. And DVA clients have expressed their attitude with the assistance they have received from DVA and other agencies." End quote. And so, I think it's important to highlight that because often when we talk on these issues, people will get the sense that to be part of the military and all it does for Australia uh, is overwhelmingly negative, whereas that is not necessarily the case. And I certainly speak from experience, having had over 20 years in the regular army and another period in the active reserve. And I believe that it has provided a fantastic foundation for many of the things that I have subsequently undertaken uh, in this place and beyond. But for those in the veteran space, the last part I'd like to quote from this forward, which goes to the two pieces of legislation we're considering today, is a paragraph that says, and I quote, a unique aspect of this inquiry has been examining the framework of military compensation arrangements and their administration through the lens of the issue of suicide by veterans. And this focus has highlighted the burden of legislative complexity and administrative hurdles on veterans who are often seeking support at a vulnerable period of their lives." End quote. And I would add to that that often those hurdles exist for the families of veterans as well as veterans themselves, which brings me to this bill. Uh, has, as has been outlined by my colleagues, uh, this bill seeks to uh, implement some of the recommendations of that uh, Senate report, particularly around harmonisation. Uh, of those three pieces of legislation, uh, but also remove some of the hurdles uh, that have faced people. Uh, and the warlike service is an example where for many years you had to have actually served uh, in a war or warlike service, whereas we see uh, some veterans and their families who are facing significant issues because of accidents and issues that occur during training and in peacetime. And in South Australia just recently, a veteran, Mr Darren Harvey, uh, led an effort to get recognition for veterans uh, who were training at Singleton nearly 30 years ago. And he, along with his fellow recruits, were on a range at Singleton, kicked a grenade which was unexploded, and it exploded and resulted in him being in hospital for an extended period of time and still having issues with uh, the physical issues of that. Uh, thankfully, uh, the Army has, after 30 years, actually provided uh, a recognition uh, to those recruits for their service. But it indicates that there are people who haven't necessarily conducted warlike service who have received injuries and do need the support uh, of the government. Specifically, this bill responds to recommendation 19 of the report and it's around the ways to support families. And uh, it includes, uh, amongst other things, expanding the eligibility of those who can receive support. Uh, importantly, it says that also the 
Uh, bill ensures that payments for veterans and their families are exempt from income tax and are not included as income for the purposes of social security determinations, and that has been a bugbear for veterans for many years. But to the point I made at the start, I'd just like to highlight that the parliamentary process works, in that representative democracy works. And I'd like to highlight here particularly uh, the role of Ms Ellen Gillespie, um, a lady from South Australia, who brought to uh, our attention the fact that the current rules and guidelines which were in place meant that you could be the spouse of a veteran, you could support that veteran for decades, giving up career, travelling, moving, nursing, supporting through post-traumatic stress and a whole range of issues. But then if that relationship broke down and the spouse was now perhaps at the end of the age where they could be uh, working, the veteran would have moved on to continue having the support of the community, but the spouse would be left with little or no superannuation, no entitlement to the benefits that came from being someone who had supported a veteran for all those years, and particularly exacerbated if there was domestic violence involved in the breakup of that relationship. And so her advocacy, her willingness to talk about her story has brought about changes uh, that have already been put in place, and I thank in particular uh, the Deputy Commissioner of DVA, Ms Janice Silby in South Australia, who engaged and listened uh, and brought Ms Gillespie into uh, various opportunities to uh, explain so that the bureaucracy can understand the situation of what is a relatively small group, but a group that we all the, time, all the same should be looking after. And I'm pleased to see that this bill uh, recognises that the eligibility be expanded to members of working age veterans who are at risk of or in crisis, along with working age widowed partners of deceased veterans and former partners uh, under certain circumstances. And so I wish to thank Ellen uh, for her courage in speaking up. I thank her for her care for her former partner uh, over all those years. But I also uh, just want to highlight that our parliamentary democracy works. Our representative democracy works, and this is a good example of it. And uh, so I am pleased to lend my support to this bill today. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I rise to indicate that the Greens will be supporting the Defence Veterans and Families Acute Support Package Bill 2022, um, but with some reservations and concerns. This bill amends the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986, the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 2004 and the Safety Rehabilitation and Compensation Defence Related Claims Act 1988. The purpose of the bill is to extend, extend eligibility to veterans and their family members who are covered by each of those three acts. And it does it for those veterans and family members who are at risk of or in crisis. And, and critically, and this is one of the key reasons the Greens support the bill, it expands, extends, extends the criteria for access to those veterans to be whether or not the veteran is participating in a rehabilitation program or has rendered war-like service. Um, the bill is a further response to Recommendation 19 of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee report, The Constant Battle, Suicide by Veterans. Uh, Acting Deputy President, suicide by veterans is a deeply, deeply tragic um, um, a story in Australia. Um, since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last few decades, more veterans have lost their lives through suicide than in armed conflict. Um, and, and when you look at the interim report of the Royal Commission into defence and veteran suicides, uh, you will see from that report that in many ways the system that's meant to be supporting veterans is, is indeed tearing them down and denying them support, putting them through torturous processes and indeed in many cases, far too many cases, is aggravating the harm, aggravating the harm that they suffered um, uh, while, on, while on service. This bill is, is at least an attempt to respond to that in part. 
Um, why do we have Recommendation 19 and why do we have this bill? Well, I think it's useful going back to the Senate committee report and to see why Recommendation 19 was put in. And, and that, that report said as follows. Uh, a consistent theme from the evidence received was there was a lack of support for the partners, those for the partners, those veterans who have mental health conditions or have acquired severe disabilities arising from their service. The partners of veterans often act as a keystone of support for veterans, some as full-time or part-time carers. The situation of veterans often markedly declines when these relationships fail. In the view of the committee, this is a critical area for DVA to investigate and develop further measures of support. And that's why we get Recommendation 19, which reads, the committee recommends that the Department of Veteran Affairs review the support for partners of veterans to identify further avenues for assistance. This review should include services such as information and advice, counselling, peer support and options for family respite care to support partners of veterans. Um, the, a similar bill to this was indeed introduced by the coalition in the last parliament, um, but and I, I won't review the history. I know my, my, my colleague, Senator Steelejohn, is critical of the delay and, and for good reasons, but was not passed before the 2022 election. Um, the main changes that are uh, proposed to, through the family support program um, are as follows. Removing the eligibility requirement for veterans to have had warlike service. So we give that a tick. Removing a requirement for eligible veterans to be participating in a rehabilitation program. We also give that a tick. Allowing veterans and the families of veterans with service prior to July 2004 to access the program. That's good. And increasing the amount of assistance available and removing the limits for specific services so families have flexibility to what assistance they access. Um, the cost of this package um, um, over some four years is very modest, particularly in the scale of the defence budget. Um, and one of the reasons why it's modest is because of the limitations the government is proposing for it. So a key eligibility criteria is that individuals or a family member need to be at risk, need to be in crisis or at risk of a crisis. That's not defined in the bill and perhaps that's a good thing. It can be set out in more granularity in the um, documents that follow the passage of this bill. But the bill also places a new age cap of 65 years for access to the program. And that is a red flag for us. Um, and it's a red flag for many veterans. Indeed, the current program provides access to veterans aged up to the age disability eligibility age, which is currently 66 and a half years. And the reason that's a red flag for us and a very real concern mm -hmm. is because if you go back into that same report, the Senate report, which, forms, which, which, which crafted Recommendation 19, the paragraph that follows, mm -hmm. that, very, that, that very recommendation, is as follows, and I'll read it. The committee was also concerned to receive evidence regarding the challenges which may face veterans moving from DVA support into aged care. It was apparent that the loss of access to services such as veterans' home care and the rehabilitation appliances program could have serious implications for elderly, vet elder elderly veterans transitioning to aged care. Although this was not a focus of, during the inquiry, the committee notes the importance of this issue given the large number of elder elderly veterans. Now, um, my colleague, Senator Steelejohn, um, in, in reviewing the, um, the, the coalition's bill in the last parliament, and this very closely matches the coalition's bill, um, had it costed what it would be to remove that age cap and retain two, three or four years of additional support and benefits to veterans. And whilst it, it, it was not... Um, um, uh, uh, whilst, whilst, whilst the support would require a real financial contribution from the government, um, the contribution would be, if you put it in the context of the defence budget, um, entirely appropriate to support veterans as they do that transition. Um, removing the age cap and providing five years of family support um, under the coalition's <coughs> bill, and I say again, this closely matches that. Um, would cost some $115 million in the first year. Doing it, um, um, doing it in the third year um, would cost um, um, some $300 million. I'm not pretending, the Greens aren't pretending that isn't a significant cost to budget. But what cost do we put on supporting veterans? Well, we know what cost the government has put on supporting veterans in this bill, a little bit under $40 million. Mm. 
Um, but we know from the, recommendation, the, 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 the findings of the, the Senate report that it's as veterans transition into aged care, they age out of the system, that they're losing these supports and they are especially vulnerable. Mm. We did have um, my office had a series of repeated discussions um, um, with the minister. Um, those discussions with the minister um, were not able to move the government on this, um, but we urged the minister. We did it in those in those discussions. We do it again today in this chamber mm. to lift the eligibility cap, because that hard and fast ageing out of support isn't the support the veterans need. It's not the support that families need. Um, so the Greens will be supporting this bill because it takes us forward. It provides additional benefits, critical additional benefits, consistent with that recommendation from the Senate committee. But there is so much more work to be done here, and we cannot and we will not forget those veterans um, aged who are heading into aged care and moving to retirement age. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, and I rise to respond to the contributions of senators, and I thank the, the senators who have contributed to this debate. Um, can I start by acknowledging the contribution of Senator Fawcett, who um, appropriately and generously recognised both the contribution of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, but also uh, its chair at the time, uh, the late Senator Alex Gallagher. Um, I was very pleased to hear um, Senator Fawcett provide that acknowledgement to um, our friend and colleague Alex, and uh, I wish to associate myself with his remarks in that regard. It seems appropriate to perhaps also acknowledge that Senator Fawcett served on that same committee during that period, uh, having served with him on other committees. Uh, I served with him for an extended period of time on the parliamentary uh, Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security. I know that um, Senator Fawcett brings routinely that same good faith engagement to the work, to his committee work, uh, and it's. Um, I'm sure it's very pleasing to him to see the work that he undertook in that period on that committee brought forward in legislation today as well. Um, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Thank you also for your contribution, and I acknowledge um, uh, the engagement that you have had with the government um, and with the minister. Um, I know that you are concerned about the cap, and perhaps I might provide this information for the benefit of the chamber. Uh, it is true that the current program is targeted at working age families under 65 who face challenges following the death of their veteran or due to that veteran's incapacity for work. It's not intended to support older families for whom a range of other supports are available. Um, and the new program takes into account the typical retirement age for veterans based on when they served. Um, however, we do intend to continue working with the veterans community and consulting with the veterans community about um, the forms of support that are required. Uh, and I suppose I would also observe that the package intends to complement other forms of support available to veterans and their dependents. It's not designed to serve to support families in the long term. It is for families facing immediate challenges um, arising from the incapacity of the veteran. Um, perhaps in summing up, I can simply say this. This parliament has been confronted on many occasions now by harrowing stories of hardship experienced by people serving in the Defence Force and by veterans. Uh, our government is determined to work with the veteran community and with serving defence personnel to ensure that we provide the best possible support to people who make an enormous contribution to our nation. We acknowledge too that for many people the experience is very positive, but for those who it is not, we need to provide support. And the Australian community has a clear expectation that veterans and their families will be let well looked after. Um, the bill before us is just one step in a series of measures we are taking to improve the wellbeing of veterans. And I commend it to the Senate and thank senators for their contribution again. 
The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' entitlements and military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. We have no circulated amendments. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I'll call the minister. Uh, I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' entitlements and military rehabilitation, rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment, lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill 2022. Second reading debate. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it won't come as a surprise to people, but the opposition will be supporting the substantive elements of this bill because this bill actually gives effect to uh, coalition initiatives when the coalition was in government previously. So, at a very high level, let me just recap for people that this bill delivers on an election commitment of the former coalition government to increase the income limits for the Commonwealth Senior Health Care Card. The coalition, at the time, as it does today, understands that every dollar counts when older Australians are, are looking to meet what are escalating cost of living challenges for them and their families uh, when they're no longer working. Senior Australians have worked very hard to make Australia all that it is today, and the coalition believes it's important that the country takes care of them in return. The coalition commitment is the first major change of indexation to the income threshold of the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card in over 20 years. So we are grateful that the government has adopted the previous government's measure and brought it to the parliament for legislation. It's worth noting that during the election, Labor quickly adopted the coalition's policy and it's shamelessly rebranding it as one of its own today. However, now we see the Albanese government has pushed the state, uh, state the start date back beyond the 1st of July, as when it was announced during their campaign. Uh, I think many Australians would see this as yet another Labor broken promise. But what this bill does, it shines a light on another very, very pressing issue in our country at the moment, and one that the government has been slow to respond to. Shame. That pressing issue is the rising cost of living challenges in our country. That issue is compounded by the fact that there are severe labour shortage issues across our country. Two issues compounding, working against each other and making life very, very difficult for older Australians. So this is an opportunity this morning to do more for older Australians than the government is proposing. So I'm foreshadowing that the opposition will be moving up amendments to this social security bill to make it easier to incentivise older Australians to go back into the workforce. Many people will understand, they'll know it anecdotally as they walk around their communities, they know that there are many Australians, many older Australians, who would like to work more but don't do so because the system, the financial system as it currently operates, significantly, significantly inhibits them from doing that. So we will be moving amendments to this Social Security Bill to do a number of things. To raise the work bonus limit from $300 to $600 a fortnight, meaning that older Australians and veterans today can only earn up to $300 a fortnight before they face a very, very harsh tax system that then punishes them for 50 cents in every dollar they earn over $300. The amendment that the opposition will be moving will lift that, lift that to $600 a fortnight. And we believe, as small businesses across the country believe, as older Australian uh, associations believe, this will be a significant improvement to incentivising 
older Australians back into the, to the workforce. This, through our amendment, will be a permanent measure, unlike other initiatives, which I'll come to in a moment, which are temporary measures. If this amendment is successful, it will be a permanent feature of the work bonus system and it will allow older Australians to come back into the workforce and, in doing so, alleviate those very, very real challenges that are being faced by small and medium businesses across the country. This is not a new issue. This is not a new issue. And in fact, this issue has been top of mind for older Australians and top of mind for businesses for a very, very long time. Indeed, last week, the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee heard evidence from a whole variety of organisations across our country that reinforced the fact that more needed to be done by this government to alleviate labour shortage issues across our community and to better incentivise older Australians into the workforce. What does Treasury think about labour shortage issues in our country? Last week, officials from the Treasury had this to say. They said that labour shortages currently across the country, across the economy, are quite severe. Are quite severe. The government's own Treasury officials are saying that labour shortage issues in our country are severe. A month ago, the government had a jobs and skills summit. Some people criticised it as a talk fest. Other people were prepared to give it the benefit of the doubt. So a month later, a month later, why is it that this parliament has not yet seen this parliament has not yet seen the legislation that was going to give effect to what the government called one of its most immediate and urgent initiatives. Where is it? Where is it? Now, it may well be that the legislation appears in the House of Representatives today. It may well be. But that doesn't excuse the fact that one whole month, one whole month it has taken for the government to bring forward an initiative that it thinks will improve worker shortages and incentivise older Australians into the workforce. People have got a right to ask, why is the government dragging its feet when older Australians are living with real cost of living challenges now? Why is the government dragging its feet on giving small businesses and medium businesses in our economy the opportunity to hire local older Australians and veterans and start to fix those labour shortage issues immediately? Why? Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? By his own admission, the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, said this week that cost of living challenges were skyrocketing. Wow! The Treasurer says that cost of living challenges in our country are skyrocketing, and a month after the job summit, we still don't have any news of Labor's initiative that would help older Australians back into the workforce and, in doing so, alleviate labour shortage issues. So that's why the opposition is stepping forward. The opposition is going to seek to amend the government's bill to import a mechanism that will provide cost of living relief immediately for older Australians and go some way in meeting those severe, cost of, uh, severe labour shortage issues that the Treasury thinks exists. We believe in the opposition that the best, most effective and most timely way to do that is to increase the work bonus scheme, which currently exists in our social security arrangements, to raise it from $300 a fortnight to $600 a fortnight, and we expect that will have a positive impact on attracting older Australians and veterans into the workforce. Labour shortages in our country are widespread. This is what the Grain Producers Association of Australia had to say last week. They said, noting the severe workforce shortages across our country, they said a massive pool of very skilled people out there they have, uh, are retired and they are willing to come back and help part-time. They like job sharing and they don't really 
and they don't like really long hours, but they are willing and able to contribute to our economy. If we look at the red tape and, in the co and complex superannuation laws and complex pension earning laws, etc., we can find a way to provide a better incentive for them to enter the workforce. A key benefit of the, of the opposition's initiative is that older Australians living in regional communities will be able to go and work in their regional cafe, their regional petrol station, on their local farm and go some way in alleviating these labour shortage issues across our country. I suspect, I suspect that Labor, the new Labor government, is half-hearted. Yep. I think they are half-hearted mm -hmm. about giving older Australians the opportunity to enter the workforce. Mm -hmm. They are half-hearted about correcting labour shortage issues in our country, and that's why their initiative from the job summit, which we still haven't seen in the parliament, is temporary yep. and less generous than the coalition's. Wow. Yep. This is a bad way to start. The Treasurer is saying cost of living issues are real and severe and, severe and skyrocketing. The Treasury is saying that labour shortage issues are severe. And why is the government waiting? The government could take the coalition's initiatives, take its amendments, put them in their own name, and we would have a part solution to those issues immediately. We could leave this parliament this evening and older Australians and small businesses would have a better solution. Yeah, yeah. I'll give way to other coalition senators who I know want to make a contribution, but the challenge now is for the government to step up, act now and provide an immediate solution to older for older Australians and small businesses. Here, here. Senator Rice. President, I'll begin by foreshadowing that the Greens will be supporting this bill. We're supporting it because we believe that Australia needs a more generous income support system across the board. I do note, however, that some submissions to the Senate inquiry raise concerns about the government's approach. ACOS said that it wasn't well targeted, that expanding the income test will not help those who are most in need. There were submissions, of course, that supported it. The Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation said that the ANMF supports the proposed changes to the bill particularly with regard to the positive health impacts it would, had, it would have, where the increased income test limits will allow more individuals access to relevant pharmaceutical and medical benefits and lower GP co-payments where applicable. And the Council of the Ageing were also supportive, saying that they supported the proposed lifting of the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card. And the Greens will support it as well. And clearly enabling people who are of um, age, pension age, who aren't receiving other social security payments to receive some be extra benefits is going to be something that will be very appreciated and of much value to people while the cost of living continues to increase. And it's something that, given the struggles for people to survive, given the increasing cost of living, living across the board, um, is of value. But we continue to have a central concern that while Labor and indeed the Liberal Party and now at the amendments that Senator Smith has foreshadows, foreshadowed have introduced policy proposals and bills in relation to age pensioners, there has been not enough pro proposals being foot, put forward to address the giant gaps in our social security system across the board for everyone everyone who is, who is trying to survive on income support. I mean, this bill recognises that older people with incomes of up to $90,000 in fact need extra support through having access to a healthcare card, which will enable them to have access to the extended Medicare safety net and cheaper medicines under the PBS. It recognises that even if you've got an income of up to $90,000, you are not living in luxury and that having access to those extra benefits will help you um, deal with the increasing cost of living. But that's for people with incomes of up to $90,000. How about thinking about other people in our community who are surviving on incomes way, way less than that? People surviving on job seeker, on youth allowance, on student allowance, on parenting allowance. I mean, the rate of job seeker 
is $47 a day, which adds to an annual income of $17,155. The poverty line in Australia has just been re-established today, the Henderson Poverty Line. The Melbourne um, Institute have put out their three-month update of what the Henderson Poverty Line is, and it's $88 a day. $88 a day, or $32,000 a year, is what the Melbourne Institute, what the Henderson Poverty Line says that's what people need in Australia if they are not going to be living in poverty. Here we are with this bill, recognising that people on incomes of up to $90,000 need extra support, and yet we have got people absolutely languishing in poverty, absolutely not able to afford medicines, not able to put food on the table, not able to afford their rent. At risk, if, not only at risk, people who are homeless who are trying to survive on income support because they've been turfed out of their houses by increasing rent. People who are struggling, who are ill because they can't afford medicines to treat their illnesses. People who have got undiagnosed illnesses because they can't afford the gap payments to go and see specialists just to have diagnostic tests done. But I had a, a story shared with me recently of a student who was living on student allowance who, despite surviving with you know, dumpster diving and second-hand clothes and walking to his, his courses rather than even catching public transport, which he couldn't afford, he fell ill. And he could not afford to get the diagnostic tests done to determine what his illness was. So he struggled. He suffered. He took much longer to finish his studies because he was ill, because he had an undiagnosed illness. And then we had the, the wonderful experiment during the COVID crisis, where we doubled the rate of income support, where we doubled the job seeker allowance, and suddenly people who had been struggling in poverty, poverty found that they could afford, actually, to feed themselves. They could afford to use public transport. They could afford to go and get the tests done. And this student then got their tests done. They had their illness diagnosed. They were able to get surgery, and they got well. And now they are working, paying taxes. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be supporting everybody in our community who is currently living on income support to be able to live a decent life. We need a guaranteed livable income for all. It's not just good for the individuals, it is good for our whole community. We need an overarching, complete, structured re reassessment of our income support system. And we need to have everybody to be able to be living above the poverty line. So at the moment, yes, we will be supporting this bill because it's going to make life easier for people who are struggling with the cost of living. We acknowledge that. That's why we're supporting it. But there are so many people who aren't going to, be, uh, uh, aren't going to have their poverty addressed by this bill. We have an appalling gap in the rate of payments between what people are struggling on and what they need to survive. People being forced to rely on income support payments that are way below the poverty line. So look, we'll support this bill. It's a really good step forward. It's, we need to be increasing our rate of support payments, but we need to be doing more. So we will call upon this government, and we will keep calling on this, upon this government, to raise the rate of income support across the board. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President, and I thank uh, both the Opposition and the Greens for the um, preliminary uh, indication that uh, you uh, are supporting uh, this legislation. Uh, the bill gives more self-funded retirees access to Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, easing some of the costs uh, of living pressures that they are uh, currently facing. The Commonwealth Seniors Health Card is available to Australians who have reached age pension age and are ineligible for an income support payment due to their income and or uh, assets. Cardholders uh, gain access to Commonwealth Health concessions including concessional co-payments for pharmaceutical benefit schemes, medicines, and uh, concessional thresholds for the pharmaceutical benefit scheme safety net and the extended Medicare safety net. 
State and territory governments and some private entities may offer additional concessions at their own discretion. The income limit for a person who is uh, single will increase from uh, the current $61,284 to a new limit of uh, $98,054. This single income limit also applies to a person who is a member of uh, an illness-separated couple, a member of a uh, respite care couple, or a member of a couple whose partner is in jail. The income limit for each member of a couple will increase from uh, the current uh, $49,027 to a new limit of $72,000. This means the Commonwealth Seniors Card uh, Health Card income limit for a couple will increase to $144,000 of combined income. This bill was due to commence on the 20th of September 22. However, Due to the uh, suspension of Parliament uh, following the death of uh, Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth II, the bill uh, uh, could not be passed in time for the increase to be implemented on the 20th of September 2022, uh, as uh, was originally intended. As a result, the government will move amendments to allow the increase uh, to the income limits to take effect seven days following the uh, royal assent uh, to. Uh, to the bill. Um, the Albanese uh, government is committed, uh, as we know, to easing cost of living pressures, and this bill is a practical example uh, that will support uh, older Australians. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. So there have been amendments circulated, so we will move into Committee of the Whole. It's at the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole. There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Chair, I now move opposition amendment on behalf of uh, Senator Smith, number uh, 1643. Order. Please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, Minister, wait till you get the call. You have the call. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Chair. Uh, and I table the supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments uh, to be moved to this bill. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and again, uh, with all due respect, thank you. Uh, I move opposition amendments on sheet 1643. Senator Cash. Uh, I'll defer to Senator Smith. Senator Smith, you have the call. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, as uh, briefly mentioned in my contribution on the substantive bill, the coalition is moving a number of amendments which will give effect to providing immediate relief to small businesses across our country who are suffering from labour shortages. In addition to that, it will remove a significant disincentive to many older Australians who want to re-enter the workforce. That disincentive is that the work bonus scheme provides up to $300 a fortnight um, before older Australians are penalised uh, for every extra dollar they earn. The amendment will lift that from $300 a fortnight to $600 a fortnight. Uh, we're confident uh, that that is an initiative is an incentive that many older Australians will find attractive and many of them will be encouraged and will desire to re-enter the workforce for a variety of reasons. And we can't underestimate how important work is to people's self-esteem. But this has been predicated on a very immediate and urgent problem for many older Australians, and that is the escalating cost of living. It is hurting older Australians the hardest. We think this is the right time through which to embrace these initiatives, amend this bill and provide that immediate relief for older Australians and, in doing so, provide small to medium-sized businesses in our country with greater labour options. 
Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Chair. Um, the Greens will be supporting these amendments that um, have been moved by the opposition because, as I um, foreshadowed in my speech, we will be supporting any measures that are improving the income support in our society. Obviously, these measures um, that Senator Smith is, has, is, has put forward again only address sort of the issues being faced by older people, in this case allowing people who are on the age pension and to be able to earn more. But we think that's a good start. We think that should be supported. We need a more generous income support system in this country across the board. This is a good start. Poverty is a political choice. We can choose to introduce measures here that will lift people out of poverty, and this is a good measure that will help lift people out of poverty. So we will be supporting this measure, but again, we call upon the opposition, we call upon the Labor Party to actually be doing much more because there are people across the board, whether they are young or old, whether they are working or not working, who are really, really struggling, who are doing it so tough, who are struggling to put food on the table, who are not being able to afford to pay the rent and are being found to be homeless, who cannot afford medicines. All of these things across the board Australians are struggling with. So we will support this measure as one measure that will help some Australians. It's a start, but it's not enough. Being Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, well, I note that the uh, amendment has only just been uh, circulated. Uh, well, it's your amendment, uh, Senator Rustin. You can ignore, it was your you fault. Can ignore the interjection, it was your Senator fault. Farrell, and please continue. Thank you, thank you, Chair. That's very good advice. Um, the um, I should ignore most things the opposition says. Senator Farrell, yeah. come to the point. Thank you for that reminder, Chair. Uh, the former government spent uh, nine years doing nothing to boost workforce participation. It was the last uh, Labor government who introduced uh, the work bonus in uh, uh, 2009. Uh, only in the uh, last month or so has the opposition taken steps to encourage pensioner uh, workforce uh, participation through Senator uh, Dean Smith's private uh, senator's bill. However, uh, Senator Smith's uh, bill is uh, just a doubling of the existing uh, work bonus and doesn't uh, provide pensioners with the flexibility that the government bill offers. The government, the government uh, has announced that from the 1st of December until the 30th of June 2023, pensioners uh, of uh, the age pension age will benefit from a $4,000 increase in the maximum work bonus uh, income bank balance, and that results in an increase from $7,800 to $11,800. This increase uh, will be credited to eligible pensioners' income banks up front so they will be able to earn an additional $4,000 from employment income this financial year without losing any of their uh, pension. This provides an immediate benefit to any pensioner uh, over age, uh, pension age who works and will help address the labour shortages. So the question is that opposition amendments three and eight on sheet one six four three be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. No, I'm sorry, I'm on my feet. Oh, sorry, I didn't no, see no, you there. No, I don't. no you're expert. Well, you're on. You're on your feet now, Senator Pratt. So you have the call. Senator Pratt, you have the call. Well, I'm, I, I understand we have the opposition's amendments uh, before us and from the government benches I'm seeking uh, to properly understand them. I know they've made a case for um, increasing the work bonus, but as I understand it, we understand that the first $300 of fortnightly income is not assessed and is not counted under the pension income test, and that any unused part of the work bonus can be accrued up to a maximum of $7,800, 
Can, can you explain, um, please, Minister? I'm, uh, I'm keen to understand how the accrual works. Um, I know that we're really keen, for example, to see um, to see people be able to make the most of seasonal work, and uh, you know we have the great privilege here in this place of being served by the amazing Comcar workforce. And many of those people are retirees and some of them pensioners. And so I'm interested um, I'm interested to understand uh, how that accrual impacts uh, well the time over which you can accrue that. Um, in terms of using it up, because clearly people want to save money, so you don't just want to accrue a maximum of seven eight seven thousand eight hundred dollars. You also want to be able to spend that money or to save it, and you don't want to max out. So I'm interested to know, in the context of uh, this bill, and if we've got an understanding of what the opposition understands, the time period for that accrual. Senator Smith. Well, thank you, Senator. Smith. I take that as a great compliment. That with all of the resources available to the government, the government senator needs to ask the opposition oh, about about the detail of how the existing social security income support mechanism works in our country. First point. Second point. Second point, that question was two minutes and 20 seconds in length. In the parliament, we call that filibustering. Ah. We don't call that a question. In my contribution earlier today, I said that the government was lukewarm, yes. half-hearted yes. about wanting to improve the circumstances facing older Australians and was lukewarm, half-hearted in wanting to correct labour shortage issues in our country. You saw it for yourself. You're witnessing it for yourself. We can deal with this very, very quickly. The government can add it to its bill, and in, by the time we leave this parliament tonight, older Australians will be given a clear way of combating escalating cost of living increases. And in addition to that, many small businesses across our country will have an immediate answer to some of the most pressing economic needs that they are facing. But instead, the government and its senators want to delay the vote that would put this into the law now. Senator Pratt, well supported by advisers from the government, knows the answers to the questions she's asking me. I encourage her. I encourage Senator Farrell. I encourage Senator Polly. I thank Senator Rice for her contribution. The time is now to make life easier for older Australians and small businesses. So the question, Senator Farrell. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I uh, have a question for uh, Senator uh, Smith. Um, I think it's um, order, order on the left. The only, the only thing embarrassing, Senator Rustin, is the circumstances in which you left the Australian economy when you were kicked out of government uh, so, some, Senator Farrell, some months. Resume your seat. Firstly, please make your remarks through the chair. And secondly, Senator Rustin is not over that side of the chamber. But please continue. You have the call. Well, with respect, uh, Chair, um, Senator Rustin was making a Comment, and I was simply responding to her uh, to her comment. Um, and uh, now she's now left the chamber. But um, uh, at the Farrell, point I made you, you my comment, it, it is not practice to refer to senators leaving a chamber because they may be leaving the chamber for a variety of reasons. But you have the call. Well, I was simply responding to your. Um, query about why I was referring to Senator Rustin, and the reason I was referring to uh, Senator Rustin was simply because she made a comment, and I was responding to that comment. And I will repeat um, my comment that the reason uh, 
that we have such difficulty with um, the issue of labour shortages is the circumstances in which um, the former government uh, left, the, uh, left the Australian uh, economy. Um, and I, I uh, have some questions regarding just uh, how it's, um, uh, there's going to be an interaction between the uh, amendments that the uh, opposition is um, uh, uh, putting forward today um, and um, the proposed amendments and the bill that the government is, uh, is putting forward. Um, the first observation I'd make is that the government amendment uh, uh, changes the uh, commencement date for the legislation to enact the government's election commitments to increase the income limits for the Commonwealth seniors card holders uh, to uh, um, $90,000 for singles and $144,000 for couples combined. Um, now, due to the suspension of uh, Parliament uh, following the, uh, the uh, untimely death of uh, Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, the bill to implement this uh, commitment <coughs> could not be passed in time for the increase to be implemented on the 20th of uh, September 2022, and that was obviously the intention of the, uh, of the government. Um, to minimise uh, the delays, um, this amendment uh, will allow an increase in the income limits uh, to take effect uh, seven days following the uh, royal assent of the bill, and uh, this is the minimum time uh, required uh, by Services Australia to finalise the required systems and business processes once a final date uh, is, uh, is known. The uh, Commonwealth Seniors uh, Health Card income limits are indexed uh, each year on the 20th of September uh, according to movements based on the uh, Consumer Price uh, Index and the in existing bill would have replaced the indexation on the uh, 20th of September 2022 um, with uh, a very significant uh, one-off uh, increase. And as the bill did not pass uh, the indexation of the limits uh, proceeded on the 20th uh, of September as required by the existing law. My question to Senator Smith is, how does your amendment um, work with the government's legislation and proposed uh, amendment? Well, Senator Smith. Question. And Senator Farrell can have great confidence, but with the excellent and professional support of the Senate Procedure Office, the, gov the opposition amendments have been crafted to make sure that they sit seamlessly yeah. with this particular bill and with the broader social security income uh, management system or income support system. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, and uh, look, I have a further question uh, and by way of prefacing uh, that uh, question, um, our amendment um, the one that we're proposing uh, today, which hasn't yet been uh, presented to the, uh, to the Senate for voting on. Uh, the amendment uh, uh, removes uh, material that would have prevented the uh, annual indexation for uh, 2022. Uh, following uh, indexation on the 20th of September 2022, the income limits for the Commonwealth uh, Seniors uh, Health Card are uh, currently um, uh, are currently uh, sixty-one thousand two hundred and eighty-four dollars for singles, and ninety-eight thousand and fifty-four dollars for couples combined. Uh, the bill, uh, as amended, uh, will still raise the income limits only to the intended levels of ninety thousand dollars for singles and one hundred and forty-four thousand dollars combined for couples. Um, the bill includes amendments uh, to both the Social Security Act and the Veterans uh, Entitlements Act to ensure the same income limits apply for Commonwealth Seniors Health Card providers uh, as provided uh, under uh, each uh, Act. Like uh, other Australians, many self-funded retirees 
uh, facing increased cost of living pressures in the current uh, economic uh, environment. And this bill helps to ease those pressures by allowing more self-funded retirees to access uh, Australian uh, government health concessions, including uh, concessions on uh, co-payments for pharmaceutical benefits uh, scheme me uh, medicines, the concessional thresholds for the pharmaceutical benefits scheme safety net, and extended Medi Medicare safety net, and uh, bulk billed visits to general practitioners. <clears throat> what? Um, my question to uh, Senator Smith in this uh, context is, um, is um, it proposed under your uh, amendment um, that it only lasts for 12 months? Senator Smith. I thank uh, Senator Farrell for his question. And I repeat what I have said. It's worth reminding people that might be in the chamber or observing on the television that at 11.15 the Senate must move to another item of business. Every minute that the government spends asking questions that it knows the answer to because sitting next to the government are government advisers delays a vote being put on the opposition's amendments, which would allow relief for older Australians today, which would allow labour short answers to labour shortage issues for small businesses today. The government is seeking to frustrate, to delay the opportunity for this Senate chamber to vote on amendments that would make life easier for older Australians and for businesses across our country. We just had a Jobs and Skills Summit at the beginning of September. It is now a month later and we still do not see in this Senate chamber any remedy from the government about how to deal with skyrocketing not my words, but the Treasurer's words, skyrocketing cost of living pressures for older Australians. We still see no remedy from the government about the relief that it will offer small and medium-sized businesses across Australia who are suffering severe, not my words, but the Treasury's words that they shared at a committee inquiry last week <coughs> with senators. The government is seeking to frustrate what is a very, very reasonable request that the opposition is making on behalf of many older Australians, on behalf of many businesses, on behalf of organisations like the National Farmers Federation, organisations like the Grain, the Grain Producers Association. Chambers of Commerce and Industry in my home state of Western Australia, Chambers of Commerce and Industry in Victoria. The list is endless of organisations in our country who want an answer now about how to better incentivise older Australians to come back into the workforce. And before your very eyes, this morning, the government is seeking to frustrate these propositions, that are in, these propositions that are in the form of this amendment have actually been canvassed very, very broadly in the public arena at a Senate committee inquiry and in contributions in this Senate already. And the Order. government is seeking and the government is Order. seeking to and the government is seeking to frustrate this. This is a very, very reasonable. Senator Smith, this is a very, resume very, your seat. Thank you. Senator Pratt. You're being disorderly. Standing Order 197 says that senators shall be heard in silence. I ask you to show the respect to your fellow senators. Senator Smith. Senator Smith, you have the call. Senator now, Pratt. That was a very pious response from Senator <coughs> Smith in terms of the allegation that the government is, are the ones frustrating the process here. The government has put this bill forward. 
This bill is here to amend the income limits for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Care Card. The bill that amends the income limits and threshold for pensioner earnings is currently still in the other place. And we're not supposed to actually debate these kinds of issues concurrently. So what we have Order. here is Order. a legitimate need for the government to go, well, right, we've suddenly been lumped with these amendments uh, and we're canvassing to see what level of support they will get so that we can work out what is going to happen in this place. We're not here to frustrate the Senate. We're here to be a good government. The simple fact of the matter is Senator Smith's amendments belong to the other bill. They don't belong to this bill, which is about lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Care Card. It has nothing to do with the income thresholds that affect how much your pension might be discounted depending on how much you work. They're entirely separate questions which this government, our government, the Labor Party, has rightfully chosen to pursue in two different pieces of legislation. Senator Smith has sought to be the one that is frustrating this process by moving these amendments to an entirely different bill and landing it on us at this point in time. I would have duly expected, given the fact that Senator Smith did in fact have a private member's bill on these very questions, I had fully expected him to be diligent in pursuing them. But diligent not in this bill, because it's not relevant to this legislation. The legislation that it should have been pursued in, in terms of proper process, is still to come to this place. What happens, for example, if the other place makes amendments on the same legislation that affects the income limits and earning capacity of pensioners? They are still playing with that bill in the other place. They're still debating it and looking at it. It is entirely inappropriate for this Senate now to be across purposes in terms of what the legislative outcome might be. It is simply not sensible to proceed in this way today. And so if there is any reason that you know, I had to stand up 10 minutes ago while we were trying to work out what the opposition's intentions were and filibuster for a few moments, it might simply be a legitimate purpose to work out, well, what is the opposition playing at here? What is the right process and purpose for us to go through here? The simple fact is the other place is dealing with uh, that legislation. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not. I, I know it's due to come before them. Is it actually before them? No. Yes, it is. No. My understand has it is due. To, it has has it been introduced? It has been introduced. In the last Order. Minutes. It's in been the introduced Order. in Senator the Smith. in the other place. Well. That was the plan for it to be introduced in that place, and I know that because we dealt with the issue in the Labor Party caucus meeting uh, just recently. It was the due and proper process, and you're going completely across purposes by seeking to move amendments to a bill that has just uh, uh, to a different bill that really should be dealt with in the bill that has just come to the other place. So I call on the Greens and I call on those opposite to say, let's deal with these issues sensibly. Please deal with them sensibly. There is no 
we, we cannot and we should not be second-guessing what is going on in the other place. It is entirely not appropriate that we do that. We have careful protocols in this place to ensure that we wait for a message to go from one place <coughs> to the other so that when a question is determined, it reflects the will uh, and endorsement of both houses. I'm really not sure what the state of confusion will be if you've got the bill amended coming up this way or amend, uh, not amended at the same time as this chamber is making a change to a different piece of legislation, entirely different piece of legislation that intersects across with the other bill. So let's be clear, the two bills we're talking about are the, the, um, the bill to uh, change the income threshold for pensioners' health care cards. That is the legislation that is before us today. It is keenly awaited by retirees, retirees who face cost of living pressures because they cannot access the cheaper medicines, for example, that pensioners and other carriers <coughs> of a concession card can. Yeah, and it fits in very nicely, frankly, with this government's decision to also lower the price of medicine for all Australians. So we're going from $40 a script, where a script is above that price, down to 32, I think, or thir no, 30. This is a very good step forward, but for retirees who are under real income pressure, we are now very pleased to be in this legislation, prioritising today the needs of retirees. The needs of retirees to be able to access more affordable health care, to, to access more affordable medicine. Instead, what we have from the opposition and Senator Smith is an attempt to subvert the outcome on what is a bill that is still before the other place, a bill that is still to come to us. We can't even predict, frankly, whether that place might make amendments that usurp the amendments currently being moved by Senator Smith on the income limits for uh, they're not income limits, it's the amount a pensioner can earn before their pension is affected and is started, uh, starts to reduce based on the fact that they have earned $7,800 within 12 months, which is in the legislation before the other place, due to be lifted to $11,800, I think. Now, what Senator Smith is trying to do is to call on us to change the income limits here and now in a completely unrelated bill, while the parliament on the other side in the House of Representatives in the other place is still dealing with that question. It is patently ridiculous for that to be the case. These are separate pieces of legislation, and these amendments, I don't believe, should be moved here and now. And that provides good reason for the Labor Party not to support them in and of itself, quite apart from the policy questions and our policy position and our policy debate on that legislation, which is proceeding with the minister introducing that legislation in that place. So that legislation is to be announced and proceeded with Order. in the other place. Your time has expired. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. Chair, 
Senator Pratt's contribution was worthy of listening to. Senator Pratt has exposed the government for its lukeheartedness. Luke warm. Thank you, Senator Russell. It's Luke. It's Luke warm interest in this issue and it's half-hearted interest in this issue. Why is that? Why is that? Because if Senator Pratt's contribution is correct, then the government has, in the last few moments, last few minutes, introduced a bill similar, but not the same, similar to these amendments. But different. Same, same, but different. Why are they different? Because the bill that the government might have just introduced in the House of Representatives, and remind yourself, a month after it announced the bill, a Order. month after, the Order. important distinction is this. The government's bill is temporary. These amendments are permanent. And the government's initiative is half as generous. Half as generous. So, if you were looking for any evidence of the government's half-heartedness, lukewarm interest in fixing cost of living issues for older Australians and meeting the challenges of labour shortages in our country, you have it for yourself. There might just be a bill in the House of Representatives introduced in the last few minutes which shows, demonstrates half-heartedness lack of interest. Sure. Senator Pratt says that this is not the right place to put these aged pension income support initiatives. Well, if it can't go in a social security bill, where should it go? Can't go in a defence bill, can't go in a veterans bill, can't go in, a, um, uh, in an asset bill or an APRA bill. And the bill we are debating, the bill that the government has brought to the Senate, is called the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment in brackets lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Card Bill 222. This is exactly the place you put a social services initiative. Exactly the place. Indeed, I wouldn't be surprised if the bill that the government has introduced in the last few minutes in the House of Representatives is called the Social Services in bracket Worker Incentive Bill. How ludicrous! We have seen it. We have seen it. The last 45 minutes, the government has decided to delay, put on the back burner, an initiative that this Senate could have endorsed that would start to make life easier for older Australians and small and medium-sized businesses. And can I acknowledge and thank Senator Rice on behalf of the Australian Greens for supporting this. Two parties support doing more to help older Australians and small businesses, the Coalition and the Greens. One party, just recently elected to government, is saying this is not the time, is saying this is not the bill. Really? How remarkable. This is the last sitting day until the 25th of October. Wow, wow. So that place isn't even going to be able to talk about these initiatives until the 25th of October. This place isn't going to be able to consider these amendments until the 25th of October because the Labor Party thinks it can play with the livelihoods of older Australians Order. and play with the livelihoods of small and medium-sized businesses across our country. Remarkable. Remarkable. This is an important and critical issue. Agricultural producers across our country, small businesses, the Chambers of Commerce, National Seniors Association, Council of the Ageing, the Anti-Poverty Centre is all saying that something more must be done for people. This is a modest initiative, but the government is putting maximum effort into delay and frustration. Delay and frustration. On the 7th of September during question time, Senator Farrell, as the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, was asked to explain 
Why is it that the government's initiative is temporary when the coalition's initiative is permanent? What did he say? He couldn't explain it, Senator Cash. He couldn't explain it. If I was being given the opportunity to ask Senator Farrell questions this morning, I would be asking him where is the government's legislation, why isn't it in the Senate and why are older Australians waiting? I would be asking Senator Farrell why is the Labor government's initiative temporary, temporary when the coalition's initiative is permanent? Order. And I'd be asking Senator Farrell why Order. is it less generous? Why is it less generous? Why is it less generous? These are the questions that I would be asking Senator Farrell. It is a great disappointment. Order. Senator Smith, resume your seat. Pursuant to order, the committee will report progress. The committee reports progress. Clerk. General business, order of the day number 18, restoring territory rights bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. And Senator McCarthy in continuation. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, 25 years ago, when the Rights of the Terminally Ill Bill was introduced into the Northern Territory Parliament, I wanted the Northern Territory parliamentarians to vote against it. Based on cultural and personal grounds, I certainly did not support it. 25 years later, I still do not support voluntary assisted dying. But I do support the Northern Territory Parliament having the right to debate what is an absolutely critical issue on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory, an issue that has been debated across Australia in every state parliament since the Northern Territory introduced it and then had it removed. The Euthanasia Laws Act was passed by the Commonwealth Parliament in 1997. All of the states have passed laws allowing for voluntary assisted dying in Australia. But of course, as we all know, it was the Northern Territory where we saw not only Australia's first legislation on euthanasia, but the first in the world. The NT Parliament passed these laws on behalf of their constituents who voted for them to represent them. It was a democratic decision. The sky didn't fall apart, but the Howard government saw fit to stomp over the democratic rights of Territorians, throw out their fair decision and gag them for half a century still to this day. A lot of Territorians were very upset as they saw the Andrews bill developed, debated and eventually turned into law. I looked through some of the speeches, and I even knew then of those politicians who were there. A speech that was introduced by the then Chief Minister Marshall Perrin, a most passionate advocate, and then again the speeches by Maurice Rioli, the late Maurice Rioli, and Mr. Weslanapoy, two First Nations people in the Parliament at the time, two with very different views as to how to approach this most sensitive issue. That's what democracy is about. That's what the Westminster system brought to this country, an opportunity for parliaments to be able to debate, to agree, to disagree, to amend, but to be heard with respect. I'd like to share with the Senate the story of Bob Dent, who was one of those Territorians who paid very close attention to the Andrews Bill. He did this in his final days. Mr Dent actually became the first person in the world to die using a voluntary euthanasia law, and he was one of only four people able to access the NT's rights of the Terminally Ill Act before it was overturned by the federal government. Mr Dent, a former pilot and carpenter from Darwin, had prostate cancer, which infiltrated his bone marrow, deteriorating his body. Before Mr Dent passed away, he sent a letter to all federal politicians to make it clear how he felt about the Andrews Bill. And part of his letter read, 
I read with increasing horror newspaper stories of Kevin Andrews' attempt to overturn the most compassionate piece of legislation in the world. Actually, my wife has to read the newspaper stories to me as I can no longer focus my eyes. If you disagree with voluntary euthanasia, then don't use it, but don't deny me the right to use it if and when I want to." End of, quote. of course, it's difficult to imagine how Mr Dent might have felt knowing that a democratic decision that affected his life so deeply and so personally could be stomped over and dumped at the whim of the parliament we're all standing in today. I acknowledge, Mr Acting Deputy President, the advocacy and hard work of Luke Gosling MP and Alicia Payne MP in bringing this bill to the parliament to finally right a wrong that was made here in this same parliament 25 years ago. This bill has been a long time coming. In 2022, yet Territorians and Canberrans still have less democratic rights than their fellow Australians in the States. And this bill, hopefully, is going to change that. For 25 years, the ACT and Northern Territory have been banned from legislating, let alone debating, the issue of voluntary euthanasia. And it is something that all other states can do and now have done. This bill before the Senate, of course, does not in any way legislate voluntary assisted dying. I need to make that very, very clear. It simply proposes the territories to give them equal democratic rights to debate and legislate this issue within their own parliaments. It's not something that should be deliberately conflated and confused for political advantage. This is ultimately an issue of territory rights, of Australians living in the territories having the same rights as fellow Australians in the States. The bill proposes to remove archaic restrictions preventing the Australian Capital Territory and Northern Territory from passing any legislation which would allow for voluntary assisted dying. And these restrictions, as I said, were introduced in 1997 through the passage of a private member's bill introduced by Mr Kevin Andrews, MP. This attempt here today is, of course, not the first in this parliament to remove uh, Kevin Andrews' restrictions and restore territory rights, but I certainly hope, Mr Acting Deputy President, that it is the last and that this one will be successful. Since the passing of Andrews' legislation, there appear to have been around nine bills subsequently introduced into parliament with the intention of granting one or more of the territories the ability to pass their own laws relating to voluntary assisted dying. And all of these have been private members' bills. I acknowledge the work and good intentions of all those who have attempted to restore territory rights, albeit unsuccessfully. It is fortunate that we do have a government here today that has given us a chance to finally, in my view, and hopefully correct this wrong and make a change. Before the election, the Albanese government committed as a priority to facilitate the introduction of this bill to restore the rights of the territories. And this is fortunately a piece of legislation that can bring a lot of us together. We saw the Territory Rights Bill pass the lower house with an overwhelming majority. It had the support of members of the Greens, the Coalition, Labor and Independents. I'd like to just touch on a few issues that have been raised so far here. And I, I guess I also want to give um, my own views, as I did at the outset, that as a Yanua Garua woman, I am deeply aware of the cultural concerns uh, in terms of uh, assisted dying. I also know that in uh, our way, uh, people do want to go back on country and they feel that they know their time is near. So I have a very personal uh, view about this issue. Uh, should, it get, should this bill pass and it gets to the Northern Territory Parliament to debate it, I will probably be one of the 
first people to urge the politicians there to vote against it. But they still have the right to debate it. The Australian Parliament should not be taking away the rights of our fellow Australians in the Northern Territory and the ACT. I do call on Senators, Mr Acting Deputy President, to see the importance of the territories and their respective parliaments, that they be enabled to have the debate that every state parliament now has had. So, Senators, I urge you, if you are unsure, I urge those of you who are still wondering what to do, please support this bill. Please do not make these Australians in the ACT and in the Northern Territory feel any less worthy than the Australians you represent in your respective states. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. I rise uh, this morning to voice my opposition to the Restoring Territory Rights Bill. While this bill is couched in terms of the restoration of rights to the territories, what it really is, in truth, is a new voluntary assisted dying bill. And this debate is one that is, of course, emotionally charged. Uh, and uh, for those who oppose uh, this concept of voluntary assisted dying, um, and for those uh, who, wish to, uh, who wish to see this in the light that it, it really should be, um, and for those that are concerned about the suffering of those who are in terminal pain, we, we, we hear all of those arguments. I hear all of those arguments. But you don't have to be necessarily a religious person to oppose euthanasia. You just need to understand the facts. And I, and I think it is helpful to understand where this leads. Far from being different or indifferent to the suffering of others, opponents of euthanasia uh, oppose it for a variety of ethical reasons, as well as because of the deteriorative uh, impact of euthanasia on our society. And despite the mangling of words that we see, it has to be looked upon as a form of suicide. And whether we were discussing whether euthanasia should be legal, we're discussing whether suicide, or more specifically, whether a medical professional can assist someone with that suicide and whether that should be legal. And one of the fundamental tenets of any society is that we respect human life and that this can't be the answer to suffering, whether it be mental, physical or both. And that's why the federal government of both colours and uh, persuasions have spent $11 billion uh, on funding mental health services over the years. So to support this on the one hand and advocate for suicide prevention on the other, to me, seems entirely hypocritical. It's surely, in either case, a terrible outcome for individuals and for society, and particularly when we want to prevent this in either occasion, to the best that we can, because we want to affirm life, whatever the circumstances are. But the underlying ethos has to be reminded, and that is that some lives just aren't any longer worth living. And, and if we in this place send that message, then ultimately it devalues the lives of citizens rather than cultivating a sense of meaning and morality. Now, practically speaking, the message that this is a way out um, leads to an increase in the demand. That's just a, a fact. And to quote a recent peer-reviewed study conducted um, by the Anscombe Bioethics Centre in Oxford, England, quote, introducing it, euthanasia, is followed by considerable increases in suicide, inclusive of assisted suicide. There's no reduction in non-assisted suicide relative to the most similar neighbour where euthanasia isn't practised. And in some cases, there's a relative and or absolute increase in non-assisted suicide. Another peer-reviewed study for the Southern Medical Journal by the same author focused specifically on the United States, and it concluded that legalising it, euthanasia, has been associated with an increased rate of total suicides relevant to the other states and no decrease in non-assisted suicides. But this at least needs to give us um, cause to pause before um, going down a road that will certainly legalise the so-called right to die. And proponents will often mock um, those who are opponents for making this slippery slope argument, even though the slippery slope quickly becomes evident each, each single time, as it has in international jurisdictions where euthanasia is legal and in 
course closer to home in Victoria, where it's only been legal since 2019, and sadly 175 people um, were euthanised in Victoria by the end of 2021, which was a, an enormous increase from the 49 deaths of the previous year. So the data supports the conclusion that euthanasia is related uh, to an increase in these assisted suicides, whether they're uh, suicides in general, whether they're assisted or not. So I ask the question: Is this what the public really wants? Um, laws that have an instructive effect on the morality of society. Uh, that is part of their purpose to uphold and enforce morality. It, it, it makes sense that those rates would increase when any government or any legislative body signals that this is the way to proceed. <clears throat> the Commonwealth power used to ban euthanasia in the territories, in my view, was a, a good and just use of the Commonwealth authority as it, it protected vulnerable Australians, the sick, the elderly, the mentally ill, by preventing the territories from legalising voluntary assisted suicide. And this restriction should, in my view, remain in place. Uh, if we do, in fact, care about reducing the number of suicides in Australia, the demonstrable proof is there. <clears throat> As I said, the slippery slope effect is very, very real. And we've seen this in the Netherlands, where children as young as 12 now can access these services. And more and more Dutch citizens are opt opting for euthanasia due to psychological disorders such as depres depression. It, 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 these are just facts. Again, is this something that the people of the territories really want, people of Australia really want? Is that a picture of a flourishing society or more indicative of one that is going down the wrong path? Part of the problem is that euthanasia legislation is predicated on the, the concept of, of suffering, which we all understand and we all sympathise with, and that's difficult to define. So being open to it being interpreted liberally by others is always a problem in these um, legislative dilemmas. To quote an associate professor on the board of Palliative Care Australia, I'm concerned that we are too caught up with our right to die while not investing in a system that helps us live as well as we can before we die. And more Australians die in pain because of the lack of access to palliative care, not because of palliative care. And good quality palliative care obviously can't work for everyone. We accept that, just as heart surgery can't work for 100 per cent of people. But for the majority, palliative care, the majority palliative care is an experience that is essential in those circumstances, those terrible circumstances. And we've all been through those, I should say. <clears throat> um, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, having the option of voluntary assisted suicide means that people who would not otherwise consider it also do feel the pressure to do so fearing that they'd be a burden on their loved ones rather than simply being able to expect that they would be cared for, as is their right. There are terrible and very real stories of elderly people being neglected by family members so they will choose suicide sooner. The left of politics may dismiss these stories, but they do happen and they are terribly tragic, like many of these stories are. I want to um, conclude my remarks shortly uh, about this bill uh, and say, uh, finally, that one can't address the topic um, without noting the way in which euthanasia changes, fundamentally changes the uh, doctor-patient relationship. And there was an, um, the, 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 the ancient Greek Hippocratic Oath, uh, which is still a document, or up until recently it was still a document fundamental to the importance of Western practice of medicine, reads, quote, I will do no harm or injustice to, to patients, neither will I administer a poison to anyone when asked to do so, nor will I suggest a, such a course. Into who, whoever's house I enter, I will enter to help the sick, and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm. Uh, we would like to think that, as a society, we are more enlightened than the ancient Greeks regarding medical ethics. Um, the, the dignity of the sick and the suffering and our obligation to help and comfort them has to be our paramount concern. That cannot be forgotten. Uh, I think the answer to the question is clear, and it's for these reasons that I oppose the bill. Senator Brown. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Restoring, Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. The bill that is before us today is fundamentally about equality. It is about restoring the rights of the territory legislators so that they are equal to those of the state parliaments. 
By do doing this, we restore the rights of electors in the ACT and the Northern Territory. For too long, people of the ACT and NT have elected representatives in their territory parliaments that have less rights than those than in state parliaments. Their parliaments have been specifically prevented from considering one particular issue. The prohibition, this prohibition makes our democracy unequal. For 25 years, our parliament has persisted in discriminating against certain citizens solely on the basis of where they live. What this bill is not about is voluntary assisted dying. The bill will not uh, le legalise voluntary assisted dying in either the HCT or the NT. Instead, it will finally allow the duly elected members of the ACT and Northern Territory Assemblies to debate and consider the issue if that is what their parliaments wish to do. We all know that any discussion of voluntary assisted dying arouses strong emotions and deeply held views. And the debates that I've been involved in and, in and have listened to in the past have usually been passionate and mostly very respectful. But as I've said, this bill is not about voluntary assisted dying. It is about restoring the rights of the two parliaments that have been prevented from considering uh, voluntary assisted dying to, to, to actually debate the issue, if that's the parliament's wish. When the ACT and Northern Territory Self-Government Acts were passed by the federal parliament in 1988 and 1978, respect, respect, respectively, both jurisdictions were gained, granted general legislative powers. Both were specifically granted the power to make laws for the peace, order and good governance of their territory. These legislative rights were left unchallenged and unhindered until the Northern Territory Assembly passed the Rights of the Terminally Ill Act in 1995. The passage of the NT Bill was one of the first of its kind in the world, so I understand why some in the community and this parliament were concerned about the consequences. As many colleagues may recall, the controversy surrounding the passage of that bill through the NT Assembly ultimately led to the, member, the former member for Menzies, Mr Kevin Andrews, introducing his private member's bill with the aim of overriding the legislation passed by the Northern Territory's parliament. The passage of Mr Andrews' private member's bill also specifically removed the right of the ACT parliament to pass legislation that allowed for voluntary assisted dying. One of the argument, arguments used at the time in favour of the Andrews Bill was that the territory should not be allowed to move before any of the state legislators. legislators. In other words, the territories weren't allowed to lead, but they may, may be allowed to follow. Except, thanks to the Andrews Bill, territories aren't even allowed to follow. Between the time of the passage of the Andrews Bill in 1997 and the introduction of the legislation we are considering today, every state parliament, every state parliament has passed legislation relating to voluntary assisted dying. The Victorian Parliament passed legislation in 2017 and followed by Western Australian Parliament in 2019. Queensland, South Australian and Tasmanian parliaments in 2021 and the New South Wales parliament earlier this year. All of these sovereign state parliaments have passed legislation that will allow their citizens to access voluntary assisted dying in strictly controlled circumstances. Yet the citizens of the ACT and NT are prevented from debating issues, let alone passing similar legislation by an act of the federal parliament. The passage of these various pieces of legislation stands in stark contrast to the specific prohibition of the ACT and NT parliament's ability to follow suit. So it is time 
for our parliament to restore equality amongst the states and territory parliaments, to persist with the situation where state parliaments have more rights than territory parliaments is unjust and unfair. If the current situation is to persist, it will mean that citizens that live a short drive from this building over the border in New South Wales will continue to have more rights than those that live in the ACT. To continue to hold back the two territory parliaments is to hold back two jurisdictions from debating the very same laws that have been passed in every other state. It is time for our parliament to restore the full rights of the NT and ACT parliaments to legislate the, for the peace, good order and good governance of their territories in all respects. To not to do so is to say that the representatives and electors in the, in the states should continue to have more rights than those than the territories. To continue to prevent two representatives, duly elected bodies, from discussing an issue their respective communities want debated and addressed is fundamentally undemocratic. The passage of the bill before us today would see the Northern Ter Territory and the ACT fully reinstated as equal partners in our Commonwealth. Fundamentally, the Andrews Bill, I believe, was wrong in 1997, and for, for it to stay in place in 2022 would send a clear message to the people of the ACT and NT that this parliament does not see them as equals. In drawing my remarks to a close, can I take the opportunity to place on record my respect and thanks to my colleagues from the two territories for their pursuit of equality for their parliaments and citizens. And in particular, I'd like to congratulate Elisa Payne, MP, and Luke Gosling, MP, both in the other place, for advocating so powerfully for the restoration of territory rights and bringing forward this legislation. To my Senate colleague, Malandiri McCarthy, your advocacy for the rights of Northern Territorians is legendary, and I am pleased to be here today to support you in that quest. And, of course, to Senator Katie Gallagher for her outstanding work and advocacy on behalf of Canberrans. I would also like to acknowledge the work of previous members and senators who have attempted to resolve this issue. It is hoped, I hope, that this bill will succeed where others have not. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not the first time that we have traversed this issue in this place. In fact, back in 2018, a similar bill was defeated by only two votes, and I was one of them. In this very chamber, I stood right over there and I spoke of Section 122 of the Constitution and the inarguable position that the territories do not govern by way of constitutional rights as do the states. And I remain a fervent believer in the importance of Section 152. In this, I have not changed my position. Back then, I also spoke about the danger of unicameral parliaments legislating for such consequential issues without the scrutiny of an upper house. And on this issue, I am not quite so impassioned because in 2018, only one state, Victoria, had passed legislation to allow for voluntary assisted dying, although it was yet to be enacted at that time. Uh, I know through conversations with friends in the Victorian Parliament the extraordinary rigour and scrutiny around that legislation. And now we have all states, including those with a unicameral parliament, adopting a form of voluntary assisted dying laws. The scrutiny has already been done. It's been done by other jurisdictions. The argument of unicameral weakness on this issue is today far less compelling. But it was the issue of safeguards that caused me the most hesitation back then. The theory that someone vulnerable may be guilted into ending, deciding to end their lives. No legislation can safeguard against guilt. I said back then. Well, two years later, in March 2020, I was to learn that in practice, 
Voluntary assisted dying legislation in my home state of Victoria had so many safeguards in place that it was almost insurmountable to navigate, and that was even for its most qualified and most determined participant, my father, Steve. My dad was one of the statistics that was mentioned by Senator Antic. This is going to be difficult. Mm. Despite my parents' Catholic upbringing and very conservative disposition, my parents had always been committed to ex exiting on their own terms. That was the phrase that they used. As lifelong liberals, they felt that this was the ultimate expression of the individual. And in the early 2000s, they went to a forum by Philip Nitschke, who is the fervently pro-assisted dying um, physician and activist who was, in fact, the first doctor in the world to administer a lethal legal um, voluntary injection under that short-lived Northern Territory rights of the Determinally Ill Act in 1995. And Dad said to me after he went to that forum that it was just so heartbreaking to see the desperation in the eyes of so many people there, people in pain, people who loved and looked after people in pain. And he and Mum, fit, happy, healthy, never wanted that desperation for themselves. The first time I realised Dad was sick was in this building. When I was elected in 2016, I arranged for he and mum and my three kids to come to Canberra to see my maiden speech. And I organised flights and taxis and a private tour of Parliament House and dinners and activities, all while I was wrapped up in that first week, that bewildering week, of being a new senator in this place. But Dad wasn't himself. He was breathless. He was frustrated. He couldn't even make it around the building. And I looked back recently at the video of my maiden speech and the camera panned onto him. He was sitting right up there. And, uh, and it panned onto him and to mum. And they're proud, certainly. You can see that. But you can also see that dad's in pain. And you can see that mum, who had some health and mobility issues of her own, is confused and frightened by their combined helplessness. Over the next three years, Dad went from doctor to doctor, test after test, and was diagnosed with absolutely everything from pneumonia to fibromyalgia to gout. He became increasingly unwell, uncomfortable and bad-tempered, and each week was defined less by what my parents would be seeing or who my parents would be seeing in Friends or who St Kilda was playing that weekend, but to which doctor he would be visiting. And when finally, in 2019, a random scan showed a shadow on his lung, they operated and removed a cancer the size of a cantaloupe. By December, he was also readmitted into hospital because the cancer had returned, this time to his spine, and he had six months at best. Exhausted by treatments, by endless trips to hospitals, on Christmas Eve 2019, I sat with him in his hospital room while he explained to his doctor that he no longer wanted to be treated and instead wanted to arrange to receive voluntary assisted dying. That was the beginning of a harrowing three months. His doctor tried to talk him out of it, insisting instead that palliative care was a better option. But when Dad insisted, his doctor simply stopped responding to his requests. It was Christmas and his medical team all went away on holidays, and you know, I don't deny them that, that's fair enough, but Dad went downhill rapidly and not just physically, but mentally too. The voluntary assisted dying safeguards mean that no other family member can help organise, request or even discuss voluntary assisted dying. It must be the patient themselves. And this is a good safeguard in theory, but a very frustrating one when you're the daughter of a stridently adamant, single-minded but increasingly incapable father demanding your help and an overtired, emotional and physically weak mother and an absent or potentially um, conscientious, obje conscientious objector medical team based in a Catholic hospital. Finally, I called a colleague in the Victorian State Parliament and asked them for advice as to how I could help Dad navigate this system. She put me on to someone on the advisory panel who pointed me in the right direction. A hotline with no contact details, just no voice message, just a simple and unidentifiable hello at the other end. Once we move past the not unexpected suspicion of a daughter calling on behalf of her father, the ball was put into motion. 
It took another six weeks of phone calls, demonstrations of competence, demonstrations of independence of mind, interrogation of me, interrogation of my sister, interrogation of my mother to ensure that we weren't applying inappropriate pressure on Dad. We also had to go to increasing numbers of appointments, specialist appointments, doctor's appointments, all of which were becoming increasingly difficult to get to. And reams of medical certificates and emails to prove that Dad's diagnosis was terminal. Everything seemed to rely on somebody else's willingness, somebody else's timetable, not Dad's. So the safeguards that I questioned back then were not only there, they were almost insurmountable. Now, by this stage, my once strong and very bombastic father had lost around 50 kilos. He wasn't eating. He wasn't sleeping. When he did sleep, he had the most terrifying nightmares that he would get up and fall over in the middle of the night. He couldn't shower by himself. He needed 24 hours supervision by a family member because when he would fall over, mum was too weak to pick him up. He was becoming increasingly difficult to understand. His painkillers were so strong. He muddled his words. And he was genuinely worried that when the doctors would speak to him that they would think that he had dementia and that would disqualify him from receiving voluntary assisted dying. Then COVID hit. Doctors were diverted, restrictions were put in place, and although he had done absolutely everything that was needed, we were told it would still be another three weeks at least before the two voluntary assisted dying doctors could come to his home and show him what to do. When Dad heard that he would have to leave, when Dad heard that he had to live for another three weeks, he cried. Now we were lucky with one thing. Knowing that Dad had only three weeks to live and that the COVID restrictions were about to bite, we invited all of his friends over for a party and we drank his good champagne and his best wine from his cellar. It was essentially uh, while nobody said it out loud, it was a living wake, and it was a really special day. And then day zero finally came. Two men came to the house around 10 a.m. They were terribly kind. They were terribly patient. They filled out the paperwork. They got Dad's signature. They interviewed us all one last time. They showed Dad what to do. They ensured that he was competent to do it himself. There were more safeguards right up to the very end. When they left, it was all we could do to stop Dad mixing up the mixture straight away the moment the doors closed behind them. But instead, my kids came over to their grandparents' house. We had a cup of tea, we had some sandwiches, we told a few funny family stories, favourite holidays, happier times. Then Dad went to lie down and when he was settled, my kids went in to say their goodbyes. They left and took themselves back to my house and then it was our turn. Mum went to speak to Dad alone for a while and then my sister and I joined them. We sat on the bed and he told us how much he loved us, how proud he was of us. He made us promise to look after mum and then he mixed up his medicine that he'd been shown how to do and he drank it. We held his hand. We told him how much we loved him. And about three minutes later, he very calmly and very peacefully and very quietly died. Now, more than two years on, it's not a small thing to talk about this. Indeed, we will have family and friends who, because of their faith, will be very disappointed to have it confirmed that this was the pathway that my father chose. Although I think they might have suspected as much, even if it wasn't spoken of at the time. Dad died on the very day the Prime Minister uh, announced that there was only a 10-person restriction on funerals. So we never had that cathartic uh, family congregation with friends and family that would have allowed us to talk about his life or his death. And he really loved that because he never wanted a funeral anyway. <laughs> he was almost as strident about that as he was about his right to die. I read through some of the speeches on this issue from my colleagues in here and my colleagues in the other place. And those particularly who will vote differently from me. They have used the arguments that I once used, all reasonable arguments, Section 22, unicameral parliaments and safeguards. However, the most common refrain in any of those speeches is far less clinical, far less intellectual, but no less compelling. I know in my heart that this is wrong. Now, I respect this opinion because I once felt in my heart 
that it was wrong too. I once voted against this legislation, but I will be voting in favour of it today. We say in this place that when we make a decision that we will walk a mile in another man's shoes. Well, I have certainly done that. Having experienced it, having lived it, having held the hand of a person that I deeply loved, as he died peacefully, as he died painlessly, as he died willingly, and in the manner in which he wanted, in the manner in which he had always wanted, and at the time of his choosing, well, I now feel very, very differently. It was truly a beautiful death. And to those Australians who live in the territories, rather than in any part of the, other, of the country that's represented in this chamber, I say to you, who am I to deny you the choice to leave this earth in the same beautiful way as did my father, Steve. And I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, first of all, through you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, would like to uh, convey my appreciation to Senator Hume for sharing, for demonstrating her courage and for sharing her grief and her loss, um, and being so open with her feelings and what moved her. I also want to commend Senator Ante Alex Antic for his statements uh, just, just a few speakers ago, um, and I will be following in his footsteps. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that this bill's name is deceptive and misleading. In reality, it's a backdoor attempt to introduce legalised euthanasia into territory law. This is what occurred during the ill-fated rights of the Terminally Ill Act 1995 that the Northern Territory Parliament passed. Two years later, in 1997, Kevin Andrews sponsored Commonwealth legislation, the Euthanasia Laws Act, that reversed the Territory Act. The Northern Territory Act was responsible for the killing of four people. Several others who had not even satisfied the criteria of the Act were still approved for death using lethal injection. The Constitution intended territories to not have the same legislative power of a state, and that remains the case. The Commonwealth Parliament may pass legislation on a territory issue, including invalidating a territory law. This is constitutionally correct and exactly what happened previously. If the territories wish to exercise the same powers as a state, then the territories need to go through the process of becoming a state. This requires a referendum of territory owners. I'm sorry, this requires a referendum of territory voters. The last time such a referendum was held, Northern Territory voters rejected the move. They rejected statehood and all the responsibilities that come with it. Now I am, and I've spoken very much in favour of states' rights in this chamber. I'm in favour of states' rights and minimal central or federal government. I will not, though, use that deceptively to get around the fundamental primacy of human life. I reject this bill before the Senate today because it devalues the lives of those whose needs are not being met through the failure of government to put in place appropriate palliative care resources. Such resources are conspicuously absent in the Northern Territory now and were absent during the 1995-96 period. That is inhuman and that is the real issue that needs to be addressed. Labor and Liberal national governments all too often contravene our precious federal constitution, the governing document of our land, the highest law. I oppose violating the intent of our constitution yet again. We need to always uphold our constitution. After listening to Senator Alex Antic, I commend him and endorse his comments. I agree with Senator Antic that this bill's message is simply that some lives are not worth living. This draws a terrible line that can be shifted in the future. Gradualism 
is a recognised tactic of those who push anti-human and transhuman policies. People such as the senior levels of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum who are openly pushing such transhuman and inhuman policies and anti-human policies. It's widely used gradualism. Government has three roles. Protect life, protect property and protect freedom. And the first is to protect life. I support the primacy of human life and I oppose this bill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, after listening to Senator Hume's speech today, um, I think there's very little more one should really feel they need to say in this debate. But I do want to put my own remarks on the record, in particular because West Australia has now had the benefit of voluntary assisted dying laws for some time. And it's true to say that the uptake has been somewhat larger than initially expected. But I really do put that down to the number of families and people who are exactly in the kinds of shoes of uh, Senator Hume and her father. There have been, as I understand it, some 170 deaths or so using Western Australia's voluntary assisted dying laws. I've always been pro-voluntary assisted dying. I haven't had uh, the need for it for people close to me in my own family. However, I have spoken to a great many citizens in my own home state of Western Australia who saw the need for it in, con in the context of their own life and family experience. Indeed, my own mother lobbied me. Uh, she's 83. Uh, she's very healthy and she wants the confidence that uh, should it come to it, should she be in the kind of circumstances uh, that Senator Hume outlined for her, her father, that she would like to be able to access uh, voluntary assisted dying in Western Australia. Which brings me to this point. In the case of the ACT, you could not have a more pro-voluntary assisted dying jurisdiction in the country. You could not have a, a more pro-jurisdiction in the whole of the nation. And yet, they are the last along with the Northern Territory, to be able to discuss these issues, debate them and implement them on their own terms. It is patently ridiculous that this is the case. And I say to senators here who oppose this legislation, we can either give the right back to the territories to decide these issues for themselves, or this place has an obligation to implement voluntary assisted dying for the ACT. There's no reason that their rights of individuals should be so far behind that of other jurisdictions who have access to voluntary assisted dying already. The jurisdiction of the ACT, you could not have, frankly, a more demanding demographic asking for the protection of these laws should they ever need them here in the ACT. We have a jurisdiction that has some of the most progressive uh, and open 
laws around, for example, uh, the possession of marijuana. For example, we haven't taken away the ACT's rights on those questions. If this place can't allow itself to give the right back to the ACT to pass its own laws, well, what then? Are we simply going to sit here forever because of the moral conscience of those who are deeply opposed to euthanasia in this place? And therefore, that conscience leads them to decide that they're going to vote against giving that right to the ACT and the Northern Territory. Well, that could be the outcome, but I hope the numbers are better than that. But it is patently ridiculous that, should we fail, it would be an inevitable consequence that this place should have to think about the citizens that it governs, because we've not let the ACT and the Northern Territory govern on these questions for itself. We're simply debating an issue about giving them the right to govern for themselves on these questions. Should we deprive them of that right? It does not take the substantive issue away. It should mean that as a federal parliament that has the power to intervene on these matters and take that right away, it should frankly mean that we would have to debate the introduction and application of laws in the territories to implement euthanasia, voluntary assisted dying, I should say. But who is better? to debate those laws. As Senator McCarthy so eloquently outlined, she wants her territory to have that right back for itself and that she would potentially vote against or not uh, that she would perhaps advocate against the eventual passing of such laws in the territory. But again, we need a parliament to be close to the people on these questions. The Northern Territory has diverse First Nations communities to work with, just as my own home state of Western Australia does. But again, in the case of the ACT, you could not have a more pro-euthanasia, voluntary assisted dying jurisdiction. It would be the most pro jurisdiction in the country, just as it was the most pro-marriage equality jurisdiction in the country. So I very much hope this legislation passes and that the ACT government uh, is already thinking about what these laws would look like with the right protections. Uh, but I would hope not too onerous protections. There is very much a balance to get right here, as Senator Hume's very moving speech outlines. I know these are deeply personal issues, and that if you are anti-voluntary assisted dying, that is a matter for you and the people you influence in your family. But there is a dire need to support families who are grappling with these issues. And locally in Western Australia, there is a very active service that is doing a great job navigating uh, the voluntary assisted dying laws, the use of those laws, but also strong palliative care support. Because many people will, of course, pass before they need the use of such legislation. So I want to thank the Senate for their indulgence in hearing my 
uh, remarks on this question today, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Bragg. The Deputy President, and I rise to make some remarks on this important bill of Restoring Territory Rights 2022. Uh, and I note that there was a prior version of this bill that was flagged for pretty limited discussion, I must say, in the last parliament by former Senator McMahon. And I'm very pleased that uh, arrangements have been made to allow senators to make some statements uh, on these matters. And I have listened carefully to the various contributions that have been made. Uh, and my own view is that it is very hard to separate the issue uh, that has been the driver of this 25-year-old uh, bill uh, from the issue of territory rights. And I talk, of course, here of uh, voluntary assisted dying. Um, uh, my general philosophy for political contribution uh, has been one of live and let live. Uh, that, I think, is an important uh, cornerstone of uh, Australian liberalism, and it is a philosophy which is shared by other members and senators in this place in various forms. Um, and that is the key principle that drives me here in making uh, comments about the issue of voluntary assisted dying. Now, in relation to the issue of self-government, uh, I think that we are clearly half pregnant on this issue here in this federal parliament. Um, either we have decided to grant self-government to the territories, the territories of the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Ter Territory, or we have not. Now, um, last time I looked, we had decided to do that, and therefore, if we have decided to grant self-government, uh, then we ought to allow those assemblies to get on with the job of making the laws for their citizens. Because we have this dreadful situation where uh, my constituents can access voluntary assisted dying uh, who live in southern New South Wales, but of course the people of the Capital Territory uh, cannot access the same services should they wish. And there's no way they can get those services because uh, the jurisdiction in which they live has been granted self-government, but the federal parliament has taken away that assembly's right to make laws in some areas, uh, which makes it patently unfair, very unfair. And so I think it is an issue of democratic civil rights here at stake, uh, and I am hopeful that this parliament will now uh, overturn what has been a very unjust law, which has denied basic access to civil rights uh, in relation to voluntary assisted dying. Now, I have spent, for uh, disclosure purposes, parts of my life in Canberra, in the Capital Territory, and I don't regard the people who live here as being second-class citizens in Australia. I think that every Australian deserves to have access to the same rights and opportunities. Uh, certainly this law, the Andrews Bill, when it was enacted, has denied access to equal rights. Uh, I do note that it was enacted at a time when the Northern Territory had decided to go it alone and to put in place the first voluntary assisted dying laws in the Commonwealth. But we now stand in 2022—I don't seek to repeat all the arguments that have been made here, but we do. I think it is important for the record. Uh, to note that we now stand with a position that the only jurisdictions on the mainland that cannot get access to these services are the territories uh, because of the 25-year-old law. So, as I say, I, I think that um, uh, we should get on, and I hope that we can have a vote on this sooner rather than later. But it is impossible to separate the issue of territory rights from the substan substantive matter which led to the. Andrew's bill being enacted wrongly uh, by this parliament. Although I note that, of course, there was a stronger case for the Andrew's bill perhaps 25 years ago than there is today, where I see no case at all for the Andrew's bill. Uh, but we are, after all, a secular nation, and in general terms, I think that the live and let live credo is one that can 
uh, apply across the board. Uh, it is now up to, if this bill is successful, the legislatures of the territories to enact their own laws, make their own judgments and be accountable to their own citizens. And I imagine that in doing so they will seek to enact protections so that voluntary assisted dying remains just that, voluntary assisted dying. And it is a judgment for individuals to make uh, in accordance with medical professionals and certainly not a right that the federal parliament should try and steal from the territories. So, at the end of the day, uh, there are strong parallels to recent discussions this parliament has had about expanding civil rights, like marriage equality. Uh, we should always seek to progress the ability of all citizens to access the same rights and services uh, in our country. Uh, uh, none of this, of course, is compulsory. If you don't want to use these services, you don't have to. So I, I entirely reject the argument that enacting uh, or removing the Andrews bill will open the floodgates. Certainly the protections that have been put in place in, in the states uh, has shown that the protections uh, can and do work. So I thank very much the Senate today for facilitating this, this debate. I hope that it is not too long until we can go to a vote on this important matter. I shall now proceed to two-minute statements. Sorry, ten, uh, Senator's statements. My apologies. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy sure, President. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, Nineteen years old. That is the age of the latest victim killed on our roads right here in Canberra. A life lost too soon. A young life which has now joined the more than 1,170 people killed on our roads in the last 12 months. Road safety is an issue for everyone, a shared responsibility between government, communities and individuals, each and every one of us. An issue which will continue to be addressed through the National Road Safety Strategy and the commitment to half road fatalities by 50 per cent by 2030 just a mere seven years away. The National Road Safety Strategy, announced in 2020, is a continuation of the strategy launched in 2011. In the decade since the 2011, the strategy has supported an, a national effort of advancing road safety. The previous strategy saw various achievements from state and territory governments under the, Com under the Commonwealth's leadership by improving road infrastructure, improving the enforcement of speed limits, as well as vehicle safety enhancements and stronger graduating licensing schemes for new drivers. Against strong population growth under the last strategy, annual deaths on our roads dropped 22.5 per cent over the decade. However, the number of people hospitalised after an incident on our roads increased. The strategy works because it brings together people it enables collaboration, and as the Assistant Minister responsible for the National Road Safety Strategy, it is my commitment to continue to grow on the learnings of the last decade. The current strategy focuses on three main themes safe roads, safe vehicles, and safe road use. Embedded throughout the strategy is the understanding that st speed management is key to advancing road safety. The principles of the National Road Safety Strategy are the guiding forces behind the delivery of the strategy and the Road Safety Action Plan. The principles include long-term goals of achieving Vision Zero by 2050, transparency and clear governance arrangements to ensure that there is a clear understanding of who is responsible for actions and more. Within the National Road Safety Strategy, it is the Road Safety Action Plan which is revised every five years. Currently, we are un undertaking consultation for the new Road Safety Action Plan. The Action Plan will strongly contribute to reducing deaths and serious injuries on our road. This Action Plan will go one step further by setting in place comprehensive performance indicators, indicators that will show the extent of transformation of the road transport system during the Action Plan. In consultation phase, we are, we are, the phase we are currently in, 
state and territories are being engaged to paint a picture of what road safety programs, initiatives and infrastructure are being rolled out across the country. In doing so, we are ensuring that the new action plan will move us forward, is fit for purpose and best pra practice. We already know that states and territories across the country are making headways through innovation and by targeting their road safety spending to highlight just a couple. In Victoria, young drivers have been encouraged to trade in their older vehicles for a newer, safer, safer one, with the Victorian government providing a $5,000 subsidy. In Queensland, the Street Smarts campaign is educating young and old about road safety. Further, the Queensland government yesterday announced a program to support 160 hours of supervised training for aspiring heavy vehicle drivers. It is time for our national action plan to incorporate the great work state and territory governments are already doing. In the new action plan, the work of state and territories will inform the measurable outcomes right from the get-go. Unlike previous action plans, this one will be aligned to the National Road Safety Strategy to ensure states and territories and the Commonwealth are working together towards the themes of the strategy. The action plan will be built on our collective strengths in order to address the gaps in road safety, understanding, spending and innovation. Next week, I will, I will be hosting a road safety roundtable in Melbourne with industry peaks and stakeholders to explore the themes which have emerged from recent consultations from the new road safety action plan. We have heard three main themes arising from our con consultations. These include data and research, prioritising investment and vulnerable road users. Prioritising investment considers the ability of governments to invest in projects which will have tangible impacts on the safety of certain roads. Many of the programs that fall under the National Partnership Agreement have funding considerations which seek to invest in infrastructure that will have the most impact on the safety of the transport corridor. Through consultations and meetings with stakeholders, it is clear that data and research has been a common issue. The, of the Office of Road Safety collects and collates road safety data from across the country through BITRA. However, there is a need to understand what data road safety experts consider to be the most meaningful and how we can use that data to tell a story about where we've, where we've come from, where we are right now and where we hope to be. We have a lot, of work, a lot of work ahead of us to make our roads, drivers and vehicles as safe as possible. But I am confident with the passion and dedication of advocates and experts we will get there, a task that I know is, that is supported by all of us, every one of us here. In generations past, we've had clear cultural understandings about what road safety is, how it impacts each and every road user and how road users we share the responsibility of safe road use. Me measures which once were considered extreme, like helmets and seat belts, are now done without a second thought. Mainstream attitudes towards drinking and driving have, have also dramatically shifted over time with changes in how we educate new drivers through enforcement campaigns. These cultural changes have been led by national leadership and collaboration at all levels of our community, from this place right down through to the family dinner tables across the country. But cultural change must be retained and reinforced over time. We must ensure that the understanding of, of what has been and of what road safety means and what it looks like in practice is passed down to the younger, younger generations. So, my message is clear, Deputy President, and, and it could not be clearer. Wear a seatbelt. Don't mix drink and drive. Stop and rest if you're tired. And importantly, slow down on rural and regional roads. Don't speed. Drive to the conditions. And drive so others survive. Senator Scar. Deputy President, today I stand up. I stand up today for the people of Ipswich in relation to the New Chum landfill site, which has been an environmental disaster for the people of Ipswich. I stand up for the people of Collingwood Park, 
for the people of Bundamba, for the people of Ebwe Vale, Dinmore, Riverview, Bavell, and everyone else in Ipswich who has been impacted by the new Chum Landfield facility operated by CleanAway, an ASX-listed public company. CleanAway operates the new Chum Landfield site at Ipswich, and it has been the subject of ongoing community concern, local protests and media attention. The Queensland government is currently conducting an investigation into CleanAway's operation to determine if there has been any unlawful activity by CleanAway. Ipswich City Council has previously called upon the Queensland Department of Health to, to conduct an inquiry in relation to the noxious odours coming from the new Chum site. Perhaps as way of introduction, no one could put it better than the outstanding local member, previous local member for the seat of Bundamba, Joanne Miller, who served as the local state member between the years 2000 and 2020. And this is what she said. I quote, this is about the health of tens of thousands of Ipswich people. I live in Collingwood Park. I have suffered from sinus, asthma and headaches. The stench has also caused vomiting and nausea in many people. Families are captive in their houses with windows and doors shut, can't have a barbecue because of the stink. Can you imagine such a thing? And are continuously sick. It is a health crisis. It's an environmental crisis." End quote. So, I was absolutely gobsmacked, Mr Deputy President, to read CleanAway's recent annual report released earlier this month and read some of the details with respect to the remuneration of the senior executives. The fact of the matter is that the senior executives of CleanAway, who have caused this awful, awful environmental impact on the local residents of Ipswich, have received 100 per cent 100 per cent of their bonuses linked to environmental performance. They received 100 per cent of their bonuses linked to environmental performance. And this is clearly, clearly set out in the remuneration report, in the annual report, which I have read, all 140 pages, cover to cover, clearly set out in the remuneration report. And let me give you some quotes from page 50. Group environment incident metric has a target level performance and outcome only, which is that there are no significant or major rated environmental incidents. So that essentially means you get the environmental component of the bonus if there are no significant or major rated environmental incidents. That's what the annual report says, the remuneration report. And then we read on page 51 that the senior executives got 100 per cent, 100 per cent of the remuneration in relation to environmental performance. And in fact, the CEO, Mr Schubert, received a total short-term incentive for the year ended 30 June 2022 for the financial year in which the people of Ipswich have gone through misery as a result of this landfill site. Mr Schubert has received a total short-term incentive of $970,000 and $902. That's in addition to his base remuneration and his long-term incentive. I was absolutely gobsmacked. Not environmentally, no environmentally significant act. No environmentally significant act. How's this for significant? The Department of Environment, the Queensland Government Department of Environment, has a dedicated web page. Has a dedicated web page to the new Chum landfill odour issue. It's got its own web page. How significant is that? Not significant? On April 14, 2022, a current affair interviewed local residents. And I just want to quote from one of them. Tracy Butler and her husband Gary live 11 kilometres away from the site. Quote, we get woken up in the early hours of the morning and we actually feel like vomiting. And it is that bad it comes through vents in our bathrooms, through our ceilings. End quote. Not, it, not environmentally significant? A current affair, April. How about this article in the Courier Mail, April 19, 2022. Since 2011, locals have struggled with a strong odour coming from the New Chum landfill site. And I want to quote, quote from Jim Dodrell, a local activist in relation to this matter. Quote: There's an acidic nature to the air. It's eye-watering. There's that chemical stench component to it, like burnt soil disposable nappies. End quote. Not environmentally significant? 
They got 100 per cent, 100 per cent of their bonus related to environmental performance, and that's what the local residents are saying. Article ABC News, 21 May 2022. The Ipswich City Council actually wanted the Queensland Department of Health to set up in, an inquiry into, in relation to the health impact on local residents. Not environmentally significant? How about this? The Environmental Protection Order issued on 21 June 2022 by the Queensland Government. Not environmentally significant? This protection order actually refers in paragraph 7, since 8 March 2022 to date, the department has received over 3,000 reports 3, about nuisance either from Collingwood Park, Bundamba, Ebwe Vale, Dinmore, Riverview and Bevel areas of Ipswich. Not environmentally significant? They got 100 per cent, 100 per cent of their bonus related to environmental performance. I quote from CleanAway's ASX media release. On, I'm just having a look here for the date, but let me quote it. 22 June 2022. In financial year 2022, 30 to 40 million dollars of costs are expected to be incurred relating to rectification and remediation at Newcham. 30 to 40 million. Not environmentally significant. Their independent auditors, auditors report from their own annual report. It's got a section with respect to significant matters that occurred during the year, and it actually refers to the new chum issue. Not environmentally significant, deserving of 100 per cent of their STI and bonus, notwithstanding the misery that they're put through the people of Ipswich. I also, I also raise the matter of CleanAway's continued pursuit of an appeal against Ipswich City Council's refusal to its development application to expand its operations at Newcham. With this performance, they have the gall to actually want to expand their operations at Newcham. Given what has happened at the Newcham landfill site, it astounds me that CleanAway thinks it should continue with their appeal. Whatever the court decides with respect to the planning law, let me say this in this place. CleanAway has no social licence to expand its operation at Newcham. It has absolutely no social licence. That social licence has been forfeited. Their focus should be on remediation and rectification of the site, causing the minimal impact to new residents. And astoundingly, astoundingly in their financial report, and I used to be a company secretary of an ASX, ASX listed public company, I know where to look. I know where to look. And I did look. Page 86, note 2. It's so small I've got to take my glasses off. This is what they say. Hang on. I've got to close one eye to read it. What they do, they've actually made an assumption in their accounts that their appeal, their appeal against Ipswich City Council's decision to knock back their development application, they've made an assumption their appeal is going to be successful. And that's how they've prepared their accounts. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you, I've looked at the decision Ipswich City Council made, and there are pages and pages and pages of reasons why they knocked back the application. But they've prepared their accounts on the basis their appeal is going to be successful. I call that very courageous. Very courageous. And lastly, they've been issued with a notice of proposed amendment by the Department of Environment in response to the generation and release of odours from the site. They have until 6 September, or had until 6 September, to make a submission to the department about the proposed amendments to its AA. And you want to know what CleanAway says in relation to this? So I went to their community website. This is what they say. This proposal is subject to a statutory process, and we will continue to work with the Department of Environment and Science on the best outcomes for all stakeholders. The stakeholders know what they want. Fix it. Remediate it, rectify it. The people of Ipswich have lived through this misery long enough. The annual general meeting of CleanAway is going to occur in October. And I call upon all institutional shareholders to look at CleanAway's performance in the lead up to that AGM and to hold this company to account for the misery which it has caused the people of Ipswich. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to speak about the urgent need to tackle the student debt crisis. 
Each year, we send thousands of students out into the world with the burden of increasingly large, crushing debts that hold them back. The Greens are the party of public education, and we have a clear and steadfast position on this. Student debt shouldn't exist. University fees shouldn't exist. Student poverty shouldn't exist. Education should be free, fully funded, and properly resourced for everyone at every age, from early childhood through to university and TAFE. We took to the recent election a radical plan for higher education. We were the first and the only party to commit to abolishing all outstanding student debt. And this includes forgiving outstanding debts from the grossly unjust student financial supplement scheme. The scheme was a rot that targeted low-income and disadvantaged students from the start. For the government to continue to collect debts on SFSS 15 years on from its abolition is simply unconscionable. We outlined our position to make TAFE and university free and guarantee a livable income for students. Our plan to wipe every last cent of student debt costs less than one-third of the cost of the Stage 3 tax cuts. And unlike those tax cuts that put money back into the pockets of the wealthiest and the billionaires, our plan primarily benefits people on low and middle income, young people and women. Cancelling student debt would be a powerful way to narrow the inequality gap. Abolishing all student debt would have an enormous positive impact in the daily lives of millions of people, especially young people, who would be able to afford to live a better life. When I announced the Greens' plan to abolish student debt, people shared with me what impact this would mean for them. And I'll share a few of those comments today. It will mean I can get on with working and building a life without worrying about debt. It means I can save up to enter the property market earlier. Not only will it provide immediate mental relief, but would enable me to be able to pursue meaningful personal goals as well as approach each day more positively. Education is an asset to society. It should not be commodified for profit. That's only some of the comments I received. So it's no wonder that our policies are resonating so well with younger voters who understand that the major parties have abandoned them and that the Greens are the party that cares for them. Unfortunately, we know this government did not take to the election a vision to make big sweeping changes needed to transform and drastically improve education in this country. Just as they did not take to the election a plan to fix the housing crisis or the climate crisis. But they must be pushed to do more and do more quickly. And that's what the Greens are here to do. Immediate steps can be taken to provide cost of living relief to students and anyone with a study loan as we work towards the abolition of all student debt and a future where TAFE and university are free for all. More than 3 million people in Australia owe a debt of around $70 billion in outstanding student debt. More than 1.3 million of those people have debts greater than $20,000. Significantly, more women have study debts than men. It's no small problem, and it's not one we can afford to ignore any longer. As fees hiked up by the Morrison government's terrible job-ready graduates package, will drive up debt even higher, and it will take longer for students to pay it off. Young people are already bearing the brunt of the cost of living crisis, just as they bore the economic brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic due to rising rents, insecure work, and stagnant wages. Add to that the ballooning student debts that can take decades to pay off, and government inaction, and this can't be seen as anything other than punching students and graduates while they're already down. The hip pocket harm of having exorbitant student debt repayments withheld from paychecks isn't the only harm we're seeing done by this. Only last week, we saw renewed testimony from people with study debts um, and lenders that outstanding health debts are preventing people from getting finance for a house or severely limiting the amount that they are able to borrow. It's tough enough as it is to find secure housing, 
allowing the problem of student debt to go unaddressed will only make it worse in the months and the years to come for so many people. As reported in Guardian Australia, for a Brisbane woman called Tracy, her debt proved an obstacle last year when she tried to get a $20,000 loan to replace her 27-year-old car. She said, I had a lot of trouble with my borrowing capacity because of my hex debt. But even if there were no cost of living crisis, we have to be clear on the principle that underscores all our efforts for free public education and an end to student debt. High quality education is a basic right that should be universal and free, not a privilege reserved for those who can afford to pay for it. And yet, for those studying in higher education, this debt keeps going up and up. The abolition of student debt is really not a new idea, nor should it be a controversial one. If Joe Biden's mostly boring, mostly centrist government can wipe student debt of more Americans than Australia has helped debtors, then we certainly can do the same. The cancellation of those debts is a credit to the work of activists and students in the US whose work um, has brought us to this. The last decade has been a particularly tortured time for students and graduates in this country, with surveys in this period showing that two-thirds of university students live below the poverty line, and at least 15% of domestic full-time students go without food or necessities because they just cannot afford them. They are in this state largely due to almost a decade of disgraceful attacks on higher education by the Liberal Coalition government. In 2016 and again in 2018, fresh from a few failed attempts to jack up uni fees, the Liberals introduced legislation which significantly lowered the minimum repayment income for student loans to hike the rate and pace of repayments. Without the Liberals changes, the minimum repayment income today would be more than $63,000, significantly higher than the $48,000 it is today. These cuts to the minimum repayment income were incredibly cruel. No one with a steady debt should repay a cent of that debt until they're earning above the average wage and genuinely in a position to do so without suffering financial hardship. The changes resulted in thousands upon thousands of graduates being forced to start repaying student loans before they found their feet and long before they're making an average wage and can afford to make those repayments. When 2020 rolled around, the Liberals came back for another go at university fees and funding with the disastrous Job Ready Graduates Package, which hiked fees and cut funding and massively shifted the cost of delivering a university education away from the government onto students. The fee changes were no small tweaks either. They more than doubled the fees for degrees like arts and commerce to move from $14,000 a year, to, to move to more than $14,000 a year. On average, the package drove up fees for women by 10% compared to 6% for men. With the fee hikes came the enormous cuts to teaching and learning funding that have since forced universities to teach more students with less money across the board. The funding cuts and fee hikes must be undone and reversed urgently. This June, with inflation skyrocketing, 3.9% inflation was applied to all student debt, adding more than $900 to the average student debt. For many students, that figure was much higher. 3.9% was the highest indexation rate in a decade. But with inflation not yet at its forecast peak, it's on track to get even worse in 2023. These events are fueling the explosion in student debt that is hurting students today and that urgently needs to be addressed. While average house mortgages doubled in the 15 years to 2021, average student loans almost tripled over the past 20 years, the proportion of debts worth over $10,000 has also increased dramatically from 47.5% in 2005 to more than 72% today. ABS data also show that in 2021, more than 27,000 people had loans in excess of $100,000. For the benefit of millions of people in the country, instead of giving tax breaks to the wealthy, let's abolish all student debt.
Thank you, Senator Fariki. Senator Stirl. Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm going to uh, quote words today from a very good friend of mine, Mike Williams. Mike Williams is a long-distance truck driver, very well known in the trucking industry, and he's also a co-host of the On the Road podcast. These are all his words, but I must say, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, out of respect, I've changed a couple of them because Mike does talk like a truckie, and there's nothing wrong with that. I was driving down. So, sorry. Quote. I was driving down the Hume Highway the other day, and much to my surprise, I looked over to the left, and I saw a dirty, great big billboard. It was put there by G1 GDS from Mildura, and they're looking for drivers and subcontractors and things like that. And I'm thinking, dear oh dear, that's not what you would normally see. It's certainly a little bit more permanent than an ad page in Big Rigs magazine, and it's a little bit more serious than a short spot advertising on a radio station or something like that. So I was wondering what's going on. That is a big investment. Are drivers that hard to come by? And I really think that they are. McCabe's Transport and Noonan Dara now are offering a $5,000 sign-on bonus. Now that's not unheard of. It's been happening over the, in the West for a while. Stay for six months, and you'll get 10 grand in some of those businesses in the West. But it's a common thing in the states to be offered sign-on bonuses, and there are also strings attached. And I'm sure there are with McCabe's deal as well. But we're at the point now where driver recruitment is becoming a real issue. People don't want to go out and drive trucks anymore. They don't want to do long distance work. They don't want to get out there and do it. And we have to ask ourselves why that's the case. Now, I think I know the answer to that. I think the answer comes down to paying conditions. If I've said it once, I've said it 100 times. The kilometre rate, in my opinion, is simply wage theft. I don't care how you spin it. If you're not being paid for the work that you do, then somehow or another someone's making a profit out of it. It's not you. It's not fair. It's not right. All the work that we do is measured in hours in our logbook. We all know that to be true. How the hell can anyone get away with paying you from GPO to GPO when you might be running from Eastern Creek to Dandenong? It's not right and it's not fair. How then can they expect you to load and unload Wash your truck, fuel your truck, and do all these things that are around your truck. Sit for hours on end waiting around distribution centres because it suits whatever big box carter that you need to sit there. And then, even more to the point, now guys are sitting uh, or going to sit in warehouses with fridge trailers running, with diesel being burned at the price of diesel at the moment. How can anybody justify that? How can anybody think that it is even more remotely fair, remotely sensible? It's not. In no world is it sensible, and the only people that are making any money out of this are the fuel companies and the mechanics. You'd like to think the boss is making some money out of it, but the drivers, the guys that are on the front end, that are actually doing the work, we are getting five-eighths of absolutely bugger all of a share of what's going on. We need to be paid by the hour with penalty rates, with overtime rates, with RDOs, with overtime being paid for Saturday and Sunday and public holidays. Now, Some of us enjoy those things, and I'm one of them. I admit it, but it's not that common. There are a lot of guys out there that are running on the kilometre rate. And that, of course, if we look at the situation where we get guys who are getting into these bigger combinations now, and they are being paid cents on the dollar to drive a much bigger truck with much more freight going into depots. They are expected, some of them, to help out. They're expected to help unload, reload these things, and they're not getting that much more money for it. And they are suffering the added penalty of having to drive these things slower. A lot of them are speed limited to doing 90 kilometres on the east coast. You can't do more than 90 kilometres in some of these PBS, oh, that's 90 kilometres per hour, in these PBS vehicles. These pocket trains that they call A-doubles that we run over here on the east coast, now 90 kilometres an hour. I mean, put a 53-foot trailer on and you're only doing 90 kilometres an hour. It's just not right. It's not fair. It's the drivers that are actually doing the work that are out there away from home. Their families are sacrificing. We're the ones getting the logbook fines. We're the ones getting the stupid little clerical error fines. We're the ones actually out here at the coalface doing the job, and the people that make all the stuff happen, they jump into their car, go home, and they've got toilets and all that. Look at the crap we've had to put up with at Gatton. 
a place that really should have toilets and a shower and all that sort of thing, and they don't even bother to put them there. $18 million spent on that facility, and what have we got there now? A couple of plastic port -a-loos. It's a big step forward to nothing, but it's no way good enough. Look at the rest areas that we've got. There are some really good ones out there, and some of us enjoy them and use them. But the vast majority of places where you stop in this country has no toilets. There might be a rubbish bin. There might be a cement table uh, with a half-baked awning over the top of it. You've got blokes driving small cab prime movers with no room. You can't put anything in them. Then no one seems to get a custom interior in this country. I don't understand why not. It doesn't make any sense to me, and we wonder why we can't recruit drivers. Well, we're not paying them enough. That's the first thing. The conditions are terrible. People say to me, well, you don't have to be a truck driver then. We're not holding a gun to your head. Well, no, you're not. I personally love what I do. I drive. I get out there. I have a concert in my cab. I enjoy myself. I do my job. I'm lucky. I've got a great job, work for a great company, and everything for me is quite happy. But there are some guys out there that don't enjoy what I enjoy. And my goal in life has always been to, in some way or another, make other guys' lives more comfortable. And I want to point out that while you get people like G1 that are putting billboards on the side of the road, I honestly think if you look at the social media, every man and his dog is after drivers. Now, I'm wondering if they have factored in the cost of all this in recruiting in their turnover. Why are they having drivers walk away? Drivers walk away from management. They don't walk away from truck driving. They give up their job because something is happening in that job that they can't live with and for some reason they can't talk about it. Now that's on management in my opinion. If your drivers can't come to you and have a chat about what's going on in their job, it's probably because you haven't told them that they can come and to the managers. That's on you. Drivers leave managers. They don't leave trucking. What they do is take their very transportable skills, their very portable skills, and they give them to someone else. Whether it's for more money, better trucks, better conditions, a better lifestyle, more home time, whatever it is, businesses need to learn that the asset they have, which is most important to them, is the good drivers they have. I'm sure there are some companies who would say, you know, I don't care if Billy leaves. He's a pain in the butt. He's been a pain in the butt the whole time he's been here. Don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out, Billy. I'm sure there are a few of those around, and if that's your choice and if you want Billy to go, by all means, let him go. But I'm also sure there are drivers out there working for companies who the bosses would be heartbroken if they left, and they're out there and they don't do it. They do leave, and they do go somewhere else. They don't quit trucking. They don't go and start playing marbles or professional golf or working in a shop. They generally take their portable skills and go somewhere else. It's about time people need to realise and understand, the management need to understand, that you're much better off to maybe spend a few more dollars on some trucks with better facilities in them or make sure that you're getting your drivers home on the weekend or doing whatever it is that you need to keep those good workers working for you, not taking their skills and not going somewhere else. This is stuff we need to talk about. We really do, not, do need to get a handle on this. Driver recruitment, driver retention and driver training for me are the three biggest issues in transport right now. Right up there with rates. If you're not getting paid the right rates, then you can't do any of the other three things. That's the end of the quote from Mike. And Mike and I stand shoulder to shoulder, hip to hip on this. And I will say something where I maybe I just differentiate a little bit here. There are some very, very good employers who do pay a kilometre rate. And I will name Lynn Fox, and I'll, and I'll, I'll wait for the haters to start coming, because in my home state of Western Australia, my son actually worked for Lynn Fox at, at some stage. They pay a kilometre rate. They pay a very, very healthy kilometre rate. But they also make sure their drivers do not load and unload. If for some reason they have to, they kick straight on to an hourly rate, which is way above the crappy award. And I will say this too. Some of the top drivers at Lynn Fox turn over the 180,000 plus. So not all are bad, but the majority of those paying kilometre rates in our industry are absolutely is criminal. It needs to be stopped. And I'm going to say this very, very proudly here now. Now we've got Minister Tony Burke who knows that this is a problem. And Tony, the Senator Sheldon and I have been banging on about this for the last 30 years. We're going to put a stop to this. 
If you're a good employee, you pay your people properly, and I know the good employers are on my side and agreeing with everything that I say and Mike says as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Reynolds. President, uh, today over 4.3 million Australians live with a disability. Since its implementation in 2013, the NDIS has grown to transform the lives of over uh, 540,000 Australians with significant and, personal, uh, significant and permanent disability. But the NDIS was never ever designed or intended to be the sole provider of disability support in Australia. Today, there is genuine and justified long-standing concern across our nation on the absence of insurance coverage for people who are victims of catastrophic incidents but are not eligible for the NDIS, and that is that they are aged over 65 years old. Last week, we've heard about the class action prepared by uh, Mitri lawyers regarding the exclusion of over 65s from the NDIS. Um, this is not a new issue. In 2011, the Productivity Commission recommended the establishment of two separate but complementary insurance schemes. The NDIS, which we know was implemented, but also the NIIS, the National Injury Insurance Scheme. The NDIS, as we all know, was implemented, but only part of the NIIS has been implemented so far by states and territories. Uh, at that time, it was proposed that the NIIS would cover four, uh, four categories of catastrophic injuries—workplace accidents, motor vehicle accidents, medical injury accidents and general accidents, including sporting injuries and falls and the like. Now, to date, all states and territories have implemented the workplace and motor vehicle streams. In, 19, in 2017, COAG made the decision not to proceed with the medical injury stream. Sadly, the general accident stream, while COAG agreed it should proceed, uh, has not been progressed further by any state or territory. So now, if a person is aged over 65, <coughs> excuse me, aged over 65, and um, is met with a catastrophic injury, they have to seek support through the aged care and the health sectors. And as we've heard very publicly, this is particularly difficult for Australians who do not have the financial means to support themselves. Uh, this uh, general accident stream was designed to be a scheme for uh, somebody over 65 who's, who's had a fall off their roof or they've had a sporting injury. So this week I wrote uh, to the Treasurer raising my concerns about this issue and I reiterated the need for another scheme that works alongside the NDIS to provide disability support for those who suffer so-called general uh, catastrophic accidents. And in my letter to the Treasurer, I did note three options that I saw for the Commonwealth to consider how to move forward on this matter. Uh, while the Commonwealth does not have an ability to force the states and territories to do this, I do see three options uh, for the Commonwealth to consider. The first option is the Commonwealth uh, to work together with states and territories to establish the catastrophic accident scheme as a standalone scheme as per the original Productivity Commission's recommendations. The second option is to agree with states and territories on what constitutes a catastrophic accident and uh, get them to reimburse the NDIS costs of those particular participants in line with the motor vehicle and workplace accident streams which are already in operation. This would effectively create the NIIS within the NDIA, but again take funding pressure off the scheme. The third option that I see is to renegotiate the intergovernmental agreements themselves with states and territories to in increase contributions to the NDIS, uh, given their failure to establish that scheme. And I do remain uh, deeply concerned, Mr Acting Deputy President, that after 10 years of deliberation and inaction, we do not yet have this category of uh, general accident no-fault support for Australians over 65. It is time for our nation to address this gap and implement the general accident st stream, uh, for, particularly for the over 65s. And, uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, it is a great privilege, as you well know, to be a senator for the great state of Western Australia. And the most wonderful part of that job is getting out and about to meet, listen, learn 
and to gain a greater understanding of the issues uh, right across our wonderful state. And, uh, after two years of COVID restrictions, it was important for me to return to Exmouth and the amazing North West Cape region to see the community's progress on a range of issues uh, that I had been working on with them. A key theme that emerged uh, from the many meetings and one-on-one uh, -on -one and uh, with community groups was really an issue of balance, balance between the environmental requirements of this most beautiful part and very um, special part of the world, but also to balance uh, requirements of defence facilities across the North West Cape, uh, to balance the growing needs of local residents, particularly with the state government considerations of infrastructure and services, and also to the uh, increasing boon in tourism uh, right across the Cape. And it really is an issue now of how to deal and balance that. So my, my thanks to the Shire of Exmouth CEO, Ben Lewis, who updated me on the very wide range of local infrastructure requirements and development plans that they have underway. We certainly canvassed a range of problems and barriers, but pleasingly we also identified a range of solutions that we can work on together. I also had the uh, pleasure of returning to RAF Base Learmont, uh, this time on behalf of the uh, Parliament of Australia's Public Works Committee, and I thank Defence and the committee for facilitating uh, this very helpful and instructive visit. I'd also like to pass my thanks on to the Exmouth Chamber of Commerce for holding a roundtable uh, for me with a wide range of local businesses. We discussed uh, issues that are currently facing uh, the community, including things uh, like the rising cost of insurance, the lack of uh, GPs uh, on the Cape, the lack of aged care facilities, working visa restrictions uh, for a much needed uh, workforce and also the chronic uh, lack of housing in the area. Also returned to see the progress of Mindaroo's, uh, Mindaroo Foundation's Exmouth Research Lab, and what they are now doing is nothing short of extraordinary. They're delivering world-leading marine research through the Flourishing Oceans Initiative, and it is certainly something that all Australians should be very proud of. But what yet was not clear is how all levels of government, including defence, will now come together to look to find that balance between all of those competing interests so that the history of Exmouth and the Cape, so that the amazing uh, marine parks that we have can meet the needs of the local communities and also tourists. But again, there are ways forward, but we have to now, as an urgent priority, work together to make that happen. Uh, and Ms. <coughs> Acting Deputy President, sorry, I'm having trouble speaking here. Uh, as you know, Exmouth has an extraordinary history. Uh, Exmouth itself was constructed in the late 1960s uh, to support the Joint Australian US, uh, Joint Australia and US Harold E. Holt Naval Communications Base to house the US Navy personnel and also their families. Uh, and they really truly did create a little America in Exmouth. Uh, the town was filled with all aspects of American life, uh, which was very unique in Australia. And many of the men and women who moved there, uh, when it was nothing more than sand dunes, uh, to build Exmouth are still there today. But when management and operation of the site was handed over to private contractors, um, the facility remained. But uh, when I visited these and other defence facilities on the site, I was somewhat stunned to surprise, as was the US ambassador at the time, to find out that the land had never been handed back from the US government to the Australian government, which accounted for the, you know, for the reason that these wonderfully historic uh, buildings uh, were decaying uh, in front of our eyes. So I was pleased at the time to initiate the handback. Uh, I'm told that negotiations are progressing well, but they are not yet concluded. One final mystery remains that I would be very happy for anybody who might be able to shed light on this, is that there is a photo I noticed of Harold E. Holt receiving a plaque uh, with a single peppercorn on from the US government representative as a symb symbolic of payment for the lease of the land at Exmouth. Now, I have been trying very hard to relocate that plaque because I think it would be very fitting for Exmouth to have that returned to it, 
uh, when the lease is formally handed over uh, so that we can symbolically give it back to the United States and then house it permanently in Exmouth. So if anybody uh, can shed light on where that plaque may now be, please let me know, because it would be a wonderful piece of history to retain. Thank you. and too often dealing with difficult, impatient customers. In recognition of that fact, fast food workers are entitled to a paid 10-minute break in a four-hour shift. Unless it seems you work for the tax-dodging wage thieves at McDonald's. McDonald's has take, been taken to court by the SDA for cheating 250,000 workers out of their paid breaks. And in the process, stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from their workers. The SDA has evidence of McDonald's rolling this rot out across the country. There's Thomas, who was told by his manager that because he is allowed to have water whenever he likes, he is not entitled to a paid break. Really? McDonald's is paying its workers in water? And there's Victoria who was told by her Macca's manager, and I quote, they are technically a thing, that, but we don't do them in this store because we are too busy. That's what the manager had to say. When you steal someone's rest break, it isn't just theft, it's a safety issue. Sam, a Macca's worker from southern Sydney, has told me about he and his colleagues never received their 10-minute breaks. He saw exhausted co-workers slice their hands and suffer severe burns as a result of fatigue. It just so happens that McDonald's is the largest employer of young people in Australia, a major multinational taking advantage of young Australians' vulnerable workers. And this is happening in McDonald's stores across Australia. It isn't an accident or the case of a few bad franchisees. In fact, much of this wage theft allegedly occurred at stores run directly by McDonald's. And what's the best defence that McDonald's highly paid lawyers could come up with? McDonald's defence is that their staff aren't entitled to their 10-minute break because they were taking micro-breaks of a few seconds each whenever they went to the toilet or had a drink. McDonald's is saying every time you have a sip of water, go to the bathroom, that's your break. If McDonald's argument is accepted, then every shift worker in Australia can say goodbye to their breaks as well. Now, some SDA members were told by Maccas that if they wanted to get more shifts, they needed to quit the SDA. In some stores, managers put photos of union members up on the wall to single them out and intimidate them. And again, we're talking about workers who are mostly 16 and 17 years old, in their first job, being bullied by McDonald's to quit their union. And what does Macca's do with all the money it steals from Australian workers? It sends it all overseas to avoid tax. In 2020, it paid a service fee of $558.5 million to an offshore McDonald's entity. That's it, a fee for nothing. But it allowed McDonald's to reduce the amount of tax it paid in Australia that year by $120.4 million. Now, you can add that to the $250 million in alleged wage theft and $600 million in potential penalties, McDonald's has been ripping Australia off for too long. And I'm putting you on notice. This has got to stop here. And here's my message to anyone working at Macca's who has had their pay break stolen. Back when I worked as a bar attendant and a cleaner, Smoko was sacred. If you aren't getting a paid break, Macca's is stealing from you. So join your union, the SDA. 
Stand up together with, against the crooks stealing your wages. And tell Maccas, to quote Shed Rock legends, the chats, I'm on Smoko, leave me alone. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, today I'd like to speak about the uh, vaccine rollout uh, and in particular the number of COVID cases uh, we've had this year. Uh, in the last nine months. Effectively, Australia opened up from its lockdowns in December last year, uh, and at that time we had a couple of hundred thousand cases. We are currently running at about 10.2 million cases in nine months. Uh, so my question to the head of the TGA, uh, Mr Skerritt, is how can he uh, uphold the claim that the vaccines are 92 per cent effective in stopping transmission and infection? And I think it's about time we had some honesty from uh, the TGA and ATAGI uh, because mandates are still in place uh, and people are still carrying injuries about the effectiveness of the vaccine. We're currently up to 136,000 reported injuries from the vaccine. Now, over 50 per cent of them actually come from the state health departments. These claims should not be dismissed out of hand as they are by the TGA. Uh, it is incredibly reckless uh, and impertinent for the TGA to only claim of the over 900 reported deaths that only 1,400 were actually from the vaccine and the other uh, 900 people who have lodged these vaccine claims, of which 50 per cent are from state health departments and another 20 per cent are from doctors, that they, uh, the TGA would know more about uh, the circumstances of the particular victim. Uh, than the actual medical professionals who actually diagnosed the actual uh, victim themselves. That's incredibly, incredibly um, arrogant in my view. And the last thing I want to talk about, uh, in terms of numbers at least, in terms of data, uh, is the actual number of deaths that occurred in Australia last year. Now, this year we've seen a rise in actual deaths from last year of around 8,500 people. About 50 per cent of that is related to COVID deaths and about 50 per cent is non-COVID. So the non-COVID deaths are running at about uh, an increase of about 1,000 a month. But last year, before COVID the outbreak really took off in the community, we had an increase in actual deaths from the year before. So from in May 2021, uh, the number of deaths jumped from May 20 to from 14,000 to 15,000. Uh, in June, they jumped from 2020 from 13,267 to 14,844. That's a jump of 1,600 people, almost 10 per cent. Now, COVID wasn't in the community uh, last May, June and July. There was uh, an outbreak in New South Wales in Victoria uh, at that time when the lockdowns then uh, proceeded ahead. Uh, but long story short, we ended up with about 8,700 extra deaths last year. Uh, that all happened in the last eight months of the year, and it started to occur the month after the vaccine rollout. Of that uh, increase, only 400 can be attributable to the increase in COVID deaths. Uh, there were 1,300 COVID deaths last year, an increase of 400 from 2021. So the question is, what caused the other uh, 1,000 deaths a month uh, from you know, after the vaccine rollout occurred. Now, I'm not saying it was because of the vaccine rollout. It could have been a delayed reaction from the lockdowns from the year before. We know that in 2020 uh, we had 162,000 deaths, uh, 162,500 deaths, and in 2019 we had 164,500 deaths. So there was a drop of about 2,000 deaths that could have occurred because of the lockdowns. But even so, that would still mean an increase of 6,000 people that have, hasn't been accounted for. So I think that uh, given that the vaccine is still under provisional approval and because the rules of the Black Triangle, because it's provisionally approved, it's pr provisionally approved the Black Triangle scheme applies. It means that any injury should always be assumed uh, or anything that occurs in a short period after someone getting a vaccine should always be assumed to be the vaccine until proven otherwise. So I'm calling on the TGA to take these uh, figures, whether it be increase in reported deaths, uh, increase uh, in actual deaths, sorry, in, uh, the, the massive rate of reported injuries, which is, yes, I know 23 million people got vaccinated, but the injury rate is 50 times higher than the normal rate of injuries from a vaccine. In 2019, 
about 13 million people got the flu vaccine, of which only about 140 reported injuries. Uh, of the 20 million people that got the COVID vaccine, we've now got 135,000 injuries. That's an increase of almost 1,000, uh, despite the fact that only about 50 per cent extra people uh, got um, uh, um, uh, vaccinated. So th th they're very serious figures that should be looked at. Uh, I also just want to jump on to the actual biochemistry um, that I never finished off last time, and I want to refer to the paragraph on top of page eight of the TGA's non-clinical report that can be found in their Freedom of Information log uh, 2389-6 from the 15th of July 2021 last year. The expressed spike protein uh, co-localised with an endoplasmic reticulum marker suggesting that the uh, spike protein is synthesised and processed within the uh, endoplasmic reticulum for surface expression or secretion. Now, that, uh, For those of you who don't know, uh, you've got the cell. Uh, and you've got a, lot, a, a number of organelles in your cell. You have the ribosomes, which produce proteins. You'll have the nucleus, which is where your uh, genetic code is stored. Um, you'll also have your mitochondria, which helps uh, create the oxygen in your cell. And then you have this thing called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, that surrounds the nucleus, and it's what's known as the warehouse uh, and storage and transport part of the cell. That's where you package up proteins created by the ribosomes for export from the cell. Now, ribosomes can either be linked to the endoplasmic reticulum. Any protein that is created by a bound ribosome to the endoplasmic reticulum is, is basically ready for export, uh, unlike a free ribosome, which any proteins created from a free ribosome within the cytoplasmic uh, uh, plasmin of the cell um, actually stays within the cell. Now, what I want to know here is why have the TGA let this go through if the vaccine uh, is creating a spike protein that can be secreted from the cell. The name of the game with a vaccine is to destroy the pathogen. It is not to create a pathogen that is being exported from the cell. And I'm extremely concerned by this because there's been reports of clots um, and clotting as a result of the vaccine, and we need to know whether or not that is because the cell is secreting uh, spike proteins from the cell, and then that spike protein isn't being broken down, uh, and it's congealing into a longer amyloid clot. So they're, um, they're questions that concern me a great deal. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple of uh, uh, questions I had from the TGA um, that they did answer. They finally answered after about eight months. So I put some of these questions to them about eight months ago. They took a very long time to answer. And I actually asked whether or not the PCR test could distinguish between an active and inactive virus. And uh, they, they came back to me and they said that the PCR test cannot distinguish or differentiate, use their words, between a live and a dead virus. Now, to think that we've gone ahead uh, and locked down an entire country, spent hundreds of billions of dollars using a test that couldn't distinguish between a live and active uh, or a dead virus uh, is quite breathtaking. Um, uh, to say the least. And yet again, it's indicative of how we don't apply quality assurance in this country. I was asked very early on uh, by pathologists as to why we weren't um, doing proper blood testing. Uh, you know, the traditional way to work out what, you know, what, what's wrong with you is you get your bloods. Everyone's familiar with that expression. Uh, and yet somehow we managed to get away with um, using a test that was actually unreliable. And there needs to be further questions put to the TGA, and this needs to go further in front, uh, you know, further forward. Going forward, we cannot rely on tests that don't distinguish between a live and active virus. Um, and the last thing I'd like to touch on today is the reply that I got from the Department of Social Services and the Department of Health uh, that, uh, when I asked about the number of um, the indemnity scheme and the number of people who have been paid out on the indemnity scheme, why they said the vaccine is very important, and they referred to the bubonic plague of the mid mid-ages and how we no longer live in the bubonic plague um, and that this, this virus is like the bubonic plague. And that's actually not true. That's actually very misleading. The bubonic plague was actually a bacteria uh, that was spread by fleas that bit into your blood. Okay? The virus is a single-stranded RNA. A bacteria is a living organism. You taught that in, in uh, uh, secondary school, or probably junior secondary school, whereas a virus is, is not considered a live organism at all. Bacteria don't mutate. Uh, DNA viruses don't mutate because they're double-stranded and they're hooked together, but RNA viruses do. 
uh, and it's extremely misleading by the Department of Health to be comparing this pandemic with the pandemic that occurred in the Middle Ages and many other pandemics, mind you, because it is a different type of pathogen. Now, it concerns me that the Department of Health doesn't understand its pathogens. I mean, this is biology 101. Uh, bacteria is different to double-stranded DNA, is different to RNA. And a number of bacteria viruses that we get vaccinated for are whooping cough, bubonic plague, tetanus, meningitis, tuberculosis, cholera, typhoid, diphtheria. Um, the DNA viruses are DNA, uh, uh, sorry, smallpox and chickenpox, Thank and your measles, Senator mumps Rennick. and rubella is single-stranded uh, RNA. Senator Roberts. President, although I was born in India, near the Pakistani border, and spent my formative years there, as a senator, I am a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia. I normally finish my speeches with a reminder to the Senate, we have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. Today, it's necessary to put that reminder up front. Everything we are as a nation has come from working together. Australia itself resulted from the people of each state agreeing to put aside differences and become one nation. Success in defending Australia during World War I and World War II resulted from unity. Unity of purpose, unity of action. In fact, Australia's immigration slogan at the time was, quote, one people, one destiny. Amen to that. Our first major test as a nation, Gallipoli, saw 34 brave Aboriginals serving. 12 lost their lives. Part of 8,141 Australian fatalities. Gallipoli cost the lives of 1,359 Indian and Pakistani soldiers fighting alongside Australians. Those casualties were recorded together as the Islamic Republic of Pakistan was not formed until 1947. Our beautiful country was forged through the sacrifice of all who live here, including first Australians and including Pakistanis. Perhaps this fact is lost on those who seek to inflame hatred and division for political advantage, seeking to concoct victims and in the process disempower those same people. Those coming to this country from Pakistan cannot have forgotten that two million people who were killed, many in the most horrific of circumstances, on all sides in the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. That slaughter should stand as a warning against dividing our community on the basis of race, religion or genetics and then setting one against another. We can prevent such horror in Australia. It's as simple as wholeheartedly accepting anyone to our country who accepts Australia wholeheartedly. And in the obverse, showing the door to those who would tear us down. One does not come to Australia and bring the battles of one's homeland with them. We are seeing that right now in the UK with running battles between Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus on the streets of Leicester. This happens as a result of new arrivals being unable to let go of historical battles and of the anger and hatred those still elicit. We are one community because we must be one community. History sh repeatedly shows nothing else works. Today, 7.7 .7 million Australians were born overseas. I was most honoured recently to attend a citizenship ceremony with the Lord Mayor of Brisbane at City, Count City Hall, welcoming new Australians. These were people who love our country, who want to join in with our community and who want to share the gifts Australia has provided for millennia. One Nation embraces people coming to our country to start over, to lift themselves up through their own hard work and endeavour and through that lift up all of those already here. In One Nation's world, religion and skin colour do not matter. Decency matters, honesty matters, integrity matters. Lining one's pockets while whinging about the country that provided the whinger with great wealth is hypocritical and just plain nasty. A favourite quote of mine has its origins in the Talmud, the Jewish holy book. Quote, we do not see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. End of quote. It should be no surprise those who harbour racism and hatred in their own hearts would perceive those things in others and the constructed in others. Abuse of our constitutional head of state is abuse of our culture. It's abuse of Australia. In the debate around the republic or colonial history from a bygone era, one will sow what one reaps. Disrespect begets disrespect. Respect begets respect. Those who seek to divide are really seeking to destroy, to then rebuild Australia in their own image. A horrible image, full 
indeed bulging with incessant negativity and intolerance. A world of sanctimony, hypocrisy, hate, designed to scare and intimidate voters into supporting policies that are in any measure are unsupportable. One nation will not be dragged down into a vile cesspit given too much oxygen in this place. The 103,000 Australians who have given their lives for this country would never have imagined their sacrifice against an enemy abroad could now be undermined through the actions of an enemy within. One Nation has always stood against those who would tear down our beautiful country and we will continue to so stand. Let me say again, we have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. We are proudly one nation. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Wish Wilson. There's certainly only one Malcolm, uh, Senator Malcolm Roberts, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, this, this season, just so far this season in Queensland, we've seen 12 federally protected humpback whales entangled in shark nets. 12 federally protected whales tangled in shark nets in Queensland. And it's not just whales. These shark nets run by the New South Wales government and the Queensland government are indiscriminate killers and weapons of mass destruction for protected and endangered marine life. It's estimated in the New South Wales so-called shark protection program that up to 20,000 marine animals have been killed. Hundreds every year. Whales, dolphins, turtles, stingrays, protected sharks. And in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park alone, where recently a court case forced the Queensland government to take out shark nets and lethal drum lines, it was estimated that over 80,000 marine animals, many of them federally protected species, 80,000 have been killed in these shark nets. This is a federal issue of which we have federal responsibility. So why are we shirking responsibility on this issue to protect our marine life? Five years ago, this chamber, this Senate, delivered the world's first parliamentary inquiry into getting the balance right between protecting human life and protecting marine life. The Environment and Communications Committee went right around this country, took hundreds of submissions and evidence from many submitters and delivered a comprehensive report. This Senate delivered a comprehensive report to reform the shark control programs around this country all based on evidence, all based on science. And yet, five years later, we still haven't had a response to that Senate inquiry. The previous government refused to come into this chamber, into the Australian Senate, and release their response to that inquiry. Even though we asked the department at Senate Estimates if they'd prepared the response to the minister, and they confirmed they had, it had been sitting on the minister's desk. They deliberately chose not to respond to that Senate report and recommendation, which, may I say, had tripartisan support across the political spectrum to phase out lethal shark nets in New South Wales and Queensland, for the federal government to step up and show leadership on this issue. Now, I'm a surfer, and I'm also a senator, and I have deeply uh, lived and experienced this issue. And I, as chair of that committee, totally understand that the issue around shark control, shark mitigation, is a deeply emotional issue. And one of the key emotions it elicits is fear. That's why it was really important that the Senate looked at the policy and looked at the evidence. And I can tell you, Senators, there was no evidence that these shark nets, which are fisheries control devices, they are devices designed to kill marine life. That's it. That is their 100 per cent policy purpose. They're not nets or barriers to stop sharks or dangerous sharks from entering beaches. They are simply designed to reduce populations of sharks. These nets do not work to make our beaches safe. By any reasonable measure, they have failed 
as a policy prescription in Australia. We have seen multiple bites by sharks inside shark nets or beaches that are netted. Unfortunately, we've seen sad fatalities, including a surfer uh, only last year up in Queensland who was bitten inside a shark net. These shark nets do not work to protect humans, but we know they work very well, killing marine life and endangering whales and so much of the marine life that Australians love. It's long overdue that the federal government steps in and takes responsibility on this issue and protects species which, under federal law, are designed to be protected. There is no reason that the New South Wales government or the Queensland government continue these lethal shark control programs that don't make our beaches safe, but they do endanger and kill protected marine life. The only reason these shark control programs have not been removed is because politicians in New South Wales and Queensland simply won't look at the evidence and they have no courage. They are not brave enough to remove these shark nets. It's that simple. And I am very proud that this Senate delivered such a comprehensive report, the world's first, into this issue. And I call on the new Labor government to don't do what the Liberal government did. Respond to the Senate report. Let's hear what you've got to say about the role the federal government has to play in finding a better balance between keeping ocean goers safe and protecting our precious marine life. Thank you. It now being uh, 1.30, I shall now proceed to two-minute statements. I call Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Composer Irving Berlin wrote, My heart beats so that I can hardly speak in the song Cheek to Cheek for the musical Top Hat. While this number one song depicts love, there are other reasons for a fast heartbeat, and these reasons are not always as much fun as falling in love. Around half a million Australians live with atrial fibrillation, which is a type of arrhythmia where your heart beats irregularly and fast. Atrial fibrillation reduces your heart's ability to pump blood properly, which can in some cases lead to blood, clot, blood clots forming and even stroke. Up to 30 per cent of people with atrial fibrillation don't actually know they have an underlying heart condition, putting them at increased risk of stroke or heart failure. Atrial Fibrillation Awareness Week was held last week. And given my own family has been touched by atrial fibrillation and that I am co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Heart Health Group, I thought it timely to highlight this important week and build awareness of the condition. Charitable organisation Hearts for Hearts was formed in 2011 to provide support, education and advocacy on heart disease for the millions of Australians living with heart disease. This year was the ninth annual atrial, atrial fibrillation awareness week they have organised. Atrial fibrillation affects men and women at any age. However, your risk of having the condition increases with age, particularly those aged over 65 years. Other risk factors include physical inactivity, being overweight or obese, disrupted sleep, having diabetes, being a smoker, high cholesterol and high blood pressure. You can find out more about atrial fibrillation at heartsforhearts.org.au. And if you think you might be at risk, please consider speaking with your GP and getting your heart checked. Or senators can also attend our annual Heart Health Day in Parliament House on Wednesday, the 23rd of November this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Eskew. Senator Pratt. This week, we've seen the last resident of the infamous asbestos-riddled WA town of Whitnoom being moved out. This closes the door on what has been a very dark chapter of West Australian history, affecting the local native title holder First Nations communities profoundly uh, with the disease that it has brought, along with thousands of workers who worked there uh, over the time of the company, some 7,000 workers, uh, and some 12,000 uh, people that lived there. But it's not the end of the issue of asbestos disease. Every day, more and more Australian families are affected by asbestosis, silicosis and mesothelioma. It still riddles many buildings around Australia. And we need to work harder than ever to prevent exposure and raise 
awareness. But not just here, but also overseas. I want to pay tribute and celebrate the work of AFIDA, Australian People for Health, Education and Development Abroad, who are working with communities and unions to address this issue in Indonesia. In Indonesia, they still import asbestos and are still building buildings with it. We need to continue to raise awareness on this issue and ensure strong accountabilities here in Australia, but also to support our neighbouring nation of Indonesia to get rid of this scourge. In Indonesia, the health toll from the scourge of asbestos is now significantly growing, a massive disease burden now on their nation. September 26 was National Mesothelioma Awareness Day, and I pay tribute to Order, the Asbestos Pratt, Diseases Society. Expired. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise, as I have many times before, to speak about the plight of higher education workers, specifically in this case, the staff at Southern Cross University. Following reports about unmanageable workloads and bullying, the National Tertiary Education Union sent a survey to all Southern Cross University staff. Shockingly, management tried to block access to the survey online, which shows how much they care about hearing from their staff on welfare issues. Despite this, hundreds of staff completed the survey. The results were pretty shocking and revealed an extremely unsafe workplace where staff are worked to the bone. 82 per cent of staff reported regularly experiencing psychosocial hazards. 44 per cent of staff reported they were likely to seek medical advice for work-related stress. 63 per cent of staff rated workplace culture as negative or extremely negative. 36 per cent of staff said they are likely or very likely to resign from the university. These dreadful conditions are sadly becoming too common amongst universities today. As vice chancellors earn more and more and students are funneled through like cash cows, staff deal with rampant casualization, job insecurity, unmanageable workloads and wage theft. A better university, one that is built on the principles of equity and democracy, is possible. We need an overhaul of university governance to shift the balance of power away from the managerial class back to staff and students. We need to reimagine universities as places of public good, where staff are respected, have secure jobs, and the best pay and working conditions, where students flourish and where profits, cost-cutting, and bottom line plays no role. My solidarity is with the staff and NTU members at Southern Cross Uni and universities across the country who are Order, fighting for their Senator rights Faruqi, and for the rights of public your time education. Has expired. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it's my great pleasure to rise and pay tribute to an extraordinary footy club, the mighty Geelong Cats. I was so proud to be there on the weekend watching a magnificent club underpinned by incredible values take home another premiership. Very sadly, I wasn't at the parade through our city streets. But I was there in spirit. I have loved the Cats for as long as I can remember. When I used to play netball at the Cadinia Park courts, I would then head over in the standing room and watch my beloved Cats play. And, and this comes at a time when its mighty captain, Joel Selwood, has today announced his retirement from the game after a record-breaking career. I want to pay tribute to Joel, to an amazing captain, again someone with incredible values of leadership, of community contribution, uh, who has been extraordinary. I'm just referring to the Geelong Cat statement, which uh, says that since he was drafted to Geelong in 2006, arguably no other person has had the impact that Joel has had within the AFL, both on and off the field. Uh, he is a magnificent captain, surrounded by a magnificent playing group. But uh, from Steve Hocking down, from the CEO, uh, it is a wonderful club. We are very proud to have the Geelong Cats in our city, and I want to wish Joel all the very best. And he is hoping and wishing 
uh, that there will be a back-to-back -back premiership next year. Go the Mighty Cats. I love you with all of my heart, and I am so proud of your achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator McCarthy. I was pleased to be able to visit uh, leaders in Gallowinku in far northeast Arnhem Land early this year with Senator Jenny McAllister and Marion Scrimger MP uh, to listen to the community about the work, important work being done to keep women and children safe. Ten years in the making, the Gallowinku women's space finally opened their family, domestic and sexual violence crisis accommodation earlier this month. This started with grassroots conversations by Yolngu women about the need to have a safe house for women and children on the island community. It is a huge achievement by and for the amazing community, and it's well worth celebrating. I'd like to congratulate all those people and groups involved in making this happen, in particular Bettina Dangenbar. Before the women's space opened, uh, Bettina used to open her home as a shelter for women and children who had nowhere to go. And it's beautiful to see that uh, her efforts have led to pretty important achievements for the whole community. So I'd like to give a shout out to the women involved uh, at the Gallowinku Women's Space, uh, Space Centre. Uh, so it's uh, Marilyn Jolu, Janambi Marika, Janji Ganamba, Joan Malku, Yenhu Guruwiwi, Suzanne Hume, Joy Mundu, Tasma Yunapu, Margaret Gundamurkwai, Tanya Lakarwai and many, many others. To all of you over there on the island, thank you for the work that you're doing with uh, all of the families, uh, not only at Gallowinku but also the surrounding communities uh, who are very much interlinked there with the Yolngu clans. Uh, we have uh, Ramanginning and Milingimbi and, of course, Gapuiak and the nearby town of Nulunboi where there are incredibly strong links. Uh, for the Yungu families and the clan groups. Well done, ladies. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As we return home to our families this weekend, I'm rem reminded of the reason many came to this chamber in the first place. We're here for our families, our children. With my first grandchild on the way, my role as a senator takes on new meaning, refreshed and clear. I stand in this place to build a future that will allow my grandchild to become all that she or he can be, irrespective of gender, sexuality, religion or skin colour. Australians should not be born into a world that is divided on the very things that have made Australia such a beautiful tapestry of humanity. I will not bow to those who are using skin colour to divide us. I will not allow an ideology advance in this chamber that every new Australian, including my grandchild, must have less so that the ruling elites can have more. I will not allow my grandchild, when born, to be born into an Australia where greed and evil subvert freedom. I will defend my unborn grandchild's right to life, and I will defend every Australian from the evil notion that, having ceased to be healthy, taking one's own life that God gave us is somehow noble. To do anything else would be a betrayal of the oath of office I took here with my hand on the Bible. In the last parliament, I was disappointed, deeply disappointed, when a group of leading senators, most of whom took their oath on the Bible, voted against my motion against gendered language. Instead, these senators chose to defend an agenda that's meekly described as woke, yet accurately described as neo-paganism. It is not inclusive to exclude the fundamental tenets of a civilised Christian society, mothers, fathers and family. I will not be told I have lost any battle I came here to rectify, for surely this means the next generation have lost before they are even born. If they are born, we have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation under God. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, today I'd like to take the opportunity to mark the life and mourn the passing of Angus McNeil uh, and celebrate his life, who was Angus was a stalwart of the Liberal Party in New South Wales, uh, coming from the small town of Rand near the New South Wales Victoria border. He contributed significantly to the Liberal Party but also to the broader community. He led a life of tremendous service. Uh, he was a very good friend of Bill Heffernan. He was a tremendous supporter of Susan Lee. He was a very 
uh, well advised confidant of myself and an advisor to me uh, both before I entered this place and since coming to this place. And like Bill, I think he's someone who would be best referred to as a busted ass farmer uh, because he was a sheep farmer following in his father's footsteps uh, on his 2,600 hectare farm to merino sheep, goats and a variety of crops. So our conversations consisted mostly of what was happening in both the markets and the weather. Uh, but he also served for over 25 years on his local council uh, and also worked uh, and served on a number of other uh, advisory boards and number of industry boards and sectors, uh, as well as working with the Liberal Party well in excess of the 20 years I was involved, and in 2019 was awarded the honour of becoming a member of the Order of Australia for the service to primary industries. Um, anyone who knew Angus would just adore Angus. He was just a great character uh, and a great person to have on your team and as part of your team. So, Angus, thank you for your contribution to our party, to our community and to the country, and sincerest condolences to Gail and your daughters, Georgie and Kate. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Just when you think Qantas can't sink any lower, they outdo themselves again. It's not enough that Qantas has illegally sacked 2,000 ground staff dangerously understaffed its engineering workforce, threatened its pilots with outsourcing, threatened its international cabin crew with termination, joiced thousands of bags and cancelled hundreds of flights, and left thousands of passengers stranded around the world, all while taking billions in public welfare and using that money to pay bonuses and buybacks. On top of all this, Qantas are back in the Fair Work Commission today because they are now threatening their domestic flight attendants. Qantas is threatening its domestic cabin crew with outsourcing unless they sign an agreement that is worse than their old agreement that expired three years ago, an agreement that will require Qantas flight attendants to work longer shifts with shorter rest breaks while making a massive real wage cut. This is happening right now as I speak. Terry O'Toole from the FAAA has told me flight attendants are sick of these bullying tactics. And why wouldn't they be? This is the Alan Joyce playbook. Essential aviation workers are forced to push themselves beyond their physical and mental limits for less and less money, losing $37,000 to $50,000 over the next three years. And if you don't accept it, Qantas threatens to tear up your agreement and outsource your work to labour hire casuals. And we as a parliament need to tell Qantas that this behaviour is beyond, it's beyond the pale. We need to tell Qantas to stop marketing itself as an Australian symbol, because Qantas under Alan Joyce sure as hell does not represent Australia Order, anymore. Senator Sheldon. Uh, Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President. Despite being one of the richest countries in the world, we know that millions of Australians are just scraping by on meagre income support pay payments that are well below the poverty line. How can we call Australia one of the wealthiest countries in the world when one in six children are living in poverty? All children and young people have a universal right to safety, privacy, education, housing, social support, mental and physical health care, regardless of their circumstances. Make no mistake, poverty is a political choice, and the Labor government is choosing to give $244 billion in the Stage 3 tax cuts to the very wealthy, to the billionaires, instead of responding to the cost of living crisis for people on starvation wages, on income support. And these choices are failing our children. No child should be forced to go to school hungry. No child should be watching their family make the difficult decision between basic necessities and school supplies. And that's why the Greens are fighting for a guaranteed livable income that would raise all income support payments to at least $88 a day, above the poverty line. This shouldn't be a radical ask. It should be the bare minimum. The government exists to serve the people. 
It is clear our social safety net is broken. So I urge the government to immediately address this issue and raise the, run of the rate of all income support payments above the poverty line. The Greens will continue this fight until this, ma this government makes the right choice to make sure that no child is left behind. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke in the chamber about the Tasmanian bid for a 19th standalone team in the AFL uh, and questioned the demand from the AFL for a new stadium as a part of that bid. Uh, my questions with respect to the requirement for the stadium by the AFL remain because, as I said in my previous presentation, other new teams didn't have that requirement. Regardless of my doubts, it's clear that the Tasmanian government and the AFL have continued to press on uh, with the bid process. It's clear that Tasmania and their bid have met all of the hurdles, all of the requirements for an AFL team um, as a part of the bid process and a part of the work plan that was set out through the agreement between Tasmania and the AFL. Uh, and the presidents of the AFL clubs are now in a position to grant Tasmania that 19th AFL team, that standalone team for Tasmania. There's only one thing that remains between Tasmania now and the AFL, te the, the AFL team. The Tasmanian government has indicated its support for a new stadium. The AFL has indicated its support for a new stadium. The Tasmanian government has put $375 million on the table for the stadium and indicated the site for the new stadium. The only thing that remains for the AFL presidents to be able to say, yes, the Tasmania can have that 19th team, is funding from the Albanese government. So the decision as to whether Tasmania actually gets a 19th team, its deserved team as an AFL state team in the AFL competition, is a decision by the Albanese government to support the construction of that stadium. Tasmania is on board. The AFL is on board. Does Anthony Albanese want Tasmania to have an AFL team? Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. There's a group of people in Tasmania who I really admire, grandparents raising grandchildren. These grandparents have stepped up to raise their grandchildren in really tough circumstances. They're known as kinship carers or primary carers. But let's call it for what it is. These people are parents. They take on the role of everything these kids need, these kids need them to be. As a result, they miss out on the experience of being nan and pop. My heart breaks for them, and having met them, I know they're some of the most caring people you'll ever meet. But these grandparents are slipping through the cracks. There's issues with them being recognised as the parent of these kids, which leads us to all sorts of financial and legal problems. One major issue I've heard is from grandparents with several children in their care. Some of their kids are recognised by Centrelink and others are not. All the kids have the same biological parents. That just doesn't seem to make sense. And it's not just financial problems. Another grandparent told me he couldn't give permission for his 16-year-old granddaughter to get a driver's licence because he wasn't recognised as the primary parent. Financial, medical, educational, legal. The issue of recognising kinship care spans across institutions and across governments. It's a complex issue. It's going to take a long time to get it right. A lot of these things are up to the state governments, but I know there's things we can do at a federal level to make things easier for them as well. It's important we do. I've seen the love and care in these grandparents' eyes. Despite their battle scars and the cost to themselves, they will do anything and everything to look after these children. And it's time we looked after them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much. Emmanuel Christian Community School in Gerraween, close to my electorate office in Perth's northern suburbs, celebrated its 40th anniversary on the 14th of August this year. Past and current students, families and staff attended a church service and a lunch to celebrate four remarkable decades of achievement. The school is part of the ministry of the Gerraween Baptist Church and is led by its vision to change lives through Christ-centred education. From Easter and Anzac Day services with the school's excellent cadets to addressing classes of politics students to the opening of new facilities 
Its strong values are evident whenever I visit the campus and meet those learning and working there. The school has grown from just 22 students in two classes in 1982 to more than 700 students today, including 256 secondary students, having become a kindergarten to year 12 school in 2012. Emmanuel Christian Community School aims to provide an education that stresses cooperation rather than competition, and the impressive growth of the school over time is a testament to its supportive, tight-knit and very multicultural community. I greatly value my strong association and connection with the school. I'm also proud to have been able to officiate at a number of important events which announced and, and supported coalition government investments in the school. Last year I opened the New West Wing, a project made possible by a $1.5 million grant from the Capital Grants Program. The redevelopment included the construction of a double-storey facility with 11 learning areas for secondary students. The project has given and will continue to give students at the school the best possible chance of success. I visited the school at the beginning of 2022 to present a bright new Australian flag. And I thank all of the students, many of them who have come from multicultural families across P Perth's northern suburbs, many of them recent thank arrivals you, in our country. Smith, your time and I has thank expired. them very much for uh, Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President, 40 per cent of Australians have used cannabis, 40 per cent. But it's not the wealthy, it's not the privileged, it's not politicians who go to prison for smoking a joint. Do you know why? Because the war on drugs isn't about helping people. It's a war on class and race. It's students, people with disabilities, First Nations peoples, people from southwest Sydney, people from regional Australia whose lives are threatened by the policing of a victimless crime. This government is hooked on dragging our most vulnerable through the criminal justice system for using the same substance that over 10 million people across this country have already used. When it comes to cannabis, it's policing and the war on drugs that's destroying lives, not the plant. And it doesn't have to be that way. We can legalise cannabis at a federal level, and when we announced that earlier this week, we saw a whirlwind of support. That support came not only from drug experts and academics, but from the wider Australian community who want to see change. People who know that if the law makes almost half of us criminals, people know that something is deeply wrong. People who have been waiting decades for the criminal justice system to stop ruining lives over smoking a joint. People who question why a drug that is less harmful than alcohol and tobacco is the one with jail time attached. The Attorney-General has so far refused to propose legislation to legalise cannabis and has refused to support it, but hasn't given a reason. And that's because there aren't any good ones. This has been done around the world, and doing the same here would improve millions of lives. It's time. Let's legalise it. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Polly. Over 250,000 current and former employees of McDonald's right across this country may be eligible for compensation as part of the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Union's latest legal action against McDonald's. The SDA have been raising members' issues and concerns since 2017. Quite simply, McDonald's has not been paying the young people their 10-minute break. Now, can you believe this? So what they're saying is because these young people who work for McDonald's may go to the bathroom and they get a free uh, soft drink on their shift, that that equates to their paid 10-minute break. Now, we know that there's over 10,000 current and former McDonald's workers have been directly assisting the SDA in this investigation and are willing to provide evidence to the federal court. Now, we all know that McDonald's would have to be one of the most recognised companies around the world. And this, again, is not just about ripping off young people. This is about committing a criminal act. They are exploiting young Australians. When young people go and work at McDonald's, they go there and what they should be ex experiencing is good work relations. They should know that they're not going to be exploited. You should not be putting profit before people. And quite frankly, that's what McDonald's have been doing. The SDA have been fighting on behalf of these young people right across this country. And sooner or later, governments need 
to ensure that these corporations and businesses are not exploiting their workers. At the end of the day, what we want to see is young people having a good experience, and every employee around this country deserves to be respected. They deserve to be given opportunities, and they should be paid Thank you, Senator accordingly. Senator Polly, your time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you. Today, I acknowledge 40 years of remarkable work from a small and highly effective agency in my portfolio. The Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research was established by Parliament in. June 1982 to commission and fund research to find solutions to the agricultural problems of developing countries. Since then, ACR has returned total benefits worth at least $64 billion in economic, environmental and social impacts, with a benefit to cost ratio of around 43 to 1. Not to mention the social and environmental benefits like women's empowerment, nutritional improvements and wildlife habitat protection. It was Sir John Crawford, long-serving secretary of the Department of Agriculture and later vice-chancellor and chancellor of EANU, who in the 1970s, like now, a time of global food insecurity, promoted the idea that Australian agricultural fisheries and forestry science has much to offer the world, and we do. Today, ACR oversees about 200 projects a year in 35 countries across the Indo-Pacific region to achieve, a more, to achieve more productive and sustainable agri-food systems. Their work is emblematic of the government's approach to building a more stable and prosperous region, partnering directly with our neighbours to deliver real solutions to improve crop yields and livestock health, to manage fisheries and forests, to mitigate climate change and inform and protect against biosecurity threats to empower communities, boost livelihoods, reduce poverty and build resilience. So I today in the Senate congratulate ACR on its 40-year history of achievement, achievement for communities around the world and for our country. I offer the government's thanks on behalf of the parliament and the people of Australia to all who have contributed to ACR's work. They do remarkable work and we thank them for it. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Um, we we'll now move to question time, unless someone jumps in the four seconds we have. Uh, Senator Cash. Thank you. And my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday in question time, in a question from Senator Pocock regarding people like his constituents Sam and Leilani, who are in the gallery, having to choose between housing or heating because of the extreme cost of living pressures they and millions of Australians are now facing, Minister Farrell was asked. What does he say to them? Minister Fowler responded, Well, I say to them, welcome to the Senate. If they'd like to identify themselves, I will give them a little wave. Is a little wave all the Labor Albanese government has to offer to Australians who are struggling with the cost of living? Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, order. 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 I'm waiting to call the minister. Order. Order. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, I thank uh, I thank the acting leader of the opposition in the Senate for the question. Um, and the Albanese government and, and Senator Farrell uh, reflected this in his remarks yesterday. Place cost of living and easing the cost of living pressures on Australians as a top priority of this government. And everything we have done since being elected has met that challenge. I also note that my colleague, who I am privileged enough to share the bench with here on the, on the government side, is the most courteous and decent person in this Senate, and his remarks yesterday reflect that part of his character. On the cost of living question, on the cost of living, the, again, the raw and blatant audacity of the people that have been in power prior to May the 21st, when the Australian people elected us, to come in here after creating some of those cost of living pressures through your own policy in action and your division and, and the lack of focus that you had on the Australian people, to come in here and start pointing the finger at us when we have been elected to deal with the cost of living crisis that you lot That's created. Right. That's right. And see, everything we have done on every day we have turned up to work ha since that election has been to deal with this most serious challenge. We understand that cost of living pressures 
are hitting Australian uh, people hard. We understand that, which is why Senator our McGrath. policies are so important to implement, more important than ever. Uh, and we understand that people on payments are doing it hard. They will receive in the budget the biggest indexation that we have seen in recent times. And we have already committed that we would assess when the budget provides, when we, as we Thank deal you, with Minister, the. Your time has Sorry, expired. I was just more Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. And yesterday in question time, the minister refused to rule out imposing higher taxes on Australians in the budget. I ask you again, will you rule out tax increases on Australians in the budget? Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, uh, Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, when the Senate is quiet, order. I'm waiting to call the minister. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank Senator you. Russell. Well, what I will rule out, because I was asked to rule out, I pl we're playing the rule out, uh, rule in game. Order. I will rule out taking a lecture from those opposite about tax and spend and fiscal management. They like to, they like to present themselves as fiscal conservatives. But we know, because we've Senator got McGrath. the budget now and we've got the briefings, we know that as you got more out of control as a government, as the Prime Minister took, former Prime Minister took on more and more of your portfolios <laughs> and made all of the decisions, that you ripped up and broke the budget. That's what happened. Now, what I can rule out is accepting any lectures. And what I will say is we will be implementing the policies we took to the election and we will be dealing with the waste, the rorts, the mismanagement and the failed priorities of your term in government. You'll see that in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Cash, second Thank you. supplementary. And will the minister rule out changes to taxes on superannuation in the budget? Minister Gallagher. We like, we like. I've, asked, I've answered this question. I have. I have. I've told you what we'll be doing in the budget, and you'll have to wait and see. You'll have to wait and see Order. when we release the budget. Order. But I have told you, this will be Order. a bread and butter budget where we implement our policies. Senator McGrath. When we implement Senator our policies Wong. on tax, we have made it clear that our focus is on multinational tax reform. Yet. Yeah, you got a pretty high chance of seeing that in the budget. You'll see the policies we took to the election, and you'll see the re results of the forensic assessment that we are, are doing line by line through the budget to make sure that every single dollar that we spend is going where it needs to and where it's going to re uh, provide a return to the Australian people. That's what you will see in the budget. Oh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator Rustin. President, uh, on a point of order, uh, I think the question was one sentence and referred to superannuation and the budget. I don't think the minister has said anything about superannuation and the budget. Uh, it also included uh, well, the minister was asked to rule out taxes on super. Um, I believe she is being relevant, but she's heard your objection, and if she needs to be uh, give further detail, I'm sure in the eight seconds remaining she will. Uh, she's finished. Thank you, thank you Senator Rustin. Senator O'Neill. Thank you much, um, Madam President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. How is the government delivering on its pledge to return accountability, transparency and integrity to government? Minister. Uh, I have called the minister. And I think we're waiting for silence so that she can begin her answer. I remember. Thank, thank you. Uh, I thank Senator O'Neill for her question and for her interest uh, in these matters, which are important to the nation and important to the government, important to the parliament. And today yeah. is an important day because we introduced the first government bill to establish a national anti-corruption commission into the House. Yeah. It is a bill which delivers on a key election commitment, first made prior to the 2019 election, 
to establish a powerful and independent anti-corruption body at the federal level. It is a watchdog with teeth, and it is a commitment that we have, consi have consistently advocated for, and today we are delivering. Yeah. The former government, having made their own pledge to introduce a federal anti-corruption body in December 2018, never even got to the stage of introducing a bill. Uh, and the federal government is the last jurisdiction in this country not to have an anti-corruption commission. And we all know it is past time for that to be fixed. Uh, and those of us on this side of the chamber are proud that the Albanese Labor government is just doing just that. Yeah. Today's bill is a product of an extraordinary amount of work, and it has been shaped by constructive consultation with experts and with members of the House and Senate. It aims to learn the lessons from existing anti-corruption commissions across the nation, balancing the need for transparency with the need to prevent undue damage to reputation. The ultimate aim of this body, once established, is to both to prevent and expose corruption at the federal level. The Australian people sent a clear message in the last election that this is what they want. It is now incumbent upon this parliament to, to deliver. Shortly after introducing the bill this morning, the Attorney General moved to establish a select committee of both houses to scrutinise the bill. We welcome that scrutiny and the dialogue which will flow from it, reflecting the government's genuine desire for this bill to have support across the parliament. There is no more important task for those of us elected to this place than maintaining the trust placed in us by the Australian people, and today's bill is an important part of that task. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam President, and I'm delighted to ask these questions on this very historic day of Labor delivering on a very significant commitment. How will the National Anti-Corruption Commission prevent and expose corruption at the federal level? Minister. Uh, and I thank Senator O'Neill again for her supplementary question. The National Anti-Corruption Commission established by the bill will be strong and it will be independent. It will have broad jurisdiction to investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct across the Commonwealth public sector. It will have the power to investigate ministers, parliamentarians and their staff, statutory office holders, employees of all government entities and contractors. It will have discretion to commence inquiries on its own initiative or in response to referrals from anyone, including members of the public and whistleblowers, and referrals will be able to be anonymous. It will be able to investigate both criminal and non-criminal corrupt conduct and conduct before occurring before or after its establishment, and it will have the discretion to hold public hearings. It will also have a mandate to prevent corruption and educate Australians about corruption. This will be a significant reform for the nation and is a necessary part of rebuilding trust in institutions, including in this parliament, uh, for the Australian people. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Wong. And, um, how does the government's approach to establishing national anti-corruption commission contrast with previous approaches. Minister. Uh, thank you uh, to the senator for her question. And we all know that is a somewhat sorry tale in terms of the past. Because, uh, and yes, it may be that Senator Cash might like to add to my remarks. Because we do recall that those opposite announced a national integrity body in December 2018, but they never delivered. They never delivered. And in fact, one of the more interesting things during the election campaign was watching Mr. Morrison try to blame everybody else. That's a change. Everybody else for his failure to introduce his own bill. Those opposite didn't even get to the stage of introducing the bill because they were apparently too scared the parliament wouldn't support it. It was everybody else's fault again. It really does show how little they were prepared to work to demonstrate integrity. It shows how little they cared about integrity in government. Well, we will deliver on this promise and we will keep faith with the Australian people who told all of us very clearly at the last election this is what they wanted. Today we have delivered on our pledge for a strong and independent na national anti-corruption commission. I invite those opposites you, to prove Wong. themselves. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Is the Minister aware of any authorised deposit-taking institutions or a bank uh, in Australia that have account portability, which allows people to change banking institutions and retain the same account and account number? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. I think this question relates to the debate uh, that we had last night in relation to the cashless debit card. Am, am I correct? Yeah. Um, I'll have to come back on the detail because I, 
it doesn't fall within my portfolio. I am representing the Minister for Financial Services, so I would I would be able to answer oh, you. Oh, beg your pardon, um, Minister. Please resume your seat, Senator O'Sullivan. My question is about the finance portfolio, and uh, it's about a bank. I haven't asked anything about the cashes that were. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan, that isn't a point of order. It's thank you. Minister. Thank you. Well, if I can just explain, the Ministry for Finance does not have responsibility for financial services, including ADIs and other financial institutions. They fall under the Treasury portfolio, and we have a specific minister for it, Order. the Minister for Order. Financial Services. Now, I'm coming in here, and Senator O'Sullivan, I am very happy to answer your question. I don't have the detail with me. I think it relates to the debate that I was in and out of last night out, uh, around the cashless debit card. If I can get an answer for you. Um, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, but when you're, when you're repping about 14 portfolios, I do rely on a bit of, a bit, a bit of paper. I, I do. I'm not going to pretend that I'm coming in here. James, you wouldn't understand. Order. Order, Senator McGrath. Order, Senator Henderson. Order, order, Senator Watt. I just called the chamber to order. I don't need you to add to it. Senator McGrath. Order. Seriously, the minister is answering the question. I could barely call order. Just because you don't like what the answer is does not encourage you or give you licence to be so disorderly that I have to say order about seven times before I can get the attention of the chamber. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, President, and as I said, um, I do come into question time with the desire to answer the questions that are asked of me, uh, and which is why, which is why I'm taking it on notice because I don't. I also treat this uh, chamber with respect, and I don't want to answer. I don't want to answer something that is not, is not correct and mislead the Senate. So I do take this responsibility seriously. I will come back with an answer based on the advice of the relevant minister who I am repping in this instance. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you. Uh, last night, Minister Farrell told the Senate that neither the account nor card number will change when cashless debit card participants are moved from the CDC to the government's new enhanced income management technology. From a financial institution perspective, does the minister concede that if someone is retaining the same bank account and account number as their old card, that they cannot possibly be moving to a different institution or onto a different account? Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Yeah, thank you, um, thank you. Well, as, as I was fortunate enough to be in the chamber, uh, last evening for this debate, um, and we abolished the cashless debit card program, which was a key election commitment of, of this government. Yes, yes, we did. Yes, we did. And you, what I remember from the debate is you guys fought to the last breath to keep it in place. Despite what communities have been asking for. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan, I am well aware that you are seeking to move a point of order. When the chamber is quiet, I will come to you. Order. Senator Rustin, you've got one of your own senators on his feet. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. Well, I'm uh, not. On relevance, my question asks for, on a financial institution perspective, and the minister is going to the, the broader issue of the cashless debit card. The minister has 31 seconds remaining, and uh, she, uh, minister, wait for the call. The implementation of the abolition of the cashless debit card and support for those people that would be on it and moving to other. Um, arrangements. Um, we are looking for the smoothest opportunity for them to ensure that the transition 
is appropriate and that they are supported through it. But we have, we have delivered on our commitment to abolish the cashless debit card. And I watched last night division after division, you lot try to keep it in place. That's what happened last night. That's what history will show. And we will work with communities to make sure Thank they you, are Minister, supported and treated with respect. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Will the minister now admit that the government has no intention to abolish the cashless debit card and has done nothing more than simply change its name? Minister. Uh, thank you. Last night, it's everyone over. in this place saw what Order. happened. We abolished the Order. cashless debit card program, yeah, yeah. a program that you introduced that your Order. own assessments showed was Minister, inconclusive. Resume your seat. Order. Order. You've asked the question, the Minister, Senator Wong. The Minister has the right to be heard in silence. Minister Gallagher. It was a failed program, uh, pre President. The coalition did not put a cent in the budget past June 30 for support Senator for Rustin. this. We on this side will work with communities to make sure they have the choice and that they are those communities receive the funding that is required to keep going a range of important social and community supports which were set to be cut by you lot. Yet another one of these terminating measures where there was nothing in the budget to deal with these substantial support programs. Well, we are fixing all of that and delivering on our election commitment to abolish the cashless debit card. And you were on the wrong side of history last night. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Steele John. I ask this question uh, to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Um, today I ask these questions on behalf of the over 500,000 uh, NDIS participants and their families across the country. Uh, firstly, uh, is it the Minister's view that the NDIS is costing too much? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And, um, we are making appropriate investments into the NDIS. We see it as a critical and as the architects of the NDIS, the party that actually drove the establishment of the NDIS, uh, that designed the NDIS, that reached agreement with all the states and territories uh, at the time, um, apart from WA, if I remember correctly, because I was the first minister of the ACT, uh, to implement a national scheme to ensure that people who have a disability and their carers are given the support uh, that's required to live a dignified and full life. And as someone who's worked in the disability sector before coming into politics, it was something I felt very proud of as a, a first minister of the ACT to be a part of, uh, and something that I worked collegiately with the former Labor government uh, to put in place. I see the NDIS as an investment in people uh, and an investment in the community, uh, and I have no doubt, and I already hear stories from people who are in. Uh, who receive uh, supports or resources through the NDIS about the difference it has made in their life. As the Minister for Finance, I also have a responsibility to make sure that the budget uh, is on a sustainable footing. And there's no doubt that of the five programs that are presenting long-term structural challenges to the budget—health, um, aged care, defence, servicing uh, the cost of a trillion dollars of Liberal debt, and the NDIS uh, are those top five programs. So from the, from the finance side of things, I have to look at how we can sustainably fund programs. Um, but as a, um, a person who's been part of working in the disability sector, I, I see the investments uh, in the NDIS as an investment in people, and I'm very proud of the reform that the former Gillard government introduced. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Steele John, first supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, in the October budget, can you confirm, Minister, that there will be no reduction uh, in the allocated funds uh, to the National Disability Insurance Scheme? Thank you, Senator Steele. John, Minister. Thank you. Well, this is Minister Shorten's area, and I can say that he is, he is um, in, in the work that I'm doing in forensically looking at all the costs through the budget. I know he is applying himself to make sure that every dollar spent uh, in the NDIS is going where it needs to go. Uh, and he has been leading that work, and I, I know that you've, you will have been following that, Senator Steele-John. In terms of um, 
additional investments or, or how the, you know, what flows through in the budget, you'll have to wait and see. But I can assure you it hasn't been the focus of my attention in terms of looking at areas where uh, we can uh, make sensible savings in the October budget. And I would also point out the way that it is um, um, written into the budget or factored into the budget uh, where there are ups and downs, it's through um, parameter variations, um, and it, that's informed by an actuarial assessment. Senator Steele John, second supplementary. Thank you, President. In relation to funds currently allocated to the NDIS uh, that are not spent uh, in this financial year, can you confirm uh, that if these funds, uh, can you confirm whether these funds uh, will be retained within the scheme, or uh, will they be removed from the scheme? Thank you, Senator Steele John, Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, thank you, Madam uh, President. We will be. Uh, releasing the budget on, on budget day, um, but the way that the NDIS is funded um, is through parameter variation. Sometimes that goes up and down depending on usage within the scheme. I can assure you it is not the focus of any of the work that I'm doing in terms of looking for um, additional uh, savings. And I know that Minister Shorten is also going through and looking at how current funding is applied to make sure that it's actually getting to where it needs to be and that we're not wasting money in litigation and uh, those other types of areas, which I know you have also been vocal on. Um, and um, the government remains committed to fully funding uh, the NDIS. Thank you, Minister. Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the 2021-22 final budget outcome tabled earlier today? Minister. Oh, thank you, President. I feel like I just keep standing today. Um, I can. I can, Senator White. Thank you so much for the question. The final budget outcome uh, shows that we have booked a substantial but temporary lift in revenues, mainly due to much higher than expected commodity prices. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. However, many. Okay. All right. Order. No, it's not misleading the Senate. Order. It Interjections across the chamber okay, are disorderly. Well, I've got, you know, I've been accused of misleading the Senate President. I can assure you, I am not misleading the Senate. And, and if I could get, if I could project my voice over those shouting at me, I would, could go through and explain. Um, we have, we have booked in revenues. So I'm not talking about payments. Um, in revenues, it is related to higher than expected commodity prices. However, many of the factors driving that improved end result will not be replicated over the medium term. You don't have to dig too deep through the data to get a good sense of the complex and confronting set of challenges we face in the nearer term. We know that the budget is facing sustained pressure into the future, with those opposite leaving Australia with a budget in structural deficit. And despite what they might say, an improved deficit alone is not proof of a strong and thriving economy or a budget. We have a budget weighed down by a mountain of debt that's becoming more expensive to service. In this, in this financial year, $17.9 billion spent servicing a trillion dollars of Liberal debt. 17.9. So more expensive than the PBS, more expensive than childcare, more than we spend on a range of government programs is just going into servicing the debt. And that was as of March. That was before the interest rates increase, which of course will add a significant cost to the budget. That is what we are dealing with. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your time has expired. Before I call Senator White, I am once again going to call the chamber to order. Interjections are disorderly. Interjections across the chamber while the minister is on her feet or while our senator is asking a question are absolutely disorderly, and I would ask you not to do that. Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister provide more detail on the debt inherited from the previous government and its impact for future budgets? Minister. Yes, Senator White. Yes, I can. The government inherited a budget heaving with a trillion dollars of debt, with ongoing budget deficits stretching beyond a decade. And as though they would like to rewrite history on debt and they would like to make it all about the pandemic, it had been doubled before the pandemic hit. It had been doubled after, after making commitments about lowering debt. 
what they went on in, before the pandemic was to double it. The facts are very, very clear on that. It's been that we Order. know Order. that the increase in interest rates could add more than $16 billion Order. in costs across the forward estimates and over $120 billion over the coming decade just because of the increasing interest rate impact on debt. At the moment, servicing the debt burden uh, that was forecast in the March budget is costing more than the PBS, more than childcare, more than higher education and more than government schools. That's what's Thank going you, on. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator White. I have Senate order. Senator Hume. Senator White. Can Senator the Minister provide more detail on the, de on the delayed spending from 2021 and its impacts on future budget capacity? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, because I have heard those opposite talking about this $50 billion windfall that's hit the budget, and that is looking backwards, I would say, President, as well as the final budget outcome does. But uh, about $20 billion of the uh, improvement to the budget bottom line was through lower payments or underspends. And these were money that the previous government had committed to get out the door in the last financial year, which they didn't get out the door. Well, I'm talking about a proportion of it. Again, Senator Hume, if you listen to me, of the, of the lower payments, of the lower payments, a significant proportion of that is programs that, they, that are not going out the door, and they will move into this financial year and the financial years beyond. And so that that spending will hit the future budget deficits that we're having to manage against a backdrop of increasing pressure in those five programs that I spoke to Senator Steele-John. So the budget is in structural deficit and we are working hard to repair it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Cyber Security, Minister Watt. The Optus data breach has resulted in personal details of millions of Australians being exposed and some of that data being made available online. The Privacy Act 1988 requires Optus to lodge a notifiable data breach report with the Office of the Information Commissioner. Minister, please advise if Optus has met this legal requirement and provided the appropriate documentation to the Office of the Information Commissioner. And from that, please advise the Senate how many Australians had their private data breached. I understand it's almost 10 million people. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Roberts, uh, for uh, a, a really important question, I think, about something that's concerned all Australians. Uh, I will have to come back to you on notice with the answers to your specific questions. You've sought some particular figures there that I don't have uh, ready to hand, although I, like you, have certainly heard uh, the reports of the number of Australians being affected to be in the vicinity of nine or ten million dollars, but I do want to make sure I give you accurate information about that. Uh, the, um, the, but I think, I think what we can all agree on is that Optus's handling of this matter has been very unsatisfactory. Um, and from the uh, issues around its initial disclosure of this data breach uh, to, frankly, the, its, its communication with the Australian public and the government uh, about these issues and what it's doing to fix it. Um, so your initial question about whether it had complied with one of its obligations, again, I will need to come back to you on notice and I'll do that as quickly as I can. Uh, but if uh, their track record over the last few days is any indication, then I do have concerns about Optus's uh, compliance with its obligations under the law. But again, I'm happy to come back to you with specific answers. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rod Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. Unconfirmed reports indicate that it was not sophisticated hackers who hacked this data. Rather, the Optus Data Sharing Application Programming Interface API, was used to obtain the huge amounts of data using an exploit that has been in place for five years. Minister, is an investigation underway to enforce the provisions of Section 13G of the Privacy Act, including penalties, and is the maximum penalty of $660,000 enough for a disgusting example of corporate malfeasance. Thank you, Senator Roberts. A minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Roberts. Again, uh, the, uh, what I can tell you is that the matter is being investigated for a, through a variety of channels. 
Uh, there are issues to do with potential privacy legislation breaches. You probably saw that the FBI is now involved in investigating this matter in addition to a range of Australian authorities. Uh, I will come back to you with a specific answer on the particular type of investigation you were asking about. Uh, on the matter of penalties, uh, I think it's been not only members of the government are on the record saying that penalties are uh, insufficient, but even members of the former government were on the record. The very ministers who had responsibility for cyber security in the former government were on the record saying that penalties were too low, and despite being in government, they did nothing to fix this problem. Uh, former Attorney General Christian Porter, uh, back in 2019, uh, admitted that penalties were too low. Three more years went by, nothing happened, and here we are. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you. The previous government circulated legislation for a trusted digital identity bill that watered down privacy provisions, and these are now clearly not sufficient to protect Australians. Minister, is the government going to introduce a digital identity bill? And if so, please explain the logic of putting all the data known about every Australian, including web surfing and social media posts, purchase history, financial history, health data, travel and associations with others in one data file and to make that available to companies like Optus. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister, uh, Minister Wong. Point of order, um, President, and I understand, Senator Watt will seek to respond to you, um, Senator Roberts, but I would indicate that I don't think that's a supplementary question. I think you've also switched portfolios because in relation to government digital identification, it would, I think, be um, Senator Gallagher, but we'll seek to assist you as much as we're able to. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, uh, and thanks again, Senator Roberts. Se Senator Gallagher, as uh, Senator Wong has indicated, is the responsible minister here, and Senator Gallagher has informed me that uh, this is a priority issue being considered by uh, state, territory and Commonwealth ministers responsible for data management within government, and it is intended to discuss this matter at a forthcoming meeting of the Ministerial Council. More broadly, uh, not only is this government, is our government, uh, investigating these matters, matters very seriously, but we have already commenced a range of reviews around the Privacy Act, cyber security. Uh, those reviews commenced before this latest incident, and frankly, the fact that this incident has occurred indicates that our laws do need a massive overhaul and were left neglected by the former government. So we take these issues very seriously. Uh, we're not going to dither like the former government did and we're not going to leave Australians exposed in the way that the former government did. Thank you, Ministers. As Senator McGrath. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. The Australian government's ongoing fully budgeted $10 million per annum wine, tourism and cellar door grants program provides a rebate of up to $100,000 for eligible Australian wine or cider producers oh. to invest in their businesses to attract visitors to wine regions, mm -hmm. helping grow Australian tourism businesses and local tourism jobs. Will the Albanese Labor government commit to providing the budgeted $10 million for the 2022 round of the wine, tourism and cellar door grants program? Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Wong. Uh, and again, uh, I understand, and I'll stand to be Is that corrected. A point of order? It's a point of order about the portfolio. I think the question should probably be, have been addressed to Minister Watt in terms of where the program lies. Uh, I'll see if Senator uh, Farrell can assist in any way. Senator Wong, as the leader, has advised the chamber that the minister is incorrect, but she's invited Senator Farrell to offer an, ex offer an answer to your questions if he can. Uh, on what basis have you just jumped up, Senator McGrath? No. Resume your seat. You either call a point of order or ask your question. I'm going to Senator Farrell now. You, sorry. Uh, thank, uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, um, Senator McGrath, for uh, for your uh, question. Um, as um, as the leader um, indicated, that this uh, is uh, an area of uh, Senator Watt's uh, direct uh, portfolio uh, responsibilities. But knowing something about the uh, wine industry, as I I do, um, I um, I had a particularly nice. Uh, I, I, 
Order. I'm sure many of those officers have tasted it too. Senator Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President. And um, I, I might also um, say I mentioned last night about the importance of civility in yeah. this place. Yeah. And um, um, yeah. you know, if um, if all these people uh, choose to turn up and uh, exercise their democratic right. I'd like to be civil to uh, the people on the other side, but I also like to be civil exactly. for them. And, uh, <laughs> but order. No, no. I asked I ask them to give me away. Um, so we uh, recognise the importance of the grape and the wine sector to the uh, economic uh, prosperity of uh, regional Australia. Um, and uh, I can say from uh, from experience that uh, Australian wine is the best uh, in the world. And, uh, uh, Senator that Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, Madam uh, uh, President, my apologies, uh, point of order, President. Um, if, if the minister is unable to answer the question, I, I would suggest that he takes it on notice because the question is actually in relation to a grant program for Celador Tourism, uh, and he has not had any. Thank you, Senator uh, Rustin. Get, uh, order. We offered for Senator Watt Senator to take Rustin, the question, uh, but he Thank could you. address the question. Thank you. Order, order, order. Senator McGrath has asked a question. The leader of the government has indicated to the chamber that it was not to the correct minister. Um, I'll invite Senator Farrell to continue to answer the question. It was directed to uh, Senator Farrell. He uh, has willingly uh, stood up to answer the question. Senator Farrell, please continue. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Um, look, I, I'm surprised uh, Senator Rustin, being a South Australian, wants to interfere with uh, my answering of this uh, answering of this question because uh, there's probably no state that's got a greater interest in the wine industry uh, than the uh, than the state of South Australia. But look. These, these, are, these are issues that are under consideration in the course of the, uh, the budget. As, as you'd expect, um, all of these things are under consideration in the course of the budget. Thank you, Minister. And the time we'll has be expired. Reporting back. Uh, Senator McGrath, first supplementary. Fulsome as always. Uh, the the Celador Grants program normally opens for applications on 1 July and closes 30 September each year. Given the industry has already waited three months for the grant round to open and the usual closing date is just two days away, when will the Albanese Labor government give small Australian wine businesses certainty, certainty about the future of this program? Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Farrell. Order. I, I actually agree. Order. Uh, senators, I'm waiting to call um, Senator Farrell. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, um, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator McGrath uh, for uh, for that supplementary uh, for that supplementary uh, question. Um, I think uh, uh, the finance uh, minister indicated uh, that there are a whole uh, range of areas where. Um, in the lead up to the uh, budget, there are uh, issues uh, under uh, under consideration. Um, um, coming from South Australia, of course, we understand just how important the uh, the wine industry uh, is to this country. <coughs> We've seen the neglect of our trading relationship under the former government uh, in respect of China. The way the way in which you the way in which you just sat on your hands while we lost all that trade. You're suddenly Order. interested Order. in helping the wine industry in this country. What about, what about the last two years? What about the last two years when you sat on your hands? You had a chance. You had a chance to repair the damage Thank to you, China, Minister. Your time and you has did expired. nothing. Senator Farrell, uh, Senator McGrath, second supplementary. The Australian wine industry is facing numerous global challenges. These challenges uh, are Senator being compounded. McGrath, please resume your seat. I can't hear the question because of the interjections across the chamber. Order. Um, please continue, Senator McGrath. Uh, the Australian wine industry is facing numerous global challenges. These challenges are being compounded by the government's delays and uncertainty about the future of this program. Why has the government created this funding uncertainty for Australian wine tourism businesses who have invested in their businesses and the Australian economy last year based on the availability of the rebate? 
Thank you, Senator McGrath. Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator McGrath for his question. He obviously didn't listen to my last answer, because had he done so, he would have understood that the problems of the wine industry, the problems, the problems that you're talking about, um, the problems McGrath. that you're talking about that face the wine industry right at this very moment, are directly related to the neglect and the failure of the former government uh, in respect Senator, of the— Senator McGrath, Sena resume your seat. Senator McGrath, when you stand, wait for the call. Do not just announce point of order. Uh, and I don't appreciate. Senator McGrath stood up and said point of order before he was called. Senator McGrath? What? A point of order. Thank you. The question related to uh, domestic, it was quite specific to domestic wine tourism in, a, in relation to a grants program. The minister is nowhere near within order because uh, he's you. wandered off into the sunset talking, uh, uh, talking thank you, about Senator other things. McGrath. We don't need the commentary. I'll um, invite the minister to either answer the question directly or take it on notice. And I'll ask everyone in the chamber to be quiet so that we can hear the answer. Minister. <coughs> I wish I had one. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, no, no, I haven't Order. forgotten. I haven't forgotten. I know exactly what I'm going to say. And uh, uh, coming coming from Queensland, I <coughs> coming from Queensland, I appreciate you don't know as much about the wine industry oh. as um, <coughs> Senator Farrell. Point of order. Senator McGrath. Order. Order. You just stood to your feet before you were called and called out point of order. You stand, you wait for the call, and then you indicate it's a point of order, not as you are rising to your feet. Senator McGrath. I uh, for misusing points of order. I have a point of order. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the minister has unfairly impugned my reputation oh, uh, by McGrath, saying I know nothing not about the great order. wine Resume industry of the seat. southern de Resume your seat. Uh, Minister, you've got 22 seconds. I'm not, President. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that point of order. I'm not uh, in any way impugning the Queensland uh, wine industry. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm impugning, I'm impugning Senator McGrath, and I, I find it difficult. Uh, I find Senator it difficult. Farrell, <laughs> Senator Farrell, Senator Farrell, please withdraw that comment. Order. Oh. Senator, Senator Farrell. Um, President, I will of course uh, withdraw that. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> you have six seconds left. <laughs> Order. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it is possible to. Senator <coughs> Rustin and Senator Wong. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, your time has expired. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong. A recent report by Oxfam and ActionAid shows that Australia is funding just one-tenth of its fair share of global climate action. As one of the world's largest fossil fuel exporters and as a wealthy colonial country, which has contributed significantly to global climate change, this is pretty pathetic. Pacific Island people are on the front lines of the climate crisis, despite contributing negligible amounts to global emissions. Recently, Pacific elders visited Parliament and once again called for Australia to do more and to take lead on climate change. Minister, will the government commit to finally paying our fair share of climate finance, which has been assessed at $4 billion a year? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Um, President, and I thank Senator Faruqi for the question. And I would make the point, I think there are a number of aspects of her question. First, I'll go to the uh, assistance that the government does uh, provide, and I would make the point that over the period those opposite were in government, they cut nearly $12 billion from development assistance. $12 billion. Uh, and I regret deeply that the bipartisanship that was offered by us in opposition for continuing 
uh, the, the uh, maintenance and the growth and the development in the ODA program, Official Development Assistance Program, was never taken up by either Minister Bishop or Minister Payne. I regret that uh, because it would have been much better, I think, for the country but also for the people of our region if that bipartisanship has be, had been maintained and there was less of a chase for some of the, the, the you know, right wing uh, populists who opposed development assistance. I think there is a strong national security case for development assistance, there is a strong uh, um, peace dividend from it and there is a strong uh, ethical um, uh, imperative for it as well, given we know we can avert, we can avert lives, uh, lives being lost and we can improve uh, education uh, and health outcomes for people who, and who need it so much in our region. In relation to climate, this government has come to office with a much more ambitious commitment on climate change. Uh, uh, this will see Australia's emissions uh, from, uh, reduced by 43 per cent. This will see uh, the vast majority of Australia's energy, notwithstanding that, that we are an emissions-intensive economy, uh, be in excess of 80 per cent this decade. Now, I appreciate that the Greens have not had, do not have the same view about the need to transition. Uh, we recognise the need to transition and deliver this in the real world. Uh, and on uh, uh, we have come to office when it comes to development with additional assistance to be provided to the Pacific, which was an election commitment, and I thank my colleagues for that, uh, and we have made clear to Pacific you, family Long members the importance has expired. of— uh, Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, Australia is currently contributing only around 0.22 per cent of its gross national income towards international aid, and I take your point that the Liberal National Government reduced that to a pittance. And this is extremely low well under one-third of what is recommended by the OECD and almost the lowest it's ever been. And it's totally inadequate to meet our obligations. So, Minister, what is your government going to do? And my question is, will the government increase its overall aid commitments in the upcoming budget and by how much? And Thank I would you, actually Senator appreciate Fariki, an answer to this question. Your time has expired. Minister. Thank you. Well, in relation to budget questions, there's been a lot of rule in, rule out, uh, which is a usual political process in the lead up to the budget. And I can remember both Senator Coleman and Senator Birmingham standing here and saying, well, uh, you know, these decisions will be made and they will be made in the budget and the budget will be handed down on uh, whatever day it was at that time. Uh, and so I'm not going to do the rule in, rule out. But what I would say to this senator is that we made a very clear and costed election commitment to additional funding for ODA, which was announced in the election campaign. Exactly. We did that in excess of a billion dollars over four years. Uh, that included additional ODA to the Pacific, additional ODA to South Southeast Asia, additional uh, $32 million to the Australian NGO Cooperation Program, known as the ANCP. Uh, and we did that because it was the right thing to do for Australia, because our security lies in our region and we have a national interest in, in doing what we can to make the region more stable and more secure. And we will deliver on that commitment. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, will the government commit to ending new coal and gas and establishing a transition authority to support coal and gas communities through a transition to renewable energy? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Wong. Thank you. I'm not sure it's a, a, a supplementary, but I'm happy to take the question. And I've responded on this front before. Uh, and I know this is the political point uh, uh, that the Greens wish to make, and, and they know that the UN framework, Convention on Climate Change, uh, does look to the emissions generated in one's own country, and Australia will be reducing those. Uh, uh, in relation to projects, uh, they will, you know, for, for whatever resource, uh, they will go through the appropriate environmental processes. And we will work. We will work with our Pacific Island family members. As members of the Pacific family, we will work with Pacific Island forum members. Because I'm not Senator those Wong, please uh, resume your seat. Senator Faruqi. Um, point of order on relevance. My question was very specific. It had no lead in, nothing. I'm asking about new coal and gas. And will the government commit to a transition authority? Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi. I believe the minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister. Well, I, I thought I actually specifically answered that, Senator Faruqi, and I know you may not like the answer. I made the point that you know, those projects would be assessed in accordance with Australia's stringent environmental standards. I made the point that the UN Convention on Climate Change does not call upon Australia to do what you are asking. So let's be clear. You are out of step with where the international community is on this issue. Thank you, Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Polly. 
Yes, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Can the minister please give an update to the Senate on the progress of the Exotic Animal Diseases Preparedness Task Force, which was announced last month? Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Polly, who I know has a long history as a supporter of the agriculture industry in uh, Tasmania. Uh, it's important to remember that Australia does remain free of foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. But while that remains the case, we must remain vigilant to biosecurity threats at our borders. Our three-pronged approach of helping Indonesia deal with their outbreak, strengthening our borders and improving preparedness is vital to ensure that we continue to remain free of these potentially devastating diseases. Last month, I created the Exotic Animal Diseases Task Force to ensure that Australia is fully prepared should an outbreak occur. And that's because good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst. The task force was co-chaired by senior experts in the Department of Agriculture and what was then the Emergency Management Australia, bringing together the experts in biosecurity and animal health within our government, along with experts in disaster management. I can confirm that the task force has now completed its assessment of Australia's preparedness if an exotic animal disease were to reach Australia. The task force conducted four weeks of rigorous testing of national biosecurity and emergency management plans. They undertook specific scenario exercises to test arrangements already in place to respond to incursions of foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, including for multiple outbreaks across multiple jurisdictions. The task force worked closely with state and territory governments, industry and Indigenous communities to ensure a national coordinated view was captured. The task force liaised with our Indonesian counterparts on how they have managed their outbreak, as well as looking at the UK's FMD outbreak in 2001, as well as COVID outbreaks and recent natural disasters in Australia, to see what lessons could be learned from those events. The exercises conducted by the task force also stress-tested how Australia's biosecurity plans interact with national emergency management. This way, we know we can organise a rapid response across Commonwealth, state, territory you, and industry Senator partners. Time has expired. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Thank you for that, Leadership Minister. But can you outline any findings that have been made by the task force and whether any of the recommendations— Order. 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 Senator Polly. Please continue. Oh, uh, you have. I haven't finished. Order. Order. No, Murray, now you're blown. Order. No one knew before. You couldn't possibly know what to answer. Senator Polly, have you finished your question? I haven't finished my Thank question. You, Would you like me to start it again? Yes. Order. Order. With the leadership bit put in. Senator Polly, please continue your question. The leadership demonstrated by the minister has been outstanding. Can you tell us whether or not any of the recommendations from that report will be accepted by the government, Minister? Minister. Thank you, President. And uh, Senator Polly, I would lo love nothing more. I, I apologise for being so eager to talk about this task force's work. Uh, overall, I am pleased to advise that this review has found that our biosecurity system is strong and sound, particularly in prevention and mitigation. There is good reason to expect that Australia will remain free of these diseases well into the future, although, as I've put on the record before, the risk is certainly there. The review also found that some of our biosecurity responses do need to be updated to be current with the times and with the technology we now have. For example, the review suggested that a COAG instrument that hadn't been looked at since 2002 should be updated to better fit our modern times. The review also made suggestions around better crisis communications capacity, regularly updated national plans, improved data collection and improved collaboration with states and territories. These suggestions are now being implemented. This is why the work of the task force was so important, so in the unlikely event of an incursion we are well prepared to limit the spread and impact of these foreign Thank diseases. You, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Polly's second supplementary. Can the minister outline what the next steps are to ensure Australia is well prepared to respond to any potential major biosecurity outbreak? Thank you, uh, Senator Polly. Minister. Thank you again, Senator Polly. Uh, as part of Australia's strongest ever response to a biosecurity threat, our three-pronged approach will continue to serve us well uh, as we fight to keep foot and mouth disease out of our country. 
but we must remain vigilant to this threat and continue to improve our responses going forward. This work will now lead into and inform Exercise Paratus, a live boots on the ground foot and mouth disease based scenario to be undertaken with states and territories next year. We are also continuing our support for Indonesia to assist them control their outbreak. As of last week, I'm pleased to report that 250,000 doses of lumpy skin disease vaccine supplied by Australia had been administered to Indonesian livestock, while Australia's supply of one million foot and mouth disease vaccines have been distributed, with 600,000 being delivered to the island of Bali alone. A further three million vaccines will arrive in the coming weeks, and we've also trained more than 300 local officials with specific focus on technical aspects of vaccine delivery, biosecurity management and record keeping. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Macdonald. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Finance and Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. On Tuesday, the 13th of September, at the Regional Nash uh, Australia Institute National Summit, Minister Catherine King said, "This government has committed to delivering $1.5 billion to construct common use of marine infrastructure at the Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct near Darwin. Is your government still committed to the Middle Arm project in the Northern Territory?" Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Um, uh, President, and I think um, Senator Macdonald uh, would know that we uh, agreed to that as part of our election campaign. Uh, and Minister King's comments at, um, that you referred to reflect that. Um, there is a range of other spending around that program. I think in the budget it was, it was funded as part of a broader package with other elements in it, um, and we are currently working through all the details around that. We want to make sure that there is appropriate business cases, due diligence, that the um, spending is going is the right amount of spending that should be allocated to that, and that's the work that I've been reflecting on um, for the last, um, you know, question times in here about doing that uh, assessment, essentially, that every dollar that was committed in, in the previous government's last budget actually is um, quality spending going where it's needed, uh, and that's the work we're doing. Thank you, Minister. Sorry, Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. A week later, on Tuesday uh, the 20th of September, at a press conference with the Treasurer in reference to the Middle Arm project, Minister Gallagher said, we are looking at them all, all of those commitments, line by line. But when seven days earlier Minister King outright committed to the project, uh, Minister, who is telling the truth, you or the Infrastructure Minister? Minister. Thank you. Well, it's a shame you can't rewrite your um, supplementary questions on the fee in light of the answer that I just gave. Uh, in that press conference, we were asked around a range of programs, and we are reviewing all of them. We are reviewing, we are oh, reviewing every single measure in the budget, but there are a range of measures that we matched. Now, the work we are doing is to make sure that the money that was allocated is the right amount of money to go to that program. Because forgive us over here, but some of your budgeting was pretty dodgy, to be honest. Uh, and so we are going through. We are going through. We are a grown-up government where ministers do their jobs. We don't have a prime minister taking responsibility for every portfolio and making decisions based on apparently nothing. We want the evidence, we want the assessment, and the ERC, as a collective, will make decisions based on that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. So, still no clarity on the commitment or not commitment. On September the 11th, as reported in the Sydney Morning Herald, a spokesman for Infrastructure Minister Catherine King signalled further cuts to the Regional Accelerator Program and the Energy Security Plan were likely. There are few elements of both the Regional Accelerator Fund and the Energy Security and Regional Development Fund that were matched during the election or in a subsequent decision will be funded in some form. Can Minister Gallagher confirm what the few elements are? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't think I could have been clear about the original question because I did answer that straight up. Um, in terms of the other, the other outcomes of the decisions that we've been taking through the budget process, you will see those reflected in the budget process, like as, as you did in your budget. We are going through them line by line. Where we have to make some savings. We have to reprioritise. We have to make sure that the precious dollar that's going out the door is actually going where it's needed. 
In some cases, grants under your government went where proponents didn't even know they had applied um, for it. Uh, Minister, so we please would like resume your seat. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. This is a specific question. Can Minister Gallagher confirm what the few elements are? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Macdonald. The minister is being relevant to your question. Thank minister. you. I've answered the question. Thank you. Minister Wong. I said further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. In question time on Monday, I took up questions asked of me by Senator Shrewbridge on notice in my capacity as the minister representing the Attorney General relating to freedom of information. I've written to Senator Shoebridge to provide additional information and I table my letter to him for the information of all senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to take note uh, to answers from ministers to questions from members of the opposition. Um, on the issue of the cost of living, it's amazing that, as opposed to giving some direct answers about what the government will do to help Australians who are struggling with the cost of living, uh, they launched straight into some revision of history which you'd have to describe almost as delusional. And I'll cover some of those points before highlighting some of the differences in decisions that they are making now in government and those which we made uh, when we were in government not that long ago, as well as some elements of design around critical elements of our economy that go directly to the cost of living. On the delusion side, we heard a lot of comments today about debt that was inherited uh, by this government. And they made the case, somewhat delusionally, that this debt was irresponsible and a product of poor government. But they seem to have forgotten that at the time when this government was seeking, as in the Morrison government was seeking to withdraw, for example, support to people through the JobKeeper program, it was members on that side who were saying the government should extend that program. At a time when we were successfully getting vaccination rates up through the nation, in fact leading toward the end vaccination rates for second and third doses, it was that side who were suggesting we should pay people to have vaccinations. So the whole delusion around debt ignores the fact that decisions that are made lead to good outcomes. So the $50 billion that was talked about as coming unexpectedly into the budget is in part because of decisions that were made to keep people in work. Because when people are in work, people are not drawing on welfare and people are paying taxes, which means that government expenditure is down and incomes are up. And it's a matter of record, it's a matter of fact that over the term of the Morrison government, there was 1.9 million jobs created, and unemployment went down to 3.9 per cent, which is the lowest in decades. Simultaneously with that, one of the ways that the government made decisions to actually reduce cost of living pressures was to give tax relief. And in the measures that were brought in in various budgets, the Morrison government brought in tax relief that had some $40 billion of tax relief benefiting around 11 million Australians, which meant that the program we put in place would see 95 per cent of Australian taxpayers on marginal rates of 30 per cent or less. That is the way that you actually help people into work. You help people to keep more of what they earn so that they have the funds they need to care for their families, to pay their mortgages and to pay their power bills. We also sought to make sure that from an engineering perspective, the things that actually enable our power system, uh, for example, adequate supplies of gas for the peaking power that we need to keep prices down, uh, were available. And so the other side, some 96 times during the election campaign, made the promise that they would reduce power prices by $275. Well, instead, there are headlines in the media 
of my home city of Adelaide, saying, and I quote, South Australian power bills to rise in cost of living blow. Tens of thousands of South Australian households are set to be hit with increased electricity bills after the energy industry watchdog made the difficult decision to increase benchmark prices by hundreds of dollars per year. And so when we look at cost of living, it's important to understand that the decisions that are made actually impact on the government's ability to support families on people's abilities to get jobs, to keep more of the money they've paid, of they have made, so that they can pay the bills. And the sort of decisions we see from those on the government benches now, if you look at the Australian Financial Review just this week, the headline there is Labor at it again in a surprise move of dividends. So they are actually planning to bring retrospective measures around uh, imputation credits that will actually give surprise tax bills to people, so increase the cost of people at a time when they're promising to reduce cost of living pressures. Senator Sheldon. Deputy President. Wasn't it just like, you know, constantly we come in here and we hear this, the question put by the opposition about the question of cost of living. Yet here are the same people that wouldn't support a dollar increase for the lowest paid people in this country. Here's the same people that opposed childcare support for 1.26 million people. Here's the same people that didn't support and didn't act on gender pay inequity. And they are all things we're doing. We're turning around and making actions to make sure real effect of cost of living advantages for our community. And of course, let's look at the jobs and skills in this community. Let's talk about the hundreds of thousands of skilled jobs that have been lost under this previous opposition when they were in government. Over nine years, jobs lost. And of course, their answer is, when a consensus has been built in this country, they don't want to turn up. They refuse the leader of the opposition to turn up to a jobs and skills summit. That's the reality. That's what they think. They just don't have a policy or an answer. But then again, I should actually withdraw that comment, because they did have a policy. They had a clear policy to drive wages down in this country. This is a design feature of that government. When they were in government, they said it was a design feature. And of course, what the consequences of that was is that we've seen for the first time in the history of this country the middle class in this country shrink under your watch. Not with a solution, not with an answer, not with a plan to turn around and make sure that working people and small businesses and businesses generally can turn around and compete in the markets that you've managed to turn around and do so much damage on. They went with trim, they had uh, waste and rorts. The point of order. The senator has twice referred to you in his contribution. I would ask that he direct his comments through the chair, please. Senator Sheldon, I give you the, I give you the call. You've heard the point of order. Uh, thank you. I, I think, um, uh, Deputy President, I think um, uh, you as um, them, the opposition, and the previous government, who turned around and quite clearly destroyed the middle class and have been undermining it through their entire term, and it was part of their design feature to make sure that working people in this country had less in their pockets. And guess what? You succeeded. You did deliver on your policy. And we're all paying you, the opposition, when you were in government, delivered on that policy. That's exactly what you did. When you turned around, this government turned around, when they were in government, the opposition turned around very clearly. Now, they said things like the gig economy. Too hard, too hard, they said, when they were in opposition, when they were in government, this opposition, they turned around and said it was too hard to turn around and regulate the gig economy. $6.67 an hour was some of the average payments per hour that was being paid. And they said it was $6.67. That's right, Senator Shikoni. They said there was nothing they could do to give the people minimum payments in this country. And that's what they said when they were, that's what was said when they were in government. And quite clearly, when we've turned around and got into government, we've said quite clearly that we have to make a number of serious changes to what's happened under their watch. As they drove down the middle class and put more pressure on pensioners, 
We've come up with solutions about for pensioners, about making sure that we can have work bonuses for, so pensions can turn around and get out there and do more hours. We've turned around and built a consensus on jobs and skills across this economy. We've turned around and said that we'll make sure that the middle class grows in this country. We've turned around and watched quite clearly under the previous government where they turned around and allowed companies like McDonald's to steal from the youngest, the youngest people in our country and see people like Qantas turn around and steal hundreds of millions of dollars paid in payback after you've turned to their shareholders, whilst as a government they gave them $2 billion. Okay, okay. They gave them $2 billion. Good suggestion. Did they have any strings attached, like you wouldn't turn around and misuse the money? No, they didn't. Waste, rort, incompetence, and the consequence was that hardworking Australians have been paying the price. Now We've seen clearly in the examples that uh, this gov the previous government have turned around and did not support aged care workers. They didn't support them. They wouldn't support the wage increase. The opposition, when they were in government, would not support feminised industries to get wage increases. They would not fund the wage increases for the Fair Work Commission. That's what the opposition said when they were in government. That's what their plan was. That's what their plan was for cost of living. They succeeded. Wages down, middle class collapses, feminised industries without wage increases, our worst paid, lowest paid, not receiving wage improvements. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rather take note of the uh, cost of living question. Uh, this, uh, people who are visiting in their school holidays today have heard why it's called question time and not answer time. Because, in the words of Patches O'Houlihan from Dodgeball, we have had ducks, dodges, ducks, dips, dives, and dodges on the questions today. The, uh, yesterday, Senator Pocock warmly welcomed Sam and Leani to this place, highlighting their struggles with cost of living. Their answer from the government was to give them a wave. It was the Liberal and Nationals government who took decisive action to reduce the cost of fuel. It was the Liberal and Nationals government pragmatic approach to reduce the excise by 25 cents a litre, putting money back in the pockets of mums and dads. Tonight, that cost will be added to every single litre of fuel for every motorist across Australia. Andy Lane of Aberdeen wrote to me this week after fuel at his local service station rose from $1.40 to $1.91. From tonight, that will go to $2.16 a litre. Since elected, this government has failed to recommit to their $275 cut to energy bills. Despite repeating this commitment during the election 97 times, we heard they'll save all of the people up there, uh, Mr Deputy Chair, I'm the President, 97 times we heard that they will commit to a $270 reduction in energy prices. And what do we hear now? Silence. That is why June Rose Richardson from Taree contacted my office after receiving her last energy bill for $461.28. That is an increase of 30 per cent from six months ago, even though Ms Richardson has reduced her energy usage by 20 per cent on last year. Prices just keep going up. Cost of living just keeps going up. Like Senator Pocock, I ask the question, what do you say to Ms Richardson when then those on limited incomes have to choose between heating and housing? Does she deserve a wave as well? Just a little one. Just a little one. Today, Senator Dean Smith moved an amendment to, the, to give seniors like June Rose, who received an age pension, the ability to earn additional income to help the cost, rising cost of living they are experiencing under Labor. Because if this government won't help them, we will help them help themselves. I I'd like to thank the Greens for their support of this measure, but where was Labor again on this? They were silent. The lowest earners, the hardest workers, they are suffering disproportionately under those opposite. What we are seeing is not just a two-speed economy under Labor, we are seeing a two-class economy. Those that can see the city from their front door and those that can't. The class warfare that defined Bill Shorten's leadership is now rearing its ugly head under Anthony Albanese, the man who said, I like fighting Tories, that's what I do. If you live in the CBD, welcome to Albo's gold class, 
but for those of us in the regions, the doers, the makers, the growers, the producers of our wealth, we are re relegated to cattle class. The bread and butter budget, Mr Deputy President, that Senator, uh, Treasurer Jim Chalmers has promised is all regional communities across the country can ever expect from Labor to eat bread and butter because they'll be afforded to eat no more. We've heard already firsthand how Catherine King has been cancelling vital funding for projects across regional Australia that were funded whilst we were in government. But she is becoming the David Copperfield of regional infrastructure, making projects disappear at the flash of a wand. Some of these projects are even in Labor seats, but they are regional and so they don't count anymore under this government that counts the cities, not the regions. Mr Deputy President, Marion on the north coast has told me just on the 1st of July her doctor stopped bulk billing. She, like many in the Foster Tuncurry area and across country communities, now must pay $70 on concession to see the doctor with only $39 returned by Medicare. Not only do we have to choose between heating or homes, we now have to choose about health as well. What are we going to tell the people about that? How will you address these cost of living issues faced by Andy and June Rose and Marion? We heard today, in the words of Patches O'Hulahan, you will dodge, duck, dip, dive and dodge anything to help them out. Thank you. Before I give you the call, Senator Payne and Senator Cadell, in future, can you refer to the Prime Minister as the Prime Minister or by his seat and not our bow? Sorry, save you. <laughs> Senator Payne. Thank you, Thank you, Deputy President. Um, it's interesting to hear uh, the audacity the other side has to attack us when uh, we've, we've hit the ground running 120 days in and we've delivered more for the nation than the opposite could even dream of. Um, Senator Cadell, as you were mentioning, it is, it's very interesting, uh, Deputy President, to hear two new senators discuss cost of living pressures, uh, where my fellow uh, WA senators here would also know that Western Australians made a massive decision in the election, and that was to go for a government, to elect a government that actually cares, that's passionate about um, ensuring that everyone has a fair go, ensuring that uh, there's integrity, transparency and action on things that are impacting our lives. Um, ensuring that the pressures on families are reduced. Um, talking about the fuel excise, it was introduced on March 30th. Isn't that a surprise? Just before, two months before the election, um, was that a vote winner? I'm not sure. I'll leave that. And and in in saying that, people understand the pressures of 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 the of um. The, the, we understand the pressures um, on the budget and why we can't continue and extend order, the fuel excise. Order. Allow the, uh, let's hear the senator in silence. Um, we understand that with a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars in debt, um, it, Australians know that we cannot uh, fix the problems overnight. This government has been doing a lot in terms of the skills crisis we're uh, facing young people, uh, young people in Western Australia have been coming up to me and talking about uh, the pressures on the housing market, uh, just not being able to afford rent, um, but also just the fact that young people have slipped through the cracks uh, under the previous government. We have not been considered at the decision-making tables. Um, it is it is atrocious to sit in this place and hear those opposite having a go at us when we've achieved so much in the last 120 days. Um, uh, we've heard Senator Sheldon literally list out, if you were listening, Senator Sheldon has listed out so many things we've achieved. Um, and as a fellow WA senator, you definitely know that you know, we've, we've won. we needed a change in government because there was way too much inaction, division and lack of focus by the previous government and Australians were sick of it. They were just tired. They needed a sense of hope and that's what the current 
um, Albanese Labor government is going to be delivering. We will go into October and come out with a budget that will benefit everyone. Um, and something that's dear to my heart, I've seen how my sister, um, who is a, a master's of pharmacy student but also has an 18-month-old baby, is struggling to make ends meet, struggling to pay her mortgage with her husband, struggling to um, you know, pay for childcare. And this has all happened and we've seen the impacts on real life people um, and it is time to, to get the ball rolling. It is what the Albanese Labor government is going to ease those pressures. Um, and not only as young people are facing the crisis of housing, uh, climate change, but also uh, education. When it comes to accessibility to TAFEs, um, apprenticeships, traineeships, it is the Labor government that will ensure that everyone has access uh, to you know, um, the education that we deserve, but also uh, employment opportunities out there, because it is tough. Tough putting food on the table, tough paying bills, um, tough making ends meet. Um, and these are based on the mismanagement of the previous government for all the rorts, for all the um, uh, poor decision-making policies that have, that have landed us in a, in a very difficult place. But Australians know that it's not something that we can change overnight, uh, but they have faith in the Albanese Labor government to fix the issues, the mess, and they've tr they trust us based on the uh, leadership and transparency that we have um, indicated and we've been delivering ever since, including the abolishment of the cashless debit card last night. I put the question moved by Senator. F oh, sorry. Yes, no. My apologies, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And um, uh, I do note that the, the government is really struggling to defend their position on this. And as we saw during question time, and as we continue to see during taking note. Uh, what the government continues to do is to try and deflect the question, blame somebody else for the problem so that they don't have to actually answer the question. And that's one of the really disappointing things, and I think Senator Cadell's comment was quite um, on point. Uh, it's called question time because it's about the questions. It's not about uh, the government providing answers, and they continue to deflect the question blame somebody else, it's not their problem, uh, and, and then uh, not answer the question. Uh, and why don't they answer the question, Deputy President? Why don't they answer the question? Because despite going to the previous election saying hundreds of times that they had a plan, they actually don't have a plan. They did make some promises. They did make some promises, particularly in relation to the cost of living. They said that Australians would continue to receive pay rises ahead of the CPI. Well, how's that promise going? That's, that promise has disappeared because we know with the CPI rising the way that it is, it's not sustainable to occur and it's only going to continue to feed into the inflationary cycle. So Labor's promise from before the election, Deputy President, will actually hurt Australians. Uh, so they know that they can't keep that promise and they've walked away from that. They promised Australians $275 a year reduction in their fuel in their uh, energy bills. Well, that only lasted a matter of a few weeks, Deputy President. They've walked away from that. They told Australians that they would be with them all the way. Labor would be with Australians all the way. That's what they told them before the election when they were seeking their vote to get elected. What's clear, Deputy President, what is patently clear is that Australians are on, are on their own under this Labor government. They are on their own. When it came to providing support for cost of living through the reduction in um, fuel tax, uh, we provided that. We provided that at the peak of the price of fuel. It was Labor's decision as to whether they continue that. It was Labor's decision as uh, to continue that, as it would have been ours had we won the election. We didn't, but it would have been a decision that we had to make. It is now a decision for the Labor Party. So trying to deflect, trying to blame somebody else is quite frankly cowardly, it's weak, it's gutless. And Labor need to be prepared to take responsibility for it. 
We know. We know the history of Labor's management of the finances. We saw what happened when they were in government last time, and we still remember what happened when they were in government the time before. It took us six years. It took the coalition six years to get Labor's mess under control after we last came to government in 2013. And once we'd got done that, after six years, we had the budget back in balance. And then the pandemic started. But we remember when we put JobKeeper in place, we saved hundreds of thousands of jobs, kept hundreds of thousands of workers connected to their businesses, and kept the economy strong during the pandemic. And yet the Labor Party were barracking and calling for us to spend more money. They wanted us to spend $300 per Australian, $6 billion, to encourage people to get vaccinated, when they were already rolling up in their droves to do that. So how much worse would, would Australia's financial position be if we had listened to the Labor Party and the things that they were calling us to do when we were in government, which we resisted? We responsibly wound back the income support that kept the economy going and that kept Australians supported during COVID. We have one of the most successful vaccination rates of any country in the world. Uh, and we came out of COVID with a strong economy. Uh, and, those, and, and the strength of that economy, the government is now benefiting from in the budget numbers. It's interesting, though, um, Deputy President, that the Independent um, uh, Parliamentary Budget Office confirmed that Labor's policies would result in higher debt and deficits than the plan put forward by the coalition at the last election. So they can't come in here and try and deflect not answer the question and blame somebody else. They are responsible for their financial position and they should have the courage to stand up and take that responsibility. I put the question moved of, to the, of the mo I put the question in relation to the motion moved by Senator Fawcett. Those of the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. Let me share something very genuine uh, with the Senate this afternoon. As disabled people, as NDIS participants, we have for the last 10 years— uh, Sir, Sir, Sir John, uh, just moved that you wish to take note of an answer. Oh, I, apologies, Chair. I, I, move, I wish you, I move to take note of an answer given uh, by, uh, by the Finance Minister, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, disabled people, NDIS participants, have for 10 years feared the federal budget feared it because every year we have known, with the Liberals in charge, uh, that there is a government at the helm uh, that never really believed in the NDIS uh, and uh, that has been working uh, to kick us off the NDIS to cut our plans to deny us the support we need. And this fear is very legitimate. Uh, in 2019, we woke up on Budget Day to find out that the former government had reallocated $4 billion uh, from our NDIS back to the general revenue pool in order to deliver their back in black moment. Remember those teacups the former Treasurer was so proud of? And what did that mean? Coffee mugs, Senator Scar interjects. I'm sorry, they were coffee mugs. Very funny. Now, the reality of those cuts was the beginning of a fear campaign run by the former government with a very clear message. Disabled people are too much of a burden financially for the federal government to bear. And so we must make cuts and so we must change policies with the aim of kicking them off. That was the message of the former government. That was the fear under which we lived as disabled people. Because let me remind the Senate, when an NDIS plan is cut, that means that a disabled person isn't able to have a shower every day, isn't able to get food every day, isn't able to get out in the community to make friends, to have work. It means that we are subjected to violence, abuse and neglect. That is the reality of a plan cut. That is the reality of an underfunded NDIS. Now, the disability community looked to the election result 
with the hope that the fear campaign would end, that finally disabled people, NDIS participants in Australia would be able to have confidence that their NDIS would not be plundered, that their plans would not be cut, that they could be safe in the knowledge that they would be able to get the support that they need. And today, in the Senate and in the House, I, in the House, and my uh, colleague, the member for Ryan, the Greens member for Ryan, uh, gave the Finance Minister and the NDIS Minister the opportunity to end the fear campaign, to put their money where their mouth so often is, to rebuild that trust, to provide certainty. We asked them a very simple question. Will you guarantee that this budget will deliver not one cut to the NDIS? Will you guarantee that the funds, uh, if uh, they are unspent in the scheme for this year, will be retained for participants? Well, the Minister in the House, all he could guarantee was that the NDIS under Labour would be a positive experience, while the Finance Minister, who actually holds the purse strings in this conversation, well, all they could say was that they were concerned to ensure the, government was, the budget was placed on a sustainable footing and that the NDIS wasn't a focus for that work. Well, I can tell you what, for disabled people who have been denied access to funds, services and supports because the NDIS must be remained and sustained and sustainable, whether or not you are going to make cuts in this budget, whether or not you are going to retain funds in the scheme is our primary focus because this is our life. The government had the opportunity today to end the fear, to provide the certainty to ensure that the over 500,000 NDIS participants and their families could finally, after 10 years, breathe out in the knowledge that they would not have to worry about cuts to the NDIS in the upcoming budget, that they would no longer be used as the can kicked around the floor, as the money bag smashed when the government wants to get some money back, uh, maybe to pass out to their fossil fuel mates or to their friends in the gas industry, for instance. The government failed to do that, and so it will be now the work of the Greens and the disability community between now and Budget Day to ensure that all pressure is applied uh, to ensure that the government does not cut our NDIS. I put the question. Those the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. We're now moving to um, the anniversary of the Bali bombing, and I welcome um, to the chamber His Excellency Dr. Siswo Pramo No, Senator Wong. Thank you, <clears throat> President. I seek leave to move Government bus Business Notice of Motion Number Five. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I also, on behalf of Sen uh, Senator Birmingham, move that the Senate acknowledges 12 October 2022 marks 20 years since that terrible night in Kuta, Bali, when 202 innocent lives, including 88 Australians, were lost in the Bali bombings. And this date will be a difficult day for many Australians and Indonesians, as well as people around the world whose lives were changed forever that night and who continue to feel the impact of this senseless act. B recognises the brave efforts of first responders whose instinct to run towards danger saved the lives of many, and the professionalism of the Australian police, defence, diplomatic and medical staff who responded alongside their Indonesian counterparts with extraordinary courage and compassion in the aftermath of the attacks. C notes the friendship of our the strength of our friendship with Indonesia and the work we continue to do together, including to counter terrorism and violent extremism and calls on all Australians to keep those whose lives were lost, lost in our thoughts today and over the coming weeks as this sad anniversary is observed. Can I start by also acknowledging uh, the uh, an Ambassador for Indonesia, um, Paksiswa Pramana. You're very welcome in this chamber with your colleagues, Excellency, uh, as a, and we are very honoured to have you here today. On 12 October 2002, terrorists attacked Paddy's Pub and the Surrey Club in Kuta, Bali. 
They killed 202 innocent people, among them 88 Australians, 38 Indonesians and citizens of 20 other countries. Another 209 people were injured, many of them seriously, suffering severe burns and shrapnel injuries. Most of the victims who died were under 40. Nearly half were under 30. People of diverse faiths, ethnicities and nationalities from different walks of life, tourists and holiday makers, teammates from rugby league, AFL and other sporting clubs celebrating or commiserating the season past, groups of friends and colleagues, young couples and families on an evening out. The attack was shocking not just because of who it targeted but because of where it happened. It happened on what the former governor of Bali, Bapak Mangu Pastika, called a small yet peaceful island. Bali has been treasured by generations of Australians. It has been a place that welcomed us, a place of culture and natural beauty, a place to rest and restore, a place of social ritual and of memory and meaning. And that night it became a site of pain and of tragedy. And 20 years on, the pain of that night is still with us and still with so many. We remember the victims, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, friends, cruelly taken from us by an act of cowardice. And we know that the survivors, first responders and their families continue to live with the physical and mental scars. We continue to mourn the loss of the many victims and remember the heroes who risked themselves for others. As the then Governor Pastika said ten, nights, ten years ago, that night we saw that there are angels living around us. Survivors of the blast who helped each other to safety in the face of extreme danger. Extending care and compassion to perfect strangers. First responders, among them police, medical staff, embassy and consular officials and brave volunteers who ran towards the blast sites. Many worked throughout the night, searching for survivors and administering critical care. Doctors and nurses at hospitals in Bali, Darwin and Perth treated the injured and comforted them, comforted them through their pain. And they showed the best of us, Australians and Indonesians working together. We know the terrorists sought to divide our two countries and our peoples, to drive a stake into our multi-faith, multicultural democracies, and we know they failed. Instead, our two peoples are united. We're bound together in a shared purpose. The spirit of friendship between our people and the cooperation between our two countries has been strengthened. You see, out of that loss and tragedy came strength and courage, a defiance in the face of terror a refusal to be intimidated by those who seek to inflict harm on us, a resolve that we would work together and face future challenges side by side. And that sense of cooperation continues to this day across the full breadth of our relationship. Australia and Indonesia are connected in almost every sphere of life, culture, education, trade, commerce, and cooperation on many global challenges, including climate change. Together, we built the Jakarta Centre for Law Enforcement Cooperation, which has trained tens of thousands of police officers and strengthened our ties in so many areas. Its motto, learning and understanding through shared experience, epitomises the approach we take together as partners. And even when terror struck again on the 1st of October 2005, killing 15 Indonesians and four Australians, we didn't lose hope. In fact, we redoubled our efforts. We looked for new ways to cooperate and solve our shared challenges. And programs like the Australia Indonesia Muslim Exchange help us learn and understand each other through shared experience. Like the Australia Indonesia Youth Exchange Program before it, which this year celebrates 40 years, these cultural exchanges showcase the things that make us each unique. Communities in, in Australia and Indonesia responded to the attacks not by withdrawing in fear or by being divided, but by coming together in the pursuit of peace, forging a special connection that extends beyond governments and beyond politics. So 20 years on, Australians continue to visit Bali, and the Balinese people welcome us again 
with generosity and with warmth. Before the pandemic, around a million Australians each year visited the beaches of Kuta or Seminyak, relaxed amongst the hills of Ubud, or enjoyed a moment of quiet reflection at Pura Lempuyang. And many of those who were there 20 years ago continue to visit, and some continue to live in Bali. On 12th October this year, we will mark the 20th anniversary of the National Memorial Service in the Great Hall here in Parliament House and at a service being held at the, at the Australian Consulate General in Bali. And these commemorations will offer an opportunity for all those affected to come together, to remember, to honour, to pay tribute, and to remember the lives of those lost that night, to stand with the survivors, their relatives and their families, and support them at this time to assist, to acknowledge the bravery and selflessness of those who assisted in the response and to mark the ongoing spirit of friendship and cooperation between the Australian and Indonesian people. I commend the motion to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, President. And I too rise to speak in support of the motion, noting the 20th anniversary of the Bali bombings. And uh, I thank the government for the opportunity to co-sponsor this motion. And I too, on behalf of the coalition, acknowledge the presence in the chamber today of His Excellency, the Indonesian Ambassador to Australia. Thank you so much for honouring us with your presence, sir. It was one of those moments in history when Australians remember exactly where they were, the moments reports came home of the Bali bombings. At 11.05pm on 12 October 2002, a suicide bomber detonated at Paddy's Pub in Kuta, Bali, sending the injured and survivors out onto the street. Minutes later, another bomb detonated across the street at the Sari Club. The attacks brought immeasurable emotions of anger and grief. 202 people from more than 20 countries died. Over 100 people suffered irreparable injury from the blasts and fire that followed. Australia suffered the greatest toll, with the 88 Australians losing their lives. This year we mark 20 years since that night occurred. We remember those lost and we offer our deepest sympathies to the victims' families those who still carry the scars. We also acknowledge the selflessness of the first responders in the wake of the devastation. Today, here in this place, and on the 12th of October, we will remember those 88 Australians. The horror of that night is also a reminder of our resolute pledge against terrorism. Two days after the bombings, then Prime Minister John Howard said this. In many respects, the word terrorism is too antiseptic an expression to describe what happened. It is too technical and too formal. What happened was barbaric, brutal mass murder without justification. It is seen as that by the people of Australia and it is seen as that by the people of the world. It is a terrible reminder that terrorism can strike anyone, anywhere, at any time. Coming only a little more than 12 months after September 11, it is a sentiment that continues to serve as a reminder of events that changed the course of history. Sadly, the threat of terrorism persists. Australia has always been resolute in keeping Australians safe from terrorism. Successive governments have continued to work with international partners to prevent the devastation of terrorism and the ideologies that fuel them. And we recommit our bipartisan support to continue in the fight against terrorism in all of its forms. In the years following the Bali bombings, former Prime Minister Howard reflected, and he said this, those who were responsible for this terrible deed 
may have hoped a number of things. They may have hoped that they would have driven Indonesia and Australia further apart. Instead of that, they brought Indonesia and Australia closer together. Our two countries were thrust together beyond the shared connection of being Pacific neighbours, forging a united determination to eradicate the threat of violent extremism in the region and globally. In the aftermath of the bombings, Australia responded without hesitation. 61 injured victims were transferred to the Royal Darwin Hospital and burns units across the country within 62 hours of the blasts, with military and civilian flights aiding the evacuation. Our Australia Defence Force launched Operation Bali Assist, evacuating Australians and foreign nationals and providing medical assistance. The Australian Federal Police deployed a response team and assisted the Indonesian National Police with the immediate response and the investigation that followed. This cooperation would mean that some of those responsible for the horrific attacks would be prosecuted for their crimes. Fourteen Australian Commonwealth agencies, as well as state and territory agencies, would come together to help respond to the crisis. Non-government agencies, including St John's, the Australian Red Cross and Qantas, also provided their support. The Australian government honoured 199 individuals in 2003 for their selfless acts of bravery and dedicated service in the wake of the bombings. Two Australians were awarded the Cross of Valour, our highest civilian honour. Senior Constable Timothy Britton and Mr Richard Joyes, both hearing the bomb explosions, made their way to the Sari Club. And whilst unknown to each other at that time, together they repeatedly went back into the club, risking their lives to rescue the injured. In the continuing grief that we hold, it is these examples that etch into history the strong and resilient Australian spirit. This anniversary will be difficult for many. Ceremonies will be held here in our nation's capital and across our great country. Many Australians, including the families of victims, survivors and first responders, have made the pilgrimage each year back to Bali for the anniversary, and each year they are welcomed by Indonesia, as they will be this year. An emblem adorning these services each year are the arrangements of wattle and frangipani flowers, a symbolic tribute uniting two countries. Australia and Indonesia would be again bound together, unfortunately, by grief following the second Bali bombings, not three years later, in 2005. Of the 20 casualties, four Australians lost their lives. The Bali Memorial Package, established in early 2003 and concluding in 2008, honoured those Australians who died. During its effective phase, the package strengthened health services in Bali, including provisions for Bali's main teaching hospital, the creation of the Australian Bali Memorial Eye Centre and multiple medical scholarship packages here in Australia. And as our relationship has continued to deepen with Indonesia, so has our cooperation since 2002 with a range of strategic, security, defence and economic partnerships, and most recently, in 2021, the renewal of our counter-terrorism memorandum of understanding. Our relationship with Indonesia is one of great importance. It defies those who sought to cause long-lasting chaos on that day, and our ties remain strong. As a consequence of these attacks and others, which we see all too often around the world, we do live in a very different world today. We acknowledge and we give thanks to our police, our security agencies and our defence forces. They work every single day to keep Australians safe. 
Today, in the Senate, in recognition of the 20th anniversary, let us remember the 202 souls, including the 88 Australians, who lost their lives in the Bali bombings on the 12th of October 2002, and those who still bear the scars of that night. Let our thoughts be with them and their families, for they will never forget, and neither should we. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. And I firstly acknowledge uh, the Indonesian ambassador and his counterparts um, and welcome you to the chamber with our um, heartfelt condolences. I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to support this motion, which commemorates and remembers the 202 victims, including the 88 Australians, of the bombing of Paddy's Bar and the Sari Club in Bali. And of course, at least 200 others who were also injured by the blasts and the fires that followed. Parents farewelled their children at the airport, waving them off for their first solo holiday in Bali and never saw them again. Partners, parents, siblings, friends, teammates were lost. The tragedy involved victims from more than 20 countries and many Balinese locals. We extend our heartfelt condolences to the families of those who were lost and to those who survived. We extend our thanks to those who assisted in the immediate aftermath and those who are still supporting uh, those affected. The immediate response in the hours and days after the bombing were a reminder of how we can come together. Doctors and nurses holidaying in Bali rushed to help victims. Local firefighters, first responders, people opened up their home, homes and took the injured to find help. The tragedy of the Bali bombing was a reminder of how small and connected our world can be and of the overwhelming humanity and community that binds us together and the importance of global efforts to broker peace. Let us never forget this as we fight for a safer and better world for everyone. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And on behalf of the Nationals, I join with my parliamentary colleagues in placing on the record our heartfelt condolences to the families, friends and loved ones of the victims on this, the 20th anniversary of the Bali bombings, and also welcome His Excellency to the chamber and share our heartfelt condolences, which I'm sure he will um, reiterate uh, back to Indonesia and the Balinese community more broadly on our behalf. Bali is indeed a beautiful island, paradise, that has for decades offered a spiritual retreat and escape, especially um, for Australians. Many Australians uh, often take their first overseas holiday to Bali, and it is a mecca for families, surfers, accessible to so many uh, across Australia. It's Saturday night on the 12th of October, a warm 24 degrees, and the city centre is bustling some heading home after dinner and others heading out to start their night party. Then at 11.05 p.m., a suicide bomber detonated inside Paddy's pub in Cooter. Minutes later, another bomb detonated across the street at the Sari Club. Those explosions that night killed 202 people from 20 countries. Australia suffered the largest loss with 88 fatalities and hundreds more left wounded. We can only imagine the utter distress of losing a loved one under such horrific circumstances. And we can only imagine the ongoing distress experienced by those injured and those who witness the carnage and human suffering. This cowardly and despicable bombing has tragically affected families not only in Australia but also in Bali. This was an attack on both Australi Australians and Balinese, an attack on the Australian way of life and the Balinese way of life. In the wake of the attacks, the Australian Defence Force immediately mobilised, launching Operation Bali Assist just 17 hours after the blast. The first RAF, RAAF plane arrived to evacuate injured Australians in the largest aeromedical evacuation since the Vietnam War. At least 66 badly injured people were flown to Darwin for treatment. The military then assisted in secondary transfers of people from Darwin to medical centres around the country. Hours after the attacks, the Australian Federal Police also organised a team to go to Bali. It included disaster victim identification staff, forensic investigators, intelligence officers, administrators, security staff, IT and comms staff to assist the Indonesian National Police investigation. 
Over 10 days, AFP members also interviewed 7,000 Australians about their experiences as they returned to Australia after the attacks. The AFP was instrumental in identifying and returning victims to their families and provided extensive investigative support that led to the capture of the perpetrators. Out of the destruction of the bombings came many stories of ordinary people making extraordinary efforts to help those affected. People who were injured in the blasts stayed to assist others, and locals and foreigners went to the site to help. Tourists with medical skills worked with overwhelmed Indonesian medical staff at the bomb sites and local hospitals. Nearly 200 Australians received formal recognition for their bravery and the assistance they provided both immediately and in the following months. On the 10th anniversary of the attacks, the then former Labor minister and uh, leader, I think, of the government in this place at that time, uh, Senator Chris Evans, echoed the sentiment of many when he said, and I quote, they took many lives, but they failed in their mission. October 12, 2002 was also a day of great heroism, of selfless acts of courage, of remarkable emergency response. What was a terrible day of shared grief for Indonesia and Australia became a day of great shared resolve. Joe Frost spoke at Newcastle Sacred Heart Cathedral in a special service to acknowledge the victims of the Bali bombings and encapsulated what many Australians were feeling when he said, that bomb hit us that night and it has hit all of our community. I think those words ring true because irrespective of where we live in Australia, whether we visit Bali, whether we know anybody directly associated with the bombings as victims or as relatives, we can empathise with the ongoing hardship and distress they still experience. In these continuing uncertain times, we must be vigilant in being even more aware of our surroundings and ensure that we take every necessary measure to fight against such acts of terrorism terrorism that aim to bring down our very way of life. It is regrettable, yet a reality, that we are in the midst uh, of a war that has no boundaries, whose victims are random and the perpetrators of which are devoid of the basic decency found in most human beings. Sadly, the word Bali became synonymous uh, with this bloodshed. This tiny idyllic paradise was drawn into the maelstrom of intolerance, ignorance and hate. The irony is that Bali is a beautiful place uh, that sadly was associated with this terror. I recall watching television footage of people at the airport and one man who was interviewed said, of course I'm going to Bali. If I don't go, they will have won. Of course, this is what we must all do and we have done. Our love for the Balinese people, the country's landscape, the surf, the bintang uh, has not waned. And Bali today is one of our favoured holiday destinations. Uh, it is also a strong partnership uh, of, between the federal government of Australia uh, and the Indonesian government of strategic, economic and people-to-people -people relationships being so important. I reiterate our condolence to the victims, their families and those who still live with what they experienced on that fateful October night. Our thoughts and our prayers in the National Party are with them during these most difficult times, and we support the motion. Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. And uh, I'm going to move the motion as um, ask that the motion be agreed to, as moved by Senator Wong. And I thank His Excellency the Ambassador for coming to share with us today. Um, and we'll just stand for a moment silence. Senators. I'll take that as moving the motion. Thank you. Are there any motions to be given for another day? Is there a report from the selection of 
Thank you, uh, Senator White. Uh, President, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number four for 10 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment, Home Affairs Measures number four, Regulations 2021. And Business of the Senate notices of motion number two and three for 13 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment, Prime Minister and Cabinet's Portfolio Measures number two, Regulations 2022, and uh, the Telecommunications Fibre Ready Facilities in Real Estate Development Projects and Other Matters Instrument 2022. Thank you, Senator White. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, President. I, I present the fifth report of the 2022 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. I move that the report be adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. A postponement notification has been lodged as follows. Business of a Senate notice of motion number two in the name of Senator Orman Payne for today to the 25th of October. Uh, thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Oh, sorry, Senator Askew. But I'm not sure if it was correct. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. This is the right spot. It's said 14 on top. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Birmingham for the 28th of September 2022 for personal reasons. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are you seeking the call for any absences, Senator Urquhart? No? Okay. I was just checking. So we'll now move to the discovery of formal business. And we will move to uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Senator Rice. Thank you, President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one regarding the disallowance of a motion about the crisis payment be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rice. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr Dawes. So the question is that business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Rice, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Kim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the nose. Order. There being 13 ayes and 20 no 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So, business of the Senate number two has just been postponed. So, I go to business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of the uh, Australian Green, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. Uh, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. But the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Waters. Uh, so is there any objection to that being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We're now Senator Rice Division. Uh, yes, um, I'll just reiterate that for business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Rice, uh, that the noes have it. The noes have it. Thank you. We'll now move to government business. I've lost my place, sorry. Number one. <laughs> uh, and I call uh, Senator Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number one, proposing an amendment to Standing Order 50, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being number one. <coughs> Just a moment. To Minister Chisholm um, to uh, re put his motion. It's not aligning with my so, information. Okay, because we've moved quickly, I'll remind the Senate business of Senate business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Rice, we divided on. Business of the Senate number two was postponed. Uh, we've dealt with three, and so now we're up to government business number one. And I called um, Minister Chisholm, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Okay. 
Oh, I beg your pardon. My, my document definitely says one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Minister, please continue. So what, why don't we start again? Government business. Uh, number one, Minister. I ask that government business notice of motion number one proposing an amendment to Standing Order 50 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. I move the motion. Senator, uh, Senator Rustin. I leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Thank Rustin. Thank you. I want to take this opportunity to consider the priorities of this government. At a time when Australians across the country are dealing with the significant pressures of the cost of living crisis currently gripping Australia, as full fuel prices are going up by over 20 cents a litre and people are suffering from price hikes at the supermarket, in their power bills and in their mortgage payments, what are the priorities of this government? They are certainly not responding to these pressures, having not announced a single measure of immediate cost of living relief nor are they practising what they preach with regard to changes to the standing orders flagged by the Jenkins Review to have a more family-friendly workplace. Just last night, the Senate was forced to sit to nearly midnight. Instead, they come in here today with this motion as their priority, tinking around the edges with the first two minutes of the Senate instead of taking real action to address cost of living pressures impacting Australian families. Thank you, Senator Rustin. So the question is, the motion as moved by Minister Chisholm, standing in the name of the Minister, Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr. Dawes. So the question is, government business number one be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 30 ayes and 23 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion, a uh, government business number two, standing in the name of Senator McCarthy. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I advise that Senator Napajimpra Price will co sponsor government business notice of motion number two, proposing a reference to the Joint Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Uh, Senator, Senator McKim. I was going to seek leave to amend the motion, but I think you need to test formality first. Sorry, my apologies. So the question is: uh, uh, Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. To Senate. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, so the question is that the motion, as moved by uh, Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Move the motion, yes. Oh, the motion standing in my name and the name of Senator Nepajimpa Price. Thank you. Senator McKim. Apologies, uh, President, That's for any right. confusion there. Um, I seek leave to amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber to add paragraphs E, F and G. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the amendment as circulated and moved by Senator McKim, standing in the name of Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. So the question now is that the uh, government business number two, standing in the name of uh, Senator McCarthy and Senator Nampatinka Price, moved by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to government business number three. And I call uh, Minister Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number three be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call uh, Senator Chisholm. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. So uh, the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. I call the minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is uh, leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you.
And in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 25th of October 2022. I now move to um, government business. Uh, government business number four, standing in the name of Senator Watt, Senator Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number four be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to the, the protection of the sea and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the protection of the sea and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 25th of October 2022. We will now move to general business. I call Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the establishment of the Select Committee on the Cost of Living as a formal motion. The motion has been circulated. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hume. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion standing in the name of Senator Hume be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 47, standing in the name of Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 47, standing in my name, in the names of Senators Antich, Cadell, Colbeck, Fawcett, Member, member Pagina Price, O'Sullivan, Rennick and Van, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Canavan. I move that the following be bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. So the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Canavan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator. Uh, uh, I present the bill and move that this bill may, may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Canavan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A uh, bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Se Senator Canavan. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, I table an explanatory memorandum and seek, and I also seek leave to have the second reading of the speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Canavan. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 48, standing in the name of Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 48 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator McKim. Thanks, President. I move the motion. So the question is, oh, are you seeking leave, Senator Walsh? I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Walsh. The government will support this motion, but notes that the Senate Economics Committee has already provided an invitation for Governor Lowe to attend Senate estimates. It would have been more desirable to allow the committee to go through the usual process for inviting witnesses to appear before it, but we will work constructively with other senators on this committee and, of course, the RBA governor to arrive on the appropriate arrangements ahead of the hearing. While we are willing to work constructively with senators on this occasion, I would like to place on the record that the government does not support a new precedent where the Senate as a whole negotiates witness lists for respective committee hearings as we believe that should remain a role for individual committees to establish. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to the MPI and just wait for Senator Stoll to take the chair.
I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 29 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Hughes. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The failure of the Albanese Labor government to guarantee maintaining the Australian government's critical and job-creating infrastructure investment to secure the future prosperity and sustainability for regional and rural Australia. Is the proposal supported? Six. Thank you. Seven. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. $21 billion in federal budget funding was dedicated for regional Australia, and it is now under serious threat from Labor's budget cuts. Prior to the election, the Nationals secured this $21 billion in new funding for community facilities, health care, water infrastructure, roads and highways, education and training, securing tens of thousands of regional jobs. But now, when Labor needs to pay for its excessive promises, the first place they look is to the regions to rip money out under the guise of saying it is wasteful spending. The regions are not wasteful. But we've seen this playbook before, with Prime Minister Albanese having already developed a proven formula for cutting funding from regional Australia. The first thing they do is claim the coalition is rorting projects to favour regional communities. Well, regional funding should go to regional communities. Then they introduce Labor's own program to pay for their pre-election pork barrelling of key marginal Labor seats, while claiming new rules will be introduced. And then, when they've been in government for a year or two, they ignore the rules altogether. In fact, when he was infrastructure minister in the Rudd government, Mr Albanese cut funding to vital projects in communities in coalition-held seats, claiming the funding was nothing but pork barrelling. He then replaced the program with a Labor program called the Better Regions program, which saw 90 per cent of its regional funding spent on Labor seats. Fast forward to 2010, and a damning ANAO report found the then Infrastructure Minister Albanese had failed his own guidelines in dishing out $550 million via the Regional and Local Community Infrastructure Program. As was reported at the time, the ANAO found that projects in coalition-held seats were twice as likely to miss out on funding. Only 18 per cent of applications for funding in coalition-held seats were approved, compared to 42 per cent of applications for funding in ALP-held electorates. And in safe coalition seats, that rate was just over 10 per cent. At the time, Tom Ducevic, the national chief reporter for The Australian, wrote, Anthony Albanese has the gap-toothed charm of a shire president, a hands-on approach and a God-given talent for reading an electoral map. He went further to state, and I quote, the Auditor General's report on the 550 million strategic projects part of the Regional and Local Community Infrastructure Program released yesterday provides an overwhelming proof that Labor has lost its virginity and so has Albo in the time-honoured art of pork barrelling." But apparently when the coalition uh, makes sure regional funding goes to regional areas, we're accused of pork bar barrelling, but we say it's delivering. By 2012, the Auditor-General was reporting details of over 33 cases 
over a two-year period in which Labor ministers, including the now Prime Minister, had violated their own anti-pork barrelling rules. Mr Albanese, when he was Transport Minister, approved three Roads to Recovery grants in his own inner city electorate of Graindler without notifying the Finance Minister, as was required. The then Environment Minister, Tony Burke, failed to report an almost $500,000 landcare grant in his inner Sydney electorate of Watson. We've heard from those opposite time and time again that they are pure. Yet, as the Financial Review reported earlier this year, Labor was facing accusations of hypocrisy after making an estimated $750 million in grant promises to their marginal seats despite years of attacking the coalition for doing so. I call on this government to ensure that $21 billion in regional funding goes to the regions. Well, thank you, but there are no other speakers I can see in the room. Senator Chandler. Mr Acting Deputy President, it is such a pleasure to be standing here today talking about the failure of the Albanese Labor government to uh, invest in the critical infrastructure to ensure the future prosperity and sustainability of regional and Sorry, rural I Australia. Sorry, Senator Chandler, you're not on my speakers list. Can you just let me know whose place you may have taken uh, for the timing arrangements? I'm I will, say, I will say Senator MacDonald, uh, Senator MacDonald? Act, Mr Acting Deputy okay, President. Mate, I don't you. think it matters either way because we're all on 10 minutes. But No, we're not all on 10 minutes. Oh, but, sorry. But well, uh, I now know you are. We'll yeah. say Senator okay. MacDonald. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, as, as I was saying, an absolute pleasure to be standing here today talking about the failure of the Albanese Labor government to guarantee maintaining the government's critical job-creating infrastructure investment to secure the future prosperity and sustainability for regional and rural Australia. And, Mr Acting Deputy President, this is a cause that is very close to my heart, coming from the beautiful state of Tasmania, where uh, over the last decade or so we have seen great improvements uh, in the outcomes for Tasmanians uh, due to the strong work of the uh, previous federal coalition government and the prior and the uh, state Tasmanian Liberal government, and we know that over the last few months, the Albanese Labor government uh, made many promises to our Tasmanians as to what would be delivered during the election. Uh, and I am certainly looking forward to see whether or not those commitments are maintained, because we know, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that. Uh, that we have many uh, election commitments that are currently under review. The government has made quite a big deal of, uh, on the one hand, spending the months in the lead up to the election uh, talking to local stakeholders, making commitments about projects that would be funded uh, in the lead up to the election, and then as soon as that was won and done for them, uh, now saying, well, all of our commitments are under review. All of our commitments will be reconsidered as part of the budget process, and I think it is only fair uh, that many, many Tasmanians and many Australians are asking the very genuine question of whether or not uh, they should, whether or not uh, the Albanese Labor government is going to uh, continue to make those commitments and is going to maintain those commitments to regional and rural Tasmania and regional and rural Australia into the future. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and um, I thank Senator uh, Chandler uh, for her contribution because it enables me to follow on and remind Senator Chandler and the Chamber exactly what was the environment we entered into in the, the election campaign. On one hand, we had a government led by Mr Morrison which was riven with waste, rorts and lost, op and lost opportunities. This is, what, this is what we—this was the environment that 
was led into the election campaign. And on the 21st of March, people, people responded by electing an Albanese Labor government and rejecting the rorts of the Liberal and Coalition parties. That's, that's exactly what happened. And it, it really is galling that you come in here with an MPI with, without, without any, without any, any attempt, without any attempt to acknowledge what it was actually, what was actually happening, what was actually happening in the region. In July, in July, now Senator Mackenzie, who's normally very polite and sits and and and. and Abides by these standing orders and sits politely by, but has got really fired up now because she doesn't like to be reminded. She, Mr. Acting Deputy President, President, she does not like to be reminded how they shafted rural and regional Australia. That's exactly. That's exactly. Look, you can argue all you like, but let's. Let, I want to go back. I want to go back, not too far back, because. This is a new government, a new government leading up to their very first, very first uh, Albanese uh, Labor budget in October, which I'm looking forward to immensely, del delivering on our election commitments. But back in July of this year, on the 28th of July of this year, and Senator Mackenzie and uh, other senators in this chamber will probably know that. That was the day that the Australian National Audit Office issued a scathing report into the coalition's management of the 1.15 billion Building Better Regions Fund. Scathing report, and I just want to take this opportunity because, obviously, on presentation of this MPI, it appears the coalition had forgotten their period in government, or they're trying to whitewash the history. But it's not going to wash out in the community, not out in the regions, not in, out in rural Australia, because they remember the rorts and the waste and the lost opportunity. No strategy, no strategy for these regions, just pork barrow, pork barrowing, and that isn't. And that is not that is that is not delivering. I just really cannot believe. I, I really cannot believe um, the senator Senator Mackenzie believes that throwing in a bit of pork every three years it makes up for not having an actual strategy for region and rural Australia. This is this is what they're putting forward now. I mean seriously. Now I know. They might not want to be reminded, but these are the actual facts. I know, and I know facts is not, not the, they're not something that rates highly on the other side. But I'm I'm going to actually remind uh, people of a media release that the minister, the now minister Catherine King, put out when 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 she, when we talked out when. The ANAO report was released on the 28th of July in 2020, 2022 about the Better Regions, uh, Building Better Regions Fund. Now I'm going to have to take back my remarks about Senator Mackenzie being normally well behaved because she's just just proven me wrong, and I just it's it's a it's a terrible terrible day. So this is what actually I want to remind the coalition, the chamber, and of course those that are listening in to this debate. Over five rounds of the program, 65 per cent of infrastructure grants went to projects that were not assessed as having the most merit. Not a 65 per cent. Former coalition ministers made decisions on the basis of choose your own adventure criteria that weren't fully explained to those applying for grants. They did not keep proper records of decisions. Unheard of. I mean, seriously. 
The audit office also found that seats held by the Nationals benefited most from the decisions to ignore the merit list, which I find highly um, interesting given, of course, it, then, well, I, well, you had a national senator that you um, loaded up his pork and went roaming around. Okay. All right. That's what happened. We're talking about we are talking about grants without merits. Those that those those that they audit, not me. Order. This is not. This is not. All right, the, Senator this Brown. Is not, excuse me, Senator Brown, please. I'm getting sick of saying this. But I'm very, very lenient. But when there's three of you who don't actually whisper, it starts becoming annoying. Can I ask that Senator Brown be heard in silence? Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As I was going to remind uh, the senators this here and listening to the debate, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Labor Party is saying. The Audit Office found that seats held by the Nationals benefit, benefit most from the decision to ignore the merit list. It's the Audit Office that's saying this. Not, it's not me. It's not the Labor Party. It's not the government. We're, I'm here reminding you, when, as you attempt to um, this whitewash of a, a MPI that you're putting up here Today, because I do welcome the opportunity uh, to contribute to the, the debate and ensure uh, the Senate that this government is committed to developing Australia's, re Australia's regions. And, and unlike those opposite, the government is also committed to transparency and integrity when it comes to, to spending public funds. And as I've already indicated, you, you don't have to go any further than the Auditor General's report from July 28 of this year on the Building Better Regions um, program. So, you know, my concern, of course, has always been that um, as the Nationals, and particularly the National Party, talk around about being those that are representing the bush, that all they do is to they bring out the pork at once every three years, and they, there's no real strategy or vision for the regions or the bush, not at all. And no, no matter how often they try to um, rewrite history, it's not going to wash in this chamber because everyone knows exactly what was happening. Everyone knows. And on the 21st of May. This year, the, the, it, on the 21st of May this year, people have had enough of it. They've had enough of it. So, so we, what we do know that as we um, we we've seen that decisions um, decisions were ignored. Um, that, you know, we had the famous ministerial panel that made the final funding decisions. Obviously relied solely on those mysterious other factors when making their decisions you know it it was a disgrace it is a disgrace shoddy processes like this can only mislead our regional communities and the hard working volunteers who apply, apply for funding that is why this government uh, has has and will be reviewing all programs and commitments made by the previous government so uh, we've said that before, and um, and that is what we'll, we will be doing. Of course, all of our regional communities deserve better when it comes to infrastructure, but that infrastructure must meet local community needs and be delivered in a sustainable way. That is why all funding decisions made by this government will be transparent and will take into consideration needs of regional communities. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to Senator Hughes's matter of public importance on the need for infrastructure in rural and regional Australia. I welcome this discussion and agree that rural infrastructure is a pressing need. So I ask, what the hell did Senator Hughes's party do about infrastructure over the last 10 years? 
I'll save the public looking up at that. Nothing. In, the, in fact, the last 10 years have been counterproductive. Inland rail has been so poorly handled that only a few kilometres of track have been built. The Liberals and Nationals insisted on bringing inland rail into the city of Brisbane instead of the regional centre of Gladstone Port, a much more logical destination. In the process, inland rail will traverse the Condamine floodplain. In the recent rains, Milmerin would have been flooded as a result of the inland rail embankment, damming the floodplain. Recent rains have issued their warning, and the Albanese government must change the route of inland rail, sending it north to Gladstone. Recent How many major dams did the Morrison government build? None. The NBN rollout was a disaster, and many locations across rural Australia have an internet connection that can only can be described as a joke. So I agree. Now is the time to get going on infrastructure. Growing our economy and putting the excess liquidity introduced during reckless COVID mismanagement to good use in building productive infrastructure is a solution to inflation. Productive capacity will restore our economy to an even keel and guarantee our economic and national security moving forward. It will increase our country's productive capacity. One Nation are committed to rebuilding this country, literally. I have already succeeded in bringing Project Iron Boomerang before the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee for a significant inquiry. Project Iron Boomerang is an exciting and visionary project that consists of a 3,300-kilometre railway and multi-purpose easement across the top end. The route does not pass through any national parks and can be privately funded, such as the interest overseas and in Australia in the project. The name comes from how the railway will be used, bringing Western Australian iron ore across to Queensland's coal, where steel parks will turn those into quality Australian steel for domestic and export markets. Trains will then return carrying Queensland coal to steel parks in Western Australia, producing more steel for export. Boomerang. The, real lane, the, real, the rail line will open up rare earth deposits that are currently stranded assets without the power to mine and the transport to bring to market. Rare earths are key ingredients in wind turbines, battery storage and most modern electronics, including phones and computers. Australia must take its place in producing these minerals using well-paid workers and not the child and slave labour currently featuring strongly in world supply chains. World steel demand is expected to increase at 2 to 3 per cent growth over the next 30 years as the emerging economies of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh replace falling demand from the USA and Europe. Project Iron Boomerang will reduce long supply chains on iron ore and coal exports with much shorter supply chains. Pro iron Boomerang will use electric gas-powered locomotives. Large ore-carrying ships burn 10,000 litres of oil per hour. For those pushing 2050 net zero economic insanity, the reduction in taking ships off the water will be significant in cutting carbon dioxide from human activity. Every tonne of steel made in Australia will take the world closer to the UN's unfounded 2050 net zero target that Labor, Greens and the Liberal Nationals slavishly adopt. And there will be a lot of steel, high quality steel. East-West line parks have, been, have received formal expressions of interest from some of the world's largest steel manufacturers to locate steel mills in the vicinity of Murrumbah in Queensland and in the Pilbara, Pilbara of Western Australia. Ten steel mills are anticipated producing 88,000 tonnes of high-quality steel and creating 40,000 breadwinner jobs for Australians. If that sounds optimistic, understand the world steel market is currently worth $1.3 US trillion. Australia has just 46, sorry, Australia has just 6 per cent of that. Iron Boomerang will make Australian steel cheaper than market leader China and higher quality. The attraction to labour should be clear. A huge increase in Australian steel production will save the jobs of union coal miners that the Albanese government threatens in Labor's sell-out to green ideology. The multi-purpose corridor I mentioned earlier will carry water from Lake Argyle and Hellsgate through the corridor, along with internet and power cables. This will allow for the provision of water, power and internet to hundreds of remote communities across the top end. Lifting up the lives of those mostly Aboriginal communities in a way that a hundred years of shallow, patronising federal government policy never has. That's the power of infrastructure, and I thank Senator Hughes for her excellent motion. Thank you, Senator, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And as the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development and the leader of the National Party in this chamber, it gives me great pleasure 
to stand and contribute to this debate today. The fact that the only place the newly elected Labor government is looking for budget savings, the only area in the budget that they have flagged themselves, and you heard whether it's the finance minister in this chamber, whether it's the treasurer in the other chamber, whether indeed it's the minister who is tasked with the responsibility to develop regional Australia. They have all said every program, every project is having the red line run over it. And I'm very proud to have been part of a government that backed the ambition of regional Australia, that backed our industry, that didn't think the nine million of us that don't live in capital cities means that you don't get to go to a great school or that you don't get access to quality health care. Because that is actually the reality out in the regions. And that's why the programs that the Labor Party and Senator Brown was starting on the you know, rhetoric there today are wasteful. Spending money in the regions is wasteful. Spending in the money in the regions is all politically motivated for the National Party. Well, come out to Dubbo, mm -hmm. come out to Orbost, Mildura, yeah. come out to Wyala, come out to Geraldton, come out to Cloncurry, thank you, Senator Macdonald, and have a conversation with these communities who expect, as citizens who work hard and pay their taxes, why they can't get a doctor why their kids shouldn't have access to a high-quality education and why their roads are crumbling and why their economies aren't diversifying. And that is what these programs and projects have been focused on for over 10 years. And we are very, very proud to have additionally been able to secure $21 more billion in the March budget of new money into rural and regional Australia because, as our nation embarks, are on a tra trajectory to net zero by 2050, guess what? It's not going to be a win for all. Some communities are going to be more significantly impacted than others. And so the Labor Party signed us up to a more ambitious target. You won the election, tiggity-boo. Where is the commensurate commitment to fund rural and regional communities' ability to seize the opportunities that you tell us are coming? and also to overcome the challenges uh, that are coming their way. I completely reject any notion that funding a cancer centre in Dubbo is a waste, because that's what you're telling us. I completely reject that funding the La Trobe University's uh, joint venture with Goulburn Valley Health in my own home yeah. state, um, in yeah. Shepparton, yeah. is a waste. The only way you're going to get doctors out into country towns and regional centres is to actually train country kids in country communities because you know what? They want to practice in the country. We know it works because that's what the research over a long period of time has told us. So instead of trying to force people who don't want to be in the country out, we have focused on building facilities and partnering with local health care uh, providers to train people locally. So the very programs that the Labor Party wants to slash, the very projects that they are that Jim Chalmers right now is running his red pen through, are the very projects that will underpin not just the economic future of rural and regional Australia, but our social um, our social infrastructure. The things that should be about equity in a country as rich as Australia. It should not matter where you live in a country as wealthy as ours, uh, of your education attainment, of your health outcomes, of what your median income level is. But you know what? The sad fact is it does matter. And the real reason the Labor Party is framing this budget up that investing in rural and regional Australia means waste or that somehow it's politically motivated is so they can actually slash funding in the upcoming budget to our hospitals, our schools, our sporting fields, the facilities that you all take for granted in your capital cities are facilities that we desperately need. And the reason 
that, this, that the National Party fights so hard within successful coalition governments is because it is about need. They, all of these programs, whether it's the Building Better Regions program, the Roads to Recovery program, the Bridges Renewal program that you want to cut, are so oversubscribed. Not because rural and regional Australia uh, you know, thinks it deserves more than its fair share, it does. but because there is such a need out there. And there is a reason why you didn't win the seat of Braddon, Senator Brown. It's because Braddon knows the best way for them to secure a better future for their families. Into the, you know, over coming decades is to vote for Gavin Pearce, a Liberal member uh, of Braddon. No yeah. National Party there. The, the reason why people in Gippsland vote for Darren Chester, why people in Calais vote for Andrew G, why people in Gladstone vote uh, for Cole Boyce, why they vote for the Liberal Party in Western Australian seats, why they vote for Rowan Ramsey and Tony Passon in regional South Australia is because they know the first thing you do when you come to power is you look to cut funding to nearly nine million Australians because it's an easy hit. You'll never lose a vote from it. And you come in here and you champion that you are the party for all Australians, that you are the party for working Australians. Well, you're not. Because if you were, you would absolutely back not, not slashing one dollar from the regions, that you would back their ambition and plans to grow, that they, their children deserve a prosperous and sustainable future just as much as your kids do. So we will not stop being offended by your ambition to cut the programs and projects that we have fought so hard uh, to actually have handed down in the budget. I want to also address um, some of Senator Brown's contributions uh, around the politicisation of funding to rural and regional Australia. And it, when we look back on ANAO reports, there's one that stands out for me, and it's one uh, centred on the last time the Labor Party was in government. And there was a senior infrastructure minister uh, called Anthony Albanese. And his junior minister for regional development, Minister Catherine King. Oh, there's some familiar names there, isn't there? That was a scathing report. The figures Senator Brown uh, quoted go nothing to what this team did. They redefined what a region was. It's not a country town of 20,000 people. It's not Wangaratta, Benalla. Uh, you know, it's not Cairns. It's Perth, Senator Giacconi. Your party defines Perth as a, as a regional centre and so therefore gives uh, funding programs under regional development to Perth. But what I think was more uh, scathing was that this minister ignored 80 per cent of the recommended projects from the Department of Infrastructure. So to be lectured on uh, politicisation of funding by the Labor Party, honestly, Thank goodness, thank goodness, where, thank Order goodness they have uh, got senators. the uh, independent. Senator, yeah, on, hey, all money expended on projects eligible for funding, absolutely every single one. Not like Catherine King. I'm happy to send you a copy, Senator Chisholm, and, and of the report. Like and so, thankfully, we do have an ICAC Senator now. Senator Mackenzie, sorry, I just chair. remind you to make your remarks through the chair. To the chair. To the chair. To the chair. to the chair. Well, thank you. It's great to see you, Chair. Um, so, thank you. We are offended and dismayed by this government's decision to turn their backs on rural and regional Australia. The nine million of us that live outside of capital cities deserve your focus. We provide the ballast economically for this country. And if you believe of inequality of opportunity, then you have to believe that country kids deserve a quality education at a public school. They deserve to be able to access health care just like everybody in the city. And that means guaranteeing no cuts to rural and regional Australia in Jim Chalmers' budget. 
you. Thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie. Call Senator Polly. Yes, Madam Acting Deputy President, nice to see you in the chair. But let's put on the record the facts in relation to investment in regional Australia. After 10 very long years, for Senator McKenzie, through you, Madam Deputy President, coming into this chamber rewriting history. And the fact that they have denied the Australian community, particularly those living in regional uh, Australia, opportunities because of the rotting that they did while they were in government. And for the former minister herself to come into this chamber and try and rewrite history, what, what we have in the new Albanese Labor government is a Prime Minister who understands, along with every member of our House of Representatives and in this chamber, understand the importance of regional Australia and what it means to the Australian economy. And for the Prime Minister, who has been in the past a brilliant infrastructure minister, he knows the value of investing. But what we will always do, and that is making sure that all funding is accountable, will be transparent, and it will be delivered to regional Australia and the communities that need it most. It will not be delivered for the target seats that those opposite were trying to save so they could stay in government, because they do not respect they do not respect the Australian taxpayer because when they were in government for the last 10 years, all they ever did was ensure that they would hold their seats to keep themselves in the big white limousines. That's what they did because if there was a real commitment from Senator McKenzie and others on that side, they would not have been rotting the system. They would not have been promising and making commitments to car parks at train stations where there was none. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have spent in excess of $50 million that they didn't need to spend in acquiring land in New South Wales in relation to the airport there. So there is going to be a stark difference between how we, as a government under Anthony Albanese, will handle and use taxpayers' money, because we don't consider it is our money, unlike the Liberal Nationals when they were in government, we um, will Senator, actually Senator deliver. Polly, sorry to interrupt you. Can you resume your seat for a moment? Thank you. So I'm, I'm loath to interrupt the debate, but there is a constant uh, calling out from the members of the opposition. It would be much more orderly and in accordance with the Senate standing orders for you to resist from calling out across the chamber. I ask you to give respect to a fellow senator uh, as she makes her points in this uh, robust democracy that we exist in. Senator Polly, you have the call. Thank you very much. As I was saying, the Albanese Labor government will always ensure that there is integrity, transparency and accountability in all funding across this country, but even more so. We will invest in regional Australia because we know how important it is. It isn't, you know, it isn't going to just pass by when you have senators from that side come in and want to talk about health care for regional Australians or education when they did nothing but cut health care. We know how much they dislike Medicare. We know how critical our hospital infrastructure is into regional Australia. We also know, and I know only too well, the ambulances are ramping at every hospital around this country because of the lack of funding from the previous government. But I just want to remind people, because this is really important, coming from Tasmania, as a senator for Tasmania, we invested during the federal campaign, we made commitments to invest in jobs in regional areas. So in May, what we did, we made a commitment to Northern Tasmania for Firmus Tas, great new initiative. Line Hydrogen, we invested $5 million for them to start their project up, be off because we actually care about delivering better outcomes for Northern Tasmanians. Waverley Woolen Mill, we've made a commitment so we can start manufacturing. And I'm sure my two fellow Tasmanian Liberal senators for Tasmania would support our funding to all of those businesses in Tasmania. A very old woolen mill that is now doing 
some amazing work and developing uh, future projects for themselves to ensure that they have a business model that is going to take them forward and they're getting into recycling and all sorts of wonderful things, creating real jobs in northern Tasmania. Now, we did that and I'd be very surprised if those uh, fundings aren't part of the uh, budget that will be announced in October. But there's a difference between coming into this place and defending your old policies when you had policies, because you don't have policies now, and coming in here and trying to rewrite history. Very different. Thank you, Very Senator Polly. I'll call Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. I am so glad to add my voice to this uh, matter of importance. And I'll add to the echo that's in the chamber of, wow, he's coming from the opposite side. Uh, and what I've seen in my time, short time being here, because what I saw at the last election was reveal the Australian public actually want to end this system and is currently enabling grant programs in this country that were co-opted by politicians for pork barrelling. And for many, many years it's been talked about right here in this chamber. Further, I think the Australian public got sick of a government that had a complete mismatch of policy objectives with no real outcomes. Fixing a pothole, pipeline, upgrading a building that's no longer fit for purpose might be huge media moments over there, um, senators. And you know you can cut a red ribbon Senate and you can talk order, about investing. Order, Senator. I would ask all senators in the chamber to show some respect, please. Senator, you have the call. Thank you. But investing in public infrastructure is vital to Australians. These investments can have real and tangible impacts for the lives of Australians. But it's also important to note that the new projects are in fact a symptom of state capture. The approach of keeping their mates in business and lining their pockets rather than maintaining and upgrading the current infrastructure has left us in this current situation, meaning our rural and regional areas are the most marginalised. Hospitals and rural Sorry, President. Uh, look, uh, senators, <laughs> I think in terms of we've over the, this week Doesn't alone, mean you need to heckle, well, Bridget. I have to remind Senator, would you mind resuming Seriously. your seat? Thank you. Senators, I have asked and I expect that each senator is going to have the opportunity to make their contribution and be heard in silence. Thank you, Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, we, we note that hospitals in rural and regional areas don't have enough funding to repair and upgrade their facilities, and there's been a constant backlog of highway re uh, repairs uh, needed, and there's little or no investment to upgrade our rail network, not to mention the infrastructure for the transition of electric vehicles. However, under the previous government, billions of dollars was invested into infrastructure projects related to fossil fuels. Over a billion dollars was committed to the Beedaloo along both uh, direct and indirect funding. And the indirect investments included $173.6 million for the NT gas industry road upgrade, $300 million for low emissions uh, LNG, and clean hydrogen production at Darwin and carbon capture and storage infrastructure, and $1.5 billion for a new port infrastructure at the Middle Arm Harbour, which we heard about today during question time. All of this investment, while First Nations communities in the Northern Territory in particular have entire families living in one room. So rural and regional communities who need health facilities, education and roads are being taken for a ride. But once again, the major parties are propping up the fossil fuel industry in this place at the expense of everybody else. Once again, the major parties are doing the dirty work of those fossil fuel companies so they can keep raking in millions of dollars of donations. These companies don't need the money. They are making record-breaking profits and they are not paying any taxes on them. So yes, I agree, infrastructure is important and we need to invest in it, but we need investment into regional and rural Australia that is linked to and led by Australian communities that includes an independent assessment of the applications with clear and transparent criteria in their decision-making processes. This government and previous governments are continuing to support the fossil fuel industry that is destroying our planet and funneling public money through these infrastructure projects to pave the way for them to keep going and, worse still, to have those assets abandoned. We need to transition to renewable energy and we need to do it now. The good news is, is that this is already starting to happen and we are seeing the global pressure from our markets for fossil fuel 
uh, fossil fuels that is drying up. So why does the government keep spending more money in building new infrastructure for these projects, especially when the science has told us that we can't open up any more new coal and gas mines or, expand the, or extend the life of the existing ones? This continued investment is propping up a dying industry which will only benefit the executives of this com these companies whilst throwing workers and communities under the bus. They will continue to extract dirty fossil fuels as long as they can, long after the supply chain is gone and no longer profitable. My colleague, Senator Penny Ormond-Payne, has a bill which will establish the National Energy Transition Authority to guide Australia's shift into, in, to an economic um, powered by, sorry, an economy powered by rel reliable, secure and low-cost renewable energy. This can only be done by working with communities, workers, unions, industry and government all level, at all levels to create jobs and to open up those new export markets. The climate crisis is here and there is no doubt, but our infrastructure is no longer fit for purpose, and some of it was not fit for purpose to begin with. We need to make sure that we are making the investment in the right place. Thank you, Senator Cox. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to start with an apology to those opposite, because I'll be mentioning places in my speech today that they've never heard of. There are places where the coalition spent many millions of dollars to deliver life-changing projects that reflect the importance of those places away from the big football stadiums, cross-river rails and eight-lane highways. Places where $3 million can build a new grandstand at the local football club and transform the entire district for generations. Madam Acting Deputy President, without viable regional communities, Australia stops. Without consistent and significant funding of roads and community infrastructure, regional Australia does it a whole lot tougher. The Coalition understands this. The National Party understands this. But for those who really need to understand it, the Labor government, they're happy for regional Australia to fend for itself. Oh, but of course, they still want all the goodies the regions produce, all that tax and royalties from mining, all that healthy trade surplus and GDP boost from agriculture. Currently, the resources sector as a whole supports over 1.1 million direct and indirect jobs within Australia, contributing over $32.6 billion in direct salaries in 2021. The government has even acknowledged that the resources sector is to thank for a $50 billion budget boost this year. The Australian oil and gas industry directly and indirectly supports over 80,000 jobs, contributed over $5.35 billion in tax in 2019-20 and recorded a $15.9 billion surplus in the trade of oil and gas. And over the past decade, the oil and gas industry paid more than $64.4 billion to the government, with contributions spanning decades, totalling $161 billion since the mid-1980s. That is a lot of roads, hospitals, schools, ordinary taxpayers didn't have to fund. Let's not forget that mine workers earn about twice the national average wage, and their taxes also flow into Canberra's coffers. Agriculture is worth $71 billion a year to the Australian economy, almost exclusively generated in the regions. And both of these industries support entire towns by providing employment. And when you look at these staggering figures, it's hard to believe any government would consider cutting the artery to the beating heart of its economy. But that's what Labor is proposing. They had an election promise to scrap the Community Development Grants Program, a scheme responsible for, for completing Charleston Dam near Forsyth in far north Queensland, which I opened this year. This dam has opened up the area to tourism at unheard of levels and provided to water security for the agricultural district. Then I can point to Tully also in far north Queensland. And under the Community Development Program, the town received $3 million for a new grandstand at the Rugby League ground. This grandstand now allows Tully to host high standard league matches, uh, as well as tossing the golden gumboot, and allows it to host large conferences and events. Let's also not forget the $1.5 million to dredge an important waterway at Cardwell in North Queensland. This is just a snapshot of my home region not a National Party seat either, can I mention, and similar stories of relatively small funding making a massive difference to, that can be found around the country. 
and in comparison to the money generated in regional Australia, these are truly paltry amounts, and yet they represent so much more than just numbers on a balance sheet. Now, Labor likes to describe this investment as pork barrelling, but try explaining that to a country netball club that finally got a roof over its court or a town that can now boast that its roads are fully sealed. The Prime Minister said recently, and I quote, we will fund projects, including in regional Australia, that stack up, that represent good investment for taxpayers, he said. And if you apply a return on investment standard for funding for regional areas, nothing will ever get approved under this government. A bureaucrat will say there's just not enough population to justify widening a road at Bullia or a new town hall at Kununurra, which is exactly why the coalition viewed funding arrangements through a prism of community benefits. And it's not just the mining projects facing Labor's acts. We also read that the $5 billion inland rail extension to Gladstone is likely to be axed. What an appalling signal to send regional Queenslanders who committed the cardinal sin of not voting Labor at the last election. Labor's attitude to the regions threatened to widen the divide between city and country, between the haves and have-nots. And if you live in the city, Labor will spend billions to make sure you can get to work five minutes earlier. But if you need a new hall for the CWA ladies in your, new ta in your small town, you better start selling raffle tickets. 8.8 .8 million people live in regional Australia, and they're not asking for special treatment. They're simply asking for a level playing field. Labor says funding for the regions is pork barrelling and waste. We say it's delivery. Delivering for the families, the men and the women, the Indigenous communities that deliver the food and fibre and the mining that feeds, clothes and enriches all of Australia. So on behalf of the Bullias, the Tullys, the Catherines, the Huendans and the Kununaras, I'm asking Labor to view funding for regional Australia as among the most important duties you can undertake. We need to keep the regions attractive to young families by providing good inter internet, safe roads, great health and aged care and excellent schools. This will have the added effect of reducing urban congestion and easing pressure on city infrastructure. Spending money in regional Australia is not a cost. It's an investment, and I would ask the government to remember this at budget time, because it is these towns, these people, who without this appropriate inf infrastructure investment in social services, in infrastructure, roads, schools, hospitals, uh, internet connectivity, without that, we will force people to be FIFO workers, to live on the coast and to fly out to these communities. And we know what the result of that is. The result is divorce. It's broken families. It's high mental health. Because in the regions, you can have a great lifestyle. You can have a fantastic community. Families can go home and play sport. They can be involved with their, with their children's lives. They can volunteer at the local race club. They can be an important part of the community where people know their names. But instead, if it was left up to these centralised governments, people would live more and more on the coast, going away from these great communities and leaving all of these important industries to be FIFO industries. That's not the Australian way to do it. We didn't grow up. We didn't raise our culture. We, didn't, uh, we don't look back on our history as being that's a whole country of people who just appear on Monday morning and fly out on Friday night. That doesn't build the pubs and the, the community halls and the dances and the races and the um, great jobs that you can have. More responsibility at a younger age, really rewarding product productive jobs. And for Indigenous communities, particularly in the north of Australia, but right across, without the investment in roads that are all weather, that mean that they're not cut off for five months of the year, that means that they can access modern culture, that they can engage in genuine jobs, that they're not all forced to be rangers, that they can have other jobs. That's what we're denying people when we stop these investments in regional and rural Australia. 
And so when people call funding into regional Australia, funding that is best understood by the men and women who represent those communities, who come from those places, and who, yes, darn it, who make decisions. Who make decisions, who tell the bureaucrats, great, here's a list of projects that you've approved as all being eligible, but we're going to pick this one because we know they don't have the best grant writer in all of Australia. We know that they don't have thousands of people to support these projects and sign petitions and glue themselves to the street. What we have is we have local members who go into bat for the little towns and the little communities who do the jobs who support these communities, who give young people great lifestyles, who give us the culture that we like to celebrate when we talk about being Australian. So every time you hear Labor say pork barrelling, in your head you can say cutting us off at the knees, turning us into a nation of FIFO workers with mental health problems, with divorce and without the great lifestyles that they are being denied in rural and regional Australia. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Senator Cardell. Thank you, uh, Madam Ac Deputy President. Regional infrastructure is so important. It is the projects that go into small towns and regions that get jobs, get people moving in, start rebuilding economies after the move to the cities. I spoke in my maiden speech in this place about the fact that we are hampered in regions because the cost-benefit ratios measure benefit, economic benefit, not need. When they put thousands of people saving five minutes on the way to work in a city over dozens of people being able to be safe, drive safely down a road, it is wrong. That's right. When we sit there and we think of regional towns, the, trend, the jobs they've lost over the cutbacks and, and the displacement over some time, it is investments like these that get people coming back. When they come back, the whole town grows because we've seen the money drain from the regions. We've seen uh, deals done where suddenly farmers have to deal with wars and coals and they lose money from the farm so they lie off a farm hand. And suddenly the, the farm isn't expensive so the bank closes. That takes a few tellers away and takes the bank manager away so the school is no longer viable, we lose the school. Everything we can do to put money back into these regions multiplies and makes regions better. During COVID, we saw a, a migration of people from the cities to the regions. We saw them going to where they could have a life, going where their kids could have a future, going where they could have lifestyle. And that's despite being down on the services that are normally offered in cities. Madam Deputy President, when those other across the road say, here we are, we are pork barrelling, we are funding our seats, it's not new, it's not pork barrelling. Sometimes you know things, sometimes you know people, sometimes you know projects. Senator Macdonald spoke uh, just previously about good grant writers. There is an industry in grant writing where they get commissions on getting things through, even if the project is not up to standard in reality. They can make the good appear brilliant, they can make the bad appear good. And they overrun true projects funded by true local champions that will make a difference in communities. And Doing that, having members that stand up and say, this is important to my people, this is important to my town, is not new. I'd like to quote from the ANAO, ANAO's report into the last Labor government. And I quote, in one instance, ministers, in brackets Albanese, made an explicit decision to approve an application that was known to be otherwise ineligible under the guidelines. I quote again. In one instance, ministers, in brackets Albanese, explicitly decided to waive the project eligibility criteria for an application they wished to fund. This is Senator, not— Senator, I will remind you to use people's correct title from the other place. In a quote, it was uh, required you. from Albanese. Sorry, ma'am. So these things happen. It is not new. It is not us reinventing the wheel. It is what happens when people stand up and see projects and no, I'm not going to have a go at the now Prime Minister for this. Maybe he knew something that the grant writers didn't. Maybe he knew something that the things, because cost-benefit ratios don't know the project. If I go to, and they talk about national party seats, there was a, a program, a big program, not just a little program, it's a big program. If we're talking about transitioning our economy, about diversifying our economy in regions that are energy and carbon dependent. Significant funds were set aside under the previous government to assist communities to do that. 
I come from the Hunter Valley. I worked at the world's largest coal port. There was an allocation of $250 million under a regional transition program to assist the port to diversify. It is gone. The future of kids in the Hunter is gone. You are taking that opportunity away from them. You are taking a chance of life, a better life, away from them. It's in a Labor seat. As long as Newcastle is there, it will vote Labor. But what do we get? We get $500 million for a high-speed rail. What are we talking about? Almost a, a study, not even a project, on the basis, and I do quote the Prime Minister, to allow the people from the Hunter to get to Sydney. The people of the Hunter are not the servants' quarters of Sydney. We are not the works' quarters of Sydney. We have a right to our own life. We have a right to our own aspirations, and that is being taken away, Madam Deputy President. If you go to the website, under the, uh, sorry, in, on the 20th of April 22, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg handed down the pre-election uh, economic and fiscal outlook that included a document that was for community projects. Every one of those projects was warranted and needed. They are across all seats. Members of parliament on both sides were approached, plans and costings were delivered, discussions were had with councils and communities, and the benefits would be delivered. But every one of those projects is being reviewed. Labor say they are reviewing those measures from PFO. What will Treasurer Jim Chalmers, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Infrastructure Minister Catherine King to do to look after our communities if they take this away? The answer is nothing. Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, on that list on their website, there are projects from every state every region, every party, and they just they all fall down. Here in Canberra, renovate, rebuild the AIS arena, 11.4 million. Is that to go? We're looking at Lindsay, Bennett Park Recreation, Space Upgrade, 0.59, pick a seat, where they're all here. Brisbane, probably not the uh, safest Liberal Party seat in the history of the world. Brothers Rugby Club Facilities Upgrade, $2.5 million. Madam Deputy Thank Speaker. you, Senator. Your time has expired. Time for debate has expired. So we will move on to the tabling. Uh, the, yeah. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Any senators? We have item one, Australian Human Rights Commission report. No speakers? No? Item number two, Migration Act 1958, section 4860. No? Item three, Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards Scheme and Intergovernmental Agreement. No? Then we shall move on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Sikorani. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present the Committee's Annual Report for 2021 and Human Rights Scrutiny Report No. 4 of 2022. Any speakers? No? Oh, Senator on. White. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. Senator White. Uh, I present two reports of the Standing Committee of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation as listed at item 18 of today's order of business, together with the ministerial correspondence received by the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the reports. I, I wish to speak. And I rise to speak on the, to the tabling of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's Delegated Legislation Monitor 6 of 2022 and the Committee's Annual Report. This monitor reports on the Committee's consideration of 138 legislative instruments registered on the Federal Register 
of legislation between the 27th of July and the 31st of August 2022. This includes 120 disallowable legislative instruments and 18 instruments exempt from disallowance. It also details the committee's ongoing consideration of instruments registered in previous periods and concludes its engagement with the relevant minister in relation to four instruments. I would first like to draw to the Chamber's attention to the, co to the committee's concluding comments uh, on the Australian Renewable Energy Agency Amendment Powering Australia Regulations 2022. These regulations prescribe energy efficiency technologies and electrification technologies as functions of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, that's ARENA. As I noted in my comments on the Delegated Legislation Monitor 5, it was unclear to the committee whether these functions fell within the scope of the Australian Renewable Energy Act 2011, the ARENA Act, under which, under which the instruments are made. The committee also sought advice about the, ex the extent of con consultation undertaken in making the instrument. Since the committee reported, the objects of the ARENA Act have been amended to expand its objects and include a note clarifying the types of functions which can be prescribed by regulation. The minister's response to the committee uh, outlined these amendments and provided additional useful information about the degree of connection between the functions prescribed by the instrument and the scope of the ARENA Act. The minister also provided further information as to consultation undertaken in making the information. On the basis of the minister's advice and noting the recent amendments to the ARENA uh, Act, the committee has resolved to conclude its examination of the instrument, bringing to the end uh, a, a, large, a long history of this Act and regulations. The committee thanks the minister and departmental officers for their constructive engagement on this matter. This monitor also contains the committee's request for further information from the relevant ministers in relation to three instruments, the Bankruptcy Amendment Service of Documents Regulations 2022, the Financial Framework Health Measures No. 9 Regulations 2021 and the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment Prime Minister and Cabinet Measures No. 11 Regulations 2021. The Health Measures No. 9 regulations authorise spending on the development and maintenance of Australia's onshore capacity to manufacture mRNA products. The committee has sought the Minister's advice as to why it was considered appropriate to address such significant matters in delegated legislation. The committee also asked whether the funding amount could be disclosed to promote appropriate parliamentary oversight of com Commonwealth expenditure. The Minister for Health and Ageing has since provided additional information about the need to use delegated legislation for this purpose and has also out outlined some of the complexities relating to disclosing the funding amount. Despite these complexities, he has advised that his department is working with the funding recipient to provide the required transparency expected by Parliament. The committee is therefore seeking an undertaking to update the explanatory, uh, uh, explanatory statement to the instrument with further information about the relevant expenditure once this work is complete. The Prime Minister and Cabinet Measures No. 11 regulations amends the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers regulations to authorise spending on the Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme. The committee has sought the Minister's advice on several issues, including the need to use delegated legislation to address such significant matters and the availability of merits review. In the light of the Minister's response, the committee has resolved to seek further advice about the availability of merits reviews for decisions made under the scheme. Finally, I would like to speak to the tabling of the committee's annual report 2021. The report document, documents a significant year in the committee's history. In 2021, the committee examined a 1,712 instruments, of which 420 raised scrutiny con concerns. This was a significant increase from the 240 instruments raise, raising concerns in 2020. In 2021, most concerns raised by the committee at the ministerial level related to the inclusion in delegated leg legislation of matters more appropriate for parliamentary enactment and instruments modifying primary legislation. Chapter 2 of the report provides further detailed information about the committee's scrutiny work over the year. The increase in the number of instru instruments raising scrutiny concerns is partly due to amendments to the committee's standing orders in mid-2021. Amongst other matters, these amendments empowered the committee to scrutinise instruments in relation to exemptions from disallowance and sunsetting. These amendments arose from the recommendations of the committee's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. 
Chapter 1 of the annual report outlines this important inquiry. Chapter 3 of the report contains case studies of some of the most significant scrutiny issues identified by the committee in 2021. These include the committee's extensive engagement with the Treasurer in relation to instruments made in the Treasury portfolio, for, portfolio which modified or created exemptions to the operation of primary legislation. Following this engagement, the committee was pleased to note the more the more frequent inclusion of limitations on the duration of instruments modifying the operation of primary legislation. The committee thanks the former Treasurer and the departmental officers for their constructive engagement with the committee on these, this matter. Chapter 3 of the report also identifies identifies ongoing scrutiny issues that, com that the committee will continue to monitor, including the exemption of delegated legislation from disallowance and the absence of an adequate jurisdiction. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank previous committee members, the committee le committee's legal adviser, Associate Professor Andrew Edgar, and the Secretariat for their work in 2021 on these significant matters. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor six of 2022 and the annual report of 2021 to the Senate. Senator Scar, uh, I understand you want to speak to this report. Yes, I do, uh, Madam <coughs> Acting Deputy President. And at the outset, I should acknowledge that uh, in the previous parliament, I had the privilege of serving on the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee under your uh, chairing, and uh, that was an extremely positive uh, experience from my perspective as a new senator. I learned a great deal on that committee, and, and, and thank you for that. If I can, with that indulgence, I can uh, compliment you. Um, thank you. Just keep it coming. Oh, but, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm running out. I'm running out. <laughs> well, I do miss you. I'm on the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, and, and your absence is uh, is uh, is notable. Uh, but I would um, I would like to. Uh, talk about the scrutiny of delegated uh, legislation committee in the most recent report. And the first thing I want to say is I do want to compliment Senator White uh, in relation to her chairing of that committee. Uh, there were extremely big shoes to fill on that committee. Uh, I think, uh, from my experience, uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells. As, as chair of that committee and Senator Kim Carr as the deputy chair of that committee did outstanding work uh, during the last term of parliament. And I'm so pleased that Senator White, with her chairing of that committee, has continued the bipartisan nature of the or nonpartisan nature with respect to the conduct of that committee's business. And I just want to give one example in the most recent monitor to draw out the importance of the work of that committee. And, and that is in relation to the questions which have been raised with respect to electronic service of documents under the Bankruptcy Act. Now, as someone has, in my previous life, uh, worked uh, for a period of time in, in the field of insolvency litigation. I understand the importance, the monumental importance, with respect to bankruptcy proceedings on everyday Australians. And it is so important that the service of bankruptcy notices, creditors, petitions, etc., is done in a way which ensures that people aren't caught unawares by those sorts of proceedings. So, as an example of one of the things, one of the great things which this committee does, it's drawn attention to the fact in relation to electronic service of documents that it is so important to make sure that the uh, that the rights of individual Australians to, to be correctly served, those sorts of documents which can be profoundly life-changing, it's absolutely crucial that, that uh, those principles are adhered to. I would like to say something with respect to the annual report uh, for, the, uh, for the 2021 year in relation to the scrutiny of dele delegated legislation committee. Some of the most important work that committee has done some of the most important work that committee has done is with respect to its inquiry during the course of last year's parliament with respect to the exemption from disallowance procedures of uh, delegated legislation. In my view, and I've spoken about this previously in this place, the circumstances in which delegated legislation, and as the, as the committee has noted in the past, there is tidal waves of this sort of delegated legislation coming through. I think the ratio is about four to one 
in terms of delegated legislation compared to uh, bills of parliament. And that delegated legislation can have a profound impact, a profound impact on Australians. And because of that, because of that, and we saw it during the recent pandemic in relation to controls with respect to the ability of Australians to leave the country or come back to the country, because of the impact that that delegated legislation has on the rights of everyday Australians, in my view, it is absolutely crucial that in nearly every case, and the exemption should be extremely narrow, it's important that in nearly every case that that delegated le legislation should be subject to disallowance procedures in this place. And that's important for a number of reasons. First, to make sure that the appropriate scrutiny is applied to that delegated legislation. And as you know, Madam Acting Deputy President, the way the scrutiny committees work is typically there is dialogue entered into between the committee and the relevant minister. So invariably, in the vast majority of cases, through the toing and froing of that correspondence, which can take months in some cases, a good result is arrived at for the people of Australia. So that process is extraordinarily important and leads to an improvement in terms of the laws and instruments which impact everyday Australians. The second point I want to make is if you exempt that delegated legislation from oversight by the Senate, oversight by the elected representatives, then who's responsible? Exactly. Who's responsible yep. for that delegated legislation? Mm -hmm. From my perspective, I've been elected on, on behalf of the people of Queensland to represent their interests in this place, and that means I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to consider the laws which impact Queenslanders. And if a delegated legislation is not subject to a disallowance process, I'm deprived the opportunity. I'm deprived the opportunity of considering the impact of that delegated legislation upon my constituents in Queensland. And that is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that instruments legislative instruments, delegated legislation, which can have incredible impacts on the lives of everyday Australians, and we sure saw during the pandemic, can have an impact on whether or not they can leave the country or come back to the country. You don't get more fundamental than that. From my perspective, it is unacceptable that that should not be subject to a disallowance process in this parliament, so that every one of the 76 senators, every one of the 76 senators in this place has to discharge their obligation to consider, soberly consider, that delegated legislation and whether or not it's in the best interests of their constituents. That's how this place is meant to work. And yet over the years, and, and this isn't party political, this is both, both parties, both parties of government, over the years there's been the creep towards more and more delegated legislation not subject to disallowance pr processes. And I do not accept the argument. I do not accept the argument which has previously been put that there are some things which are too important or some things too sensitive for this place to consider. The more sensitive it is, the greater the impact Correct. on people in Queensland, the more important it is that the people's elected representatives should consider, should consider the delegated legislation and the impact it's going to have on the lives of their citizens. The more important it is. I do not accept the notion that I've heard from a number of people in the representatives of uh, in the executive of government, the public service, that oh, this is something which uh, really uh, it's so obvious it shouldn't be going to the Senate, and we can't risk we can't risk this becoming. And I've seen this said. I've seen this said. I've heard it. We can't risk this becoming political. We can't risk this becoming political. I'm sorry, when I see that word political, I interpret it as subject to the scrutiny of the representatives elected by the people. That's what politics is all about. Each and every one of us here in this place re representing the people who elect us. The more sensitive it is, the more appropriate it is that it should come before this Senate. So this Senate can consider whether or not we should apply uh, the disallowance procedures uh, which were available to us. Lastly, uh, I, just in conclusion, I do want to sincerely place on the record my personal thanks uh, to Senator uh, Ferravani-Wells uh, 
uh, and also to Senator Kim Carr. I think they gave all of us an outstanding example of the good that can be done, the good that can be done when we reach across the chamber and work together in a non-partisan fashion to improve the laws for the benefit of all Queenslanders. And their cooperation and their leadership on that committee uh, left, a profound, uh, left a profound imprint upon me. And I'd like to, again, in, in closing, congratulate Senator White um, as the only continuing member of that committee from the last parliament to this parliament. From my perspective, you're continuing that tradition, and I congratulate you for it. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dean Smith, are you speaking on the same report? I'm not, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair. Yeah, are like there any to... others? If I can, we can just deal with this, is there any other speakers on that report? If not, uh, then I uh, need to put the question that the Senate take note of the committee report. Senators, all those in favour say aye. All those against. Carried. Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I present Scrutiny Digest No. 5 of 2022 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. I just draw to your attention it's not listed on the notice paper, but Wednesdays are our regular tabling of the scrutiny reports. Okay. You're moving that? Do you I'm, move, I'm moving that the Senate take um, note. Uh, note of the report, and I'm going to just make some brief. And you're going to make some I remarks. Am. And can I extend my congratulations to the wonderful stewardship uh, that you uh, exercised when you were the chair of the scrutiny of bills? Um, Keep it going. And, uh, Keep it going. I I'm think, moving I think, extension of time. I think Senator Scar might have overlooked the fact that I have actually inherited that role uh, now that we're in opposition. But um, I know that Senator Scar uh, speaks uh, generously uh, of your stewardship, as he has done with Senator uh, Littles, and, um, and I know that Senator Scar is a great enthusiast for the scrutiny role of the Senate. Uh, as the chair of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, I rise to speak to the tabling of the Committee's Scrutiny Digest No. 5 of 2022. The digest contains the Committee's assessment of all bills recently introduced into the Parliament. Each bill is assessed against the Committee's technical scrutiny principles set out in Standing Order 24. These principles focus on the effect of proposed legislation on parliamentary scrutiny and individual rights, liberties and obligations. Importantly, the committee has a strong and long-standing commitment to non-partisanship and, accordingly, the Digest does not consider the policy merits of various bills. Scrutiny Digest No. 5 of 2022 reports on the committee's consideration of 17 bills and three recent amendments which were introduced into the parliament during the previous sitting week. It also contains the committee's comments on a recent ministerial response in relation to one bill. The committee has identified potential scrutiny uh, concerns in relation to 10 bills, including three private senators' bills and private members', members bills. In particular, I wish to highlight uh, the committee's comments in relation to one recently introduced bill and one amendment. The first is the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment AFP Powers and Other Matters Bill of 2022. The bill seeks to extend the operation of several significant counterterrorism measures that are currently due to sunset in December of this year. Each measure in the bill will be extended for 12 months. Scrutiny principle number one requires the committee to report in respect of bills which may trespass unduly on, un, unduly on personal rights and liberties. Under this principle, the committee will have scrutiny concerns in relation to any bill that introduces provisions which substantially depart from the traditional common law approach to the criminal justice system. The traditional approach to restraining and detaining persons on the basis of a criminal conviction involves a number of well-established steps, including investigation, arrest, charge, remand in custody or bail, and then sentence on conviction. Several measures extended by the bill depart from this traditional approach and, as a result, may uh, detrimentally, detrimentally impact on common law rights or liberties. For example, the bill seeks to extend the operation of the control order regime, which allows a court to impose obligations, prohibitions and restrictions on a person without charge for purposes related to preventing terrorist attacks. 
The bill also seeks to extend the operation of the preventative detention order regime, which allows a person to be taken into custody for up to 48 hours without charge, arrest or any intention on the part of the relevant law enforcement officer to charge the subject with a criminal offence. Finally, the bill seeks to extend the operation of powers which allow a police officer to stop, question and search persons without a warrant or to seize items from a person without a warrant. These latter powers are available to officers operating in a declared security zone, regardless of whether they are reasonable grounds to believe the relevant person may be involved in the commission or attempted commission of a terrorist act. The extraordinary nature of these measures is recognised in the current legislation by the inclusion of a sunset period. Sunset clauses are important safeguards which facilitate regular parliamentary scrutiny and oversight of primary legislation. As sunsetting is one of the primary means by which the parliament exercises control over its legislative function, the committee considers that any modification of the sunsetting process should only occur in exceptional circumstances. In this case, the sunsetting date for each of the coercive measures in this bill has been extended on a number of occasions. The committee is therefore concerned that measures which were originally introduced as a temporary response to an emergency situation may become permanent by their continued renewal. The explanatory memorandum to this bill does not appear to provide a justification for the extension of the sunsetting date for the measures in the bill. The committee has therefore requested the minister's advice, and I think this is a particularly important point which demonstrates the comments that Senator Scar just made. The committee has therefore requested the minister's advice as to the exceptional circumstances which might justify the extension. Whether those exceptional circumstances are expected to continue into the future and what alternative scrutiny mechanisms are available to the parliament. That, as you'll appreciate, Madam Deputy President, that writing to the minister seeking their additional information or clarification is an important part of the iterative process of the scrutiny of bills committee. And I'm always delighted to be able to report uh, that often that exchange of views, that expression of concerns does actually lead to changes uh, in the propositions that the government's governments of various persuasions bring to the parliament or bring back to the parliament uh, in the form of amendments or improved legislation. To demonstrate that, uh, let me just make some comments about the Aged Care Amendment impl impl Implementing Care Reform Bill of 2022. Separate to these concerns, I'm pleased to highlight the committee's comments on amendments to the Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Bill of 2022. The committee commented on this bill in Scrutiny Digest 4 of 2022, expressing concerns about the broad discretionary power to determine via delegated legislation exemptions to statutory requirements relating to re registered nurses in residential facilities, an issue that has been top of mind for uh, many people in aged care, many families of residents of aged care and particularly those living across regional communities. The previous iteration of the bill did not set out any detailed criteria limiting this broad exemption power, nor did the face of the bill include any guidance as to how the power should be exercised. I'm pleased to note that recent amendments to the bill address these concerns by providing further limits and guidance on the exercise of this power. In particular, the amendments state that any exemption must not be granted for a period exceeding 12 months, providing significantly greater parliamentary scrutiny over exemption in instruments. The committee looks forward to continuing to engage constructively with ministers to resolve technical scrutiny concerns like this prior to the passage of the bill. And I think that's a very, very important demonstration, again, of the comments that Senator Scar had made just pre previously, that it, it is the exchange of views between the scrutiny committee, this particular scrutiny committee, and executive government and officials that support the government to have laws that are better defined, that in our case uh, better protect certain liberties uh, for Australians. And I'm pleased to note the continued uh, work of this committee and again to note uh, your stewardship in the previous parliament. We've seen in the last couple of days some interesting comments about the Biosecurity Act of 2015 uh, and its appropriateness. And I think that if we put our mind to the 
debates or lack of debates and the scrutiny, lack of scrutiny around that particular bill, the bill which facilitated uh, Australia's response to the pandemic, and for some Australians uh, allowed governments to exercise much too much power. Um, I think then when we think about that bill, the lack of scrutiny, lack of parliamentary debate and inquiry, then I think the work of this particular committee, uh, the work of other scrutiny committees in the Senate become much more important and appreciated. So with that, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I conclude my yeah. remarks. Thank you, Senator Smith. The question is that the Senate take note of the committee report. All of those of that opinion say aye, all of those against no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. We are now moving on to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Brown, you have uh, a call. Are you. you going to flatter me too? Just <laughs> asking. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, on behalf of the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance, I table the final budget outcome 2021-22. Senator Brown. I table documents relating to the order of the production of documents concerning TikTok. Are there, uh, yes, uh, Senator Askew. Note of that document and seek leave to continue our remarks, please. Yes. Leave granted. Leave granted. Thank you, Senator Askew. Are there any further statements? Minister. Minister. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is no. leave granted? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. So, if there are no further, uh, further ministerial statements, uh, we'll now move to committee memberships. And the president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary mem the membership of committees. And I know the answer because leave is already granted. <laughs> I move that senators be discharged from and point, appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and is listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. No further notices? Okay. Thank you. Right. We now move to item 21 messages from the House of Representatives. Uh, a message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by that House relating to the appointment of a Joint Select Committee on National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation. Minister. I seek leave to have the message considered immediately. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the Senate concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives proposing the appointment of a Joint Select Committee on National Anti-Corruption Commission. Commission legislation. And I put the motion to the Senate. I put the question to the Senate. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move the amendment that has been circulated in recognition of the work that the crossbench have done for over a decade, recognising Senator Waters in the Senate and the member for Indi, Helen Haynes, and their contribution. I believe that it is warranted to have an extra crossbencher on this. Joint Select Committee. So the question is that that motion put by Senator Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The, the ayes have it. No. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Pocock be agreed to. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair and the noes shall pass to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Pocock, Senator Pocock to tell it for the ayes. Senator Askew to tell it for the noes. Not yet. She's broken. All right. I'll tell you. Thanks, mate. Beautiful. Order. The result of the division is eyes 11, noes 30. The question is resolved in the negative. Now, Senator Waters. Thanks, Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I move uh, the amendment to the motion that's been circulated in the chamber in my name. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. <laughs> you all four. Correction. Ring the bells for four minutes, please.
Yeah. Lock the doors. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. <laughs> oh, is it Senator Pratt? Order, there being 35 ayes and 14 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now put the uh, amended a motion. So the question is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. I'm going to put that again. So the question is that the motion <coughs> as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. Order. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment AFP Powers and Other Matters Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister. This bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The uh, question is that motion now be moved. Uh, for those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it.
Um, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter-terrorism and for related purposes. Minister. Um, that I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Do you have any more? In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 25th of October 2022. Thank you, Tim. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Social Security Administration Amendment Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022. Thanks, Kathleen. Clark. Government business order of the day number three, social services and other legislation amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill 2022 in committee. Just going to get through this, Senator Smith. Oh, okay. Uh, so, just going to do the formality, Senator Smith. Thank you. The committee is considering the social services and other legislation amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill of 2022 and amendments three and eight on sheet 1643, moved by Senator Cash. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. Chair, so we are at the end of the day, back where we were at the beginning of the day, uh, and the matter before us is the Social Security lifting the income limit for Commonwealth Seniors card bill. And at the outset, I think it's very important to restate the coalition's position, and that is that we su support the substantive matter that is in this bill, uh, in large part actually in 100 per cent part, because it is the coalition's initiative carried over from the previous government and now adopted by this government. So congratulations to the new government for bringing forward what was a coalition initiative. Indeed, I think Senator Rustin, as the then social services minister, was responsible for that. So we would hope that same level of spirit, that same level of foresightedness that the government has shown in regards to this matter, it will now show in regards to amendments that the coalition is bringing to this bill. Amendments that don't subtract, subtract from the substance of this bill, but amendments that will make the bill better, but more importantly will deliver much needed cost of living relief to aged pensioners and importantly in doing so also provide an immediate remedy whether you're in capital cities or regional locations to the many small and medium sized businesses across our country that are suffering from labor shortage issues the amendments that the opposition has tabled and that we would like to see adopted today do three things Schedule one of those amendments will suspend, it deals with the suspension of benefits and entitlements instead of cancellation. Uh, uh, let's call it a red tape reduction initiative that many, many senior Australians will and have embraced. The second schedule extends the qualification for pension concession cards. Again, an idea that older Australians enthusiastically embrace. And most importantly, and I suspect this is the reason that the government is wanting to delay a vote on this, is it brings and puts into the law tonight the initiative 
that will increase the work bonus for pensioners, lifting it from $300 a fortnight to $600 a fortnight, and in doing so, removing the financial penalty that older Australians incur when they move beyond the current $300 a fortnight work bonus limit. This is an initiative that many people across our country are calling for. They've called for it in Senate committees. They've called for it in dialogue with members of parliament across our country. But for some reason, in the last minutes of this parliament today, remembering that the next parliamentary sitting day is actually the budget day, which is over a month away, Labor could send a very, very clear message tonight that it wants to provide older Australians with cost of living relief, and it has understood and it will treat with urgency those very, very real labour shortage issues that businesses are facing across our country. I asked Senator Farrell this morning whether or not the government had yet brought forward legislation to give effect to its Jobs and Skills Summit initiative. Remembering a Jobs and Skills Summit that happened on the 1st and 2nd of September and today, the 28th of September, almost a month, almost a month before the government could get its act together and introduce its own bill. Its own bill to provide relief, it says, to older Australians, its own bill to provide a remedy to those labour shortages across the country. But not the same bill, because Labor's bill is temporary. Labor thinks it only needs an answer that will last until the 30th of June next year. By definition, by definition, it says that our labour shortage issues will expire on the 30th of June next year. We know that's crazy. Senator Lambie, I'm sure in Tasmania you know. You know. You know two things. Real cost of living pressures on older Australians in Tasmania and very, very real, severe, acute labour shortages being felt across our country, probably more pronounced in Tasmania. And what I can't understand is that, by Labor's own admission today in the House of Representatives, it's saying there is a problem with cost of living pressures. They're saying there is a problem with labour shortages. But they're expecting our country, our parliament, to wait for another month, which makes it two months since the job summit, when tonight they could put in law a more generous and more permanent remedy. This is what Labor's Social Security Minister said in the House of Representatives this morning. It's been widely reported across the country and understood, understood by this government, i.e. the Labor government, that businesses across Australia are experiencing skill and labour shortages. I don't disagree. Tick, Senator, tick Ms Ridgeworth, the Minister for Social Services. She says that those labour shortages are constraining productivity and economic growth. Tick. That's two out of two. We agree. Then she says, implementing a, range, implementing a range of policies designed to address labour market issues across the country is important. We agree with that as well. Three ticks. So why will you Order. not? Why will you not support? Why will Order. you not support? Why will you not support Senator Farrell Order. these amendments brought from the opposition before you? Why will you not support them? Why are you saying to older Australians and small businesses, we want you to wait another month? We've had a job skills summit, we've got a lot of positive media, and now we Order. want you to wait two months. Two extra months. Order. Two extra months. I, on this matter, the coalition will happily sit down and have nothing more to say. If Senator Farrell is about to get to his feet and say, you're right, older Australians deserve a remedy now, small businesses deserve a remedy now. If that is the, con if that is the contribution Senator Farrell is about to make, 
Well, then this might end up being the most productive day this Senate chamber has seen for a very, very long time. Very, very productive day. Very productive day. Senator, Senator day. Farrell, order. The time is now, Senator Farrell. The time is now, Senator Pratt. This is the opportunity. I hope when Senator Farrell gets to his feet, he'll do three things. He will explain why Labor's measure is temporary. He'll explain why Labor's measure is less generous. And he'll say to the Senate, yes, you're quite right. Let's do something now. Let's do something immediately. Let's make this a high water mark of these last three sitting days. I don't know if that is a challenge that Senator Farrell can live up to. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. The Australian Greens, in a contribution earlier today, said that this was a I'm paraphrasing Senator Rice, so, but this was an important first step. Not the only step, an important first step in bringing relief to older Australians to help deal with their cost of living pressures and also to address labour shortages. Remember this. This week, Jim Chalmers, the Treasurer, said that cost of living pressures were skyrocketing. Not my word, Jim Chalmers' word, were skyrocketing. And Senator Farrell is going to ask the Senate, is going to filibuster so that those skyrocketing cost of living pressures for older Australians, he's saying older Australians can wait another month. They've already waited one month, and he's now saying they can wait another month. And I doubt, I doubt that Labor will legislate their initiative in Budget Week and they're going to stand in the way of this initiative, this is not new news. This is not new news. Anyone that has been, paid, been paying attention to debates around cost of living and labour shortages know that the national seniors and others, grain producers, agricultural organisations, chambers of commerce and industry in Western Australia, in Victoria, I suspect in Tasmania, have been saying this is an urgent issue. Treasury themselves said last week that labour shortages were severe. Thank you, the time to Senator, act is now. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Pratt. The opposition wants to make an absolute dog's breakfast of the legislative process in this place. We got these amendments at exactly the same time as the bill on this topic, which those opposite knew was coming at exactly the same time. Here we have referred to the Community Affairs Legislation Committee just today by the Selection of Bills Committee. What's wrong? We have had the Commonwealth Income the, the Limits legislation on this topic referred to a Senate committee just today for report later on. Now that is the bill in which these amendments should be moved, not the bill before us. All you are doing this evening is standing in the way of retirees getting access to the Commonwealth Health Seniors Card. That is what you are doing because you are trying to cross-fertilise things that don't belong together. Oh, so, sorry, so Senator Pratt, if you could just take your um, uh, seat, please. Um, Senator Smith, I believe you might have a point of order, but I think you've got to say point of order first. Okay. Or stand then point of order. Just, just to be very clear, and it was in my remarks, Senator Pratt, that the coalition supports the substantive matter in this bill and it has amendments. I don't know if that was a point of order. So, um, so thank you, Senator Pratt. That was indeed a filibuster. A filibuster. The legislation. Order. Well, I am here order. to legislate. Order. 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 Okay, everyone in order. Senator Pratt uh, needs to be heard in silence. Senator Pratt. Senator Rustin, you're not helping things. Uh, Senator Pratt. Helping, Senator Rustin. The Labor Senator. government wanted to finish this legislation Great. this week so that Commonwealth senior uh, health care card holders can be extended to other retirees. But instead, instead, you are proposing these amendments to a bill that is not the right bill to do it in. 
We have a committee inquiry on changing the income limits for pensioners underway because a referral has just been done by the Selection of Bills Committee to the Legislation Committee of this chamber. That is a complete nonsense of legislative process for those opposite to be pursuing this these amendments here in this bill. The bill before us is here to lift the income threshold for seniors' health card seniors uh, who need access to the health care card to deal with their very pressing cost of living issues, of which pharmaceutical medications are an absolute priority. The government has its own clear plan to lift income limits for pensioners that we have put forward in a bill that has been referred to a Senate committee. We have not inquired yet into lifting these uh, income limits uh, to the level that the opposition and the Greens are seeking to do so. It is simply not feasible to expect this chamber to deal with this question at the 11th hour in an amendment uh, that doesn't even belong in this bill. Our Workforce Incentives Bill uh, will um, see the workforce, uh, the increase in the maximum work bonus income bank balance from 7,800 to 11,800. Now, when you introduce these amendments at the 11th hour this morning, I, don't even, I haven't even had time to look at what the income limits are, how they'll affect uh, the pension outgoings uh, relative to— Well, of course we do, but we still have to get our head around the answers to these questions as a government department for example, their impact on the budget, uh, etc. And yet you insist when there is a perfect opportunity with due process to look at your amendments in the right and proper bill which is coming before this place in a few weeks' time. I'm absolutely appalled at those opposite seeking to disrupt parliamentary process in this way. The absolute gall of moving an amendment in one bill when the substantive issue is dealt with in a completely different piece of legislation that is also up for debate and that is also before the parliament is not proper legislative process. It is quite, it's not proper legislative process to have an issue being debated, for example, in one chamber while the same debate on the same question is going on in the other, when it is a substantive matter of legislation. We're supposed to have rules and principles around this, but instead you are, abs you, you are seeking to absolutely bypass good parliamentary process. This is not good policy development. It is also fiscally irresponsible. It's all very well for those to laugh over there and say, oh, well, you've got a department uh, to go and look at that for you. Well, it certainly shows that you're in opposition now that you're prepared just to fling these amendments up without really looking at the consequences and working through the due process. Yes, we would like to ask the department. Yes, we would like to look at what the fiscal outcome is, which is not something that can be easily calculated uh, within a day with no notice when 
you simply brought these amendments in this morning and then expected the government to come to a voting position on it and be prepared to see the bill passed as amended. So instead, we are at this standstill tonight where those opposite and the crossbench are getting in the way of making the entitlement available to retirees who would like access to a health care card to bring down their cost of medicine. I appreciate that the decisions in this place mean trade-offs one way or the other in terms of who gets something. But you are leaving us in the position of nobody getting anything by the time the sitting day ends today. When we have nevertheless a perfect opportunity for you to progress your agenda in the rightful bill that is still to come before this place. Instead, yes indeed, I am standing here filibustering this legislation to avoid stop you from those to stop those opposite from making an absolute mess of the legislative process. I am absolutely pleased to wear that on my wear that on my sleeve because it is absolutely irresponsible for you to have brought these amendments before this place at the 11th hour in the way that you have. You explain to older Australians that you are in the way of their health care card. We are not standing in the way of amendments to the workforce bonus. We are here to progress government legislation on that topic which this parliament has indeed referred to the Community Affairs Committee. Well, it's only just been, it's been referred today. Oh, well, I... Order. The bill, we expect the legislation to progress in an orderly and prioritised manner so that we can deliver these outcomes to Australian pensioners and Australian retirees. When you decide to get involved with messy amendments, then what happens is that we end up leaving this place with no one, no one, no one winning. There will be a time and place to debate and consider your amendments. But to have lumped them on the government at the 11th hour in the way you did today is completely unconscionable. Thank you, Senator Pratt. And, uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting um, Deputy Chair. Um, look, I just want to call out what's going on here. We have got a bill to um, increase the ability of pensioners to access um, support, which we support, which Labor support. Which the government, which the opposition supports, we have got amendments from the opposition, which, as I said in my second reading contribution, that we as Greens feel are good amendments that basically allow pensioners to earn more, which are connected to this bill because they are actually improving the uh, ability of pensioners to deal with the cost of living. We feel that those amendments are good amendments. These amendments are similar to but different from measures that the government have moved. So basically there's a fight going on between the government and the, and the Liberal Party as to who gets the credit for these amendments that will allow pensioners to earn more. We feel that these are good amendments. We cannot vote against these amendments, but clearly the government don't want the Libs to be getting the credit for this bill, for, for these amendments, which would allow pensioners to earn more. And so what's going on? The Labor Party are filibustering. The Labor Party are trying to delay this bill being passed through the Senate so that it's not Liberal amendments that are successful in giving pensioners the ability to earn more. I want to put all of this politics aside. We need to be getting measures through this parliament that are going to enable pensioners to deal with the cost of living, and here is a way of doing it. So the Greens want to support these amendments, and we want to support them going through this parliament tonight. 
We do not want to continue on this ridiculous waste of time just because the Labor Party aren't happy with the Liberal Party getting the credit for something that we all agree on. It's just crazy. Uh, thank you. Oh, Senator Lambie and then um, Senator Lambie. Sorry. Mr Acting De Deputy President, I move the question now be put. Thank you. Okay, so Senator Lambie has moved the question to be put, and the question is that amendments three and eight on sheet one six four three be uh, moved together. Uh, those of that opinion, sorry, we've got a procedural motion first. Sorry, procedural motion is that the um, the, the question will be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. No. I think the ayes have it. So division required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes, please. Caught myself.
Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan uh, Teller for the ayes and Senator Cheney Teller for the noes. The result of this division is ayes 35, noes 14. The question is resolved in the affirmative, and that was a procedural motion moved by Senator Lambie that the question be put. So we will now move to the substantive motion, which is that so the question will be that amendments three and eight on sheet 1643 um, be uh, agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Eyes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes, please.
Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 14. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I'm in the uh, hands of the Senate. Uh, so, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Chair. And uh, I seek leave to move items 1 through to 7 on sheet uh, UD? UD 142. Um, leaves granted. Yes, leaves granted. Senator Farrell. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, I refer to the uh, amendments that the uh, minister has uh, proposed to the original uh, legislation that um, uh, stemmed from the uh, the delay to, to the original uh, starting date as a result of uh, the passing of Queen uh, Queen Elizabeth II <coughs> and. Um, this government uh, amendment changes the commencement date uh, for legislation to enact uh, the government's election commitments to increase the income uh, limits for the Commonwealth Seniors uh, Health Card to $90,000 for singles <coughs> and $144,000 for uh, couples, uh, and that's a combined amount of money. Due to the uh, suspension of Parliament following the death of uh, Her Majesty, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, um, the bill to uh, implement this commitment could not be passed in time for the increase to be implemented on the 20th of September 2022 as intended. <coughs> to minimise any uh, further delays, this amendment will allow um, the increase to the income limits to take effect seven days following the uh, royal assent to the bill. This is the minimum time required by Services Australia to finalise the required systems and business processes once the final date is known. The Commonwealth Seniors Card income uh, limits are indexed uh, each year on the uh, 20th of September according to movements in the Consumer Price Index. The existing bill would have replaced indexation on the 20th of September 2022 with these significant one-off uh, increases. 
As the uh, bill did not pass, indexation of the uh, limits proceeded on the 20th of September as required by existing law. <coughs> this amendment therefore also removes material that would have prevented annual indexation for 2022. Following indexation on the 20th of September 2022, the income limits for the Commonwealth Seniors Card are currently $61,284 for singles and uh, $98,054 for couples, and that's a uh, combined amount. The bill, as amended, will uh, still raise the income limits uh, only to the intended levels of $90,000 for singles and $144,000 combined for couples. The bill includes amendments to both the Social Security Act uh, 1991 and the Veterans Entitlement Act 1986 to ensure the same income limits apply for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card as provided under each uh, Act. Like other Australians, many self-funded retirees are facing increased cost of living pressures in the current uh, economic environment. This bill, bill helps to uh, ease those pressures by allowing more self-funded retirees to access Australian government health concessions, including concessional co-payments for pharmaceutical benefit uh, scheme medicines. The, concession, uh, the concessional threshold for the pharmaceutical benefit scheme safety net and the extended Medicare safety net, and bulk billed visits to uh, a general practitioner at the uh, doctor's uh, discretion. The Commonwealth Senior Health Card also provides access to other concessions that may be provided by state and territory uh, governments and private organisations. This bill is expected to allow more than 50,000 self-funded retirees to become newly eligible for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. The Al Albanese government will continue to work tirelessly to support older Australians with cost of living pressures. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Smith. I move the motion be put. So, um, question before the chair is that the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So, the question before the chair, therefore, is the substantive motion that has and it's going to be split into two. Uh, the first question is that amendments one to four, six and seven be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next question is that item 10 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. So I'm in the hands again of the, ch the chamber. Uh, in terms of, I'm looking at the. I'll show up Senator Smith, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. I move um, amendments four and nine on sheet 1643 by leave together. Is our leave granted? No objection to, to leave being granted in terms of those being moved together. So you've moved those, Senator Smith? You've moved that? Uh, no one wants to speak to that. So the question before the Chair. Is that amendments four and nine on sheet 1643 uh, be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. Okay. Um, uh, the noes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, division required. Uh, ring the bell for four minutes.
Vamos a ver. Vamos. Lock the doors. The question before the order. Order. The question before the chair is, is amendments four and nine on sheet one six four three. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those with the question to my right, and those to my left. I point as teller for the eyes. Senator O'Sullivan, do you wish to be the teller? Yep. And teller for the nose, Senator Pratt.
Honourable Senators, there being 32 ayes and 15 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Senator Smith. I'd like to remove. I'd like to move. Uh, amendments 1, 2, 5, 6, 7 and 10 on sheet 1643 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave, it, leave is granted. Senator Rice. Um, I move that the motion be put. I put the question, the procedural motion, that the question be put. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. I'm now going to put that the amendments be agreed to. That is the question before the chair. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yeah, no, I've declared, I've declared that the ayes have, uh, have had it. I'm waiting for the next. Do you want the call? The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Order, honourable senators. The committee has considered the social services and other legislation amendment, lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill 2020, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the, I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, I move that uh, this bill be read a third time. I put the question that the bill now be read a third time. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number four. Sorry. For, sorry. I just wanted to call a point of order. Point of order. Well, I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but the Community Affairs Committee has been referred a bill on the same uh, act that this bill has amended and it has been referred to us by the Selection of Bills Committee. So I'm just seeking some advice about the status of that referral. Um, and I'll, I'll, you know, I, I guess that advice can come back to the committee and the chamber at some other time. But uh, I'm keen to know what the business before the committee is. Thank you. Senator, Senator Pratt, uh, it's, I understand conferring with the table staff that it's not something which I can advise from the chair and that uh, it's recommended that you approach the clerk directly. Uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to appoint members to committees. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted. Clark. Government business order of the day number four, Fair Work Amendment, Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cash, you, you have the call when you're I ready. do have the call for all of one minute. So I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022. And uh, Mr Deputy President, the bill provides an entitlement 
to 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave in a 12-month period for full-time, part-time and casual employees. The bill builds on measures put in place by the former coalition government following the Independent Fair Work Commission's 2018 decision to grant five days of unpaid family and domestic violence leave to employees covered by a modern award. The Fair Work Commission made its decision after carefully considering extensive evidence and submissions from unions, employers and other interested parties. The Fair Work Commission's proposal at the time meant that the approximately two million Australians on awards would be eligible to receive five days unpaid family and domestic violence leave. This earlier decision would have created a complexity for Australian businesses, particularly small and medium businesses, that have collective or individual agreements as well as award-reliant employees. And this complexity would have seen workers who are on an award entitlement to five days unpaid family and domestic violence leave, while a worker in the same organisation uh, who is on a Cash, collective agreement— you'll be Thank in, you. You'll be in continuance. We're now in, um, Just the I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I rise to declare that I stand with the people of the Ukraine in their fight for sovereignty and in the defence of democracy and the international rule of law. And I speak to continue to draw attention to the plight of the people of the Ukraine who are right now suffering the impact of one of the most consequential and horrifying events of this century, none other than Vladimir Putin's unprovoked, unjustified and illegal invasion of Ukraine. On the 23rd of February this year, an entire nation of 44 million people were living lives not so very different from yours and mine. They were in a free country with a democratically elected government in place, and they were getting on with their lives, all its joys and all its sorrows. They were uploading TikTok dance videos, planning weddings, holidays, meeting friends, living life like we do. But that all changed overnight when the dictator next door, who believes in a concocted and convoluted historical revisionism that denies Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language and Ukrainian history, invaded invaded a sovereign nation. The falsehoods that underpinned that claim as a, for a right to invade Ukraine continue to spread in Russia as part of a number of highly dangerous modern misinformation warfare techniques that are running in Russia and anywhere else that Russia can make sure that they get a hold. Information warfare is a reality, and it's really important that in institutions such as our parliament and in parliaments around the world we make sure that we get correct information on the record. I want to acknowledge the tremendous suffering of the Ukrainian people since the 24th of February and to indicate how significantly their lives have changed. They've borne the, borne the brunt of a vicious military manoeuvre that's destroyed homes, destroyed families and changed forever the Ukraine. They have been the subject of countless war crimes, displacements and unimaginable disruptions and endless tragedies of lost loved ones, loved ones injured and loved ones who have been killed by that invading Russian force, to a number of almost 10,000 citizens of the Ukraine. Now, much can be said about the incredible leadership of, the, uh, of, of Vladimir Zelensky, who's led his people with a steel, and, uh, steel will and a humanity that scarcely anyone would have believed was possible before this tragic war began. But the viola violation of international law and human rights has to be acknowledged, it must be condemned and it must be punished by the global community. I've been horrified by, report, by reports of mass war crimes committed by Russian occupiers and now confirmed by the UN investigators. The Russian forces' crimes included bombings of civilian areas, numerous executions, torture, horrific sexual violence. In towns like Bukha, Hostomel and Borod Borodyanka, UN teams discovered mass graves with large numbers of Ukrainians executed and tortured by Russian forces. 
There is nothing that justifies this war and nothing that can justify this abominable conduct. Those responsible must be held to account and prosecuted. But in the meantime, I want to report to the Senate that in my conversations with civic leaders in the Ukraine and with their representatives in a recent uh, trip that I had to Washington uh, to the IPAC uh, meetings, I've heard directly from the Ukrainians of their desperate need. Australians have never, ever let me down, and I'm so proud to be an Australian when we know that there's a need that we respond. Well, the needs in the Ukraine right now from ordinary Australian citizens just like us have told me that there is a shortage of medical supplies, not only for the people who are fighting at the front, but for civilians, because, let's face it, they're being attacked in their homes. Australians have risen to the challenge before. I really want to put it to this uh, parliament that we should be looking at the way in which parliaments and the body politic of Australia, ordinary Australian citizens, can help those other citizens who've had their rights violated, their country invaded by Russia. They need our help and they need it now. They need medical supplies. They also need significant educational supplies, and I have more to say on that, but I encourage all senators here to support me in this call on action for the people of Ukraine. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. Acting. Um, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute this evening to Masa Amini and to recognise the incredible bravery of the women of Iran who are right now fighting back against decades of oppression against them because of their sex. Masa was just 22 years old when she died earlier this month following a violent arrest by Iran's so-called morality police. Her crime? Not covering her hair in the way that the men who rule Iran demand that all women must. For this, she lost her life. The violence perpetrated against Masa by the Iranian regime had one purpose, to intimidate Iranian women into compliance, to show them that should they fail to dress as they are told, they can be arrested, beaten and even killed. But Iranian women are refusing to be intimidated. In spite of the danger they face, they have shown enormous courage by protesting Masa's death. They have taken off the hijab that symbolises their oppression and burned it in the streets. They have taken to social media and cut off their hair to show the world that they won't be intimidated. The Iranian regime has responded as authoritarian dictatorships invariably respond. Dozens of Iranians, including many more women, have been killed while participating in protests. The government has shut down social media and internet access in an attempt to hide their oppression of its citizens from the world. Surely the very least that the international community can do in support of the women of Iran is refuse to legitimise Iran's barbaric treatment of women. So why then does Iran remain a member of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women? How is it possible that the international community allows such status to a regime which denies women the right to show their hair and face in public? How galling it was to see the president of Iran addressing the United Nations General Assembly last week while his citizens died in the streets because they dared to protest the killing of a 22-year-old woman. Leaders from every nation, including our own, spent last week at the UN in New York. Many speeches were made, many photos were taken. Yet still, Iran remains a member of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, providing cover and available legitimacy for their oppression of women and girls. What have governments done to correct this abhorrent situation? What has our own government done? For as long as Iran remains on the UN Commission on the Status of Women, that commission can have no credibility. It's no wonder that so many people have little time for the machinations and the posturing of the United Nations. Human rights abusers sit on the Human Rights Council. Countries where women have no rights lecture us about the status of our women. Russia sits on the Security Council while it causes the biggest threat to global security we have seen in decades. 
Of course, Australia should work with like-minded international partners in the interests of peace, security and human rights. But we should not stand by and allow charades like Iran sitting on the UN Commission on the Status of Women without kicking up a fuss. Australia should take a lead role in working with other nations towards Iran's removal from the Commission. It is inconceivable that we could stay quiet and share membership of this Commission with Iran while Iranian women are not only risking their lives but losing their lives to stand up to their oppressor. Last Friday was Dogs in Politics Day. And although I have been talking about animal rights for many years, this one is a hard speech to make. My beloved companion dog, Cosmo, passed away suddenly earlier this year. On the same day, my colleagues entrusted me to become deputy leader of the Greens. Talk about bittersweet moments. I can never truly explain what Cosmo meant to me. He was my and my husband's lifeline during COVID when we were locked away from my son and my daughter. He gave us so much more than can be put into words. He was my baby boy, and the hole in my heart that he has left will not be filled. Cosmo was a rescue greyhound. As a breed, they are the most abused dogs in Australia. I adopted him soon after the gambling industry was successful in overturning the New South Wales greyhound racing ban with their allies in the Labour, Liberal and National parties. He struggled terribly with pain and arthritis. He had little patches of hair missing from one of his hind legs. His vet told us it was where a trainer had probably used pin firing as a home remedy, which is a soldering iron-like device intended to cause tissue scarring to save having to pay for a vet. This is just one small example of the cruelty these beautiful greyhounds are subjected to. I will continue to grieve, but there is one thing I must do to honour Cosmo's legacy, and that is highlighting the gross hypocrisy of the greyhound racing industry and their advocates in the Labour, Liberal and National parties. On Dogs on Politics Day, our socials were are flooded with politicians smiling with their dogs, making out that they are friends to animals. But what they won't tell you is their continued support of an industry that breeds, kills, injures, drugs and maims dogs, all aided and abetted with taxpayer funds. Time and again, players in the industries are exposed. Time and again, we are told it is another rotten apple, an isolated case. You might ask how this cruel industry continues to attract millions upon millions of taxpayer dollars to profit off problem gamblers while racing greyhounds die and get injured. It's a grotesque but effective business model. Big gambling company, companies like Tab Corp and Crown Resorts dumped $2.7 million into politicians' pockets in the decade to 2020. $1.3 million went to the Liberals, $1.1 million to Labour, and the remaining 300000 to the Nationals. That's right. The gambling companies pay the political parties to prop up racing that drives their gambling profits. The cycle of legalized corruption repeats infinitely as more and more animals are injured and die. Anyone who has had a rescue greyhound knows the scars left by racing. Any rescuer can tell you the condition that the dogs come in, poor teeth, poor skin, untreated injuries, thousands and thousands of dollars in vet bills spent by volunteer rescuers and individuals to clean up the mess of this brutal industry. I've often wrestled with the issue of greyhound adoption. Every dog adopted is another dog the gambling industry can breed and add to the problem of excess dogs to be rehomed. But we know that there is no alternative. What, we, what has to be done is that breeding caps have to be put on. It is unconscionable that the greyhound racing industry, Australia's biggest puppy farm, continues to incentivize the breeding of dogs. The result is more and more dogs being dumped on volunteer rescuers who are being pushed to breaking point. The Coalition for the Protection of Greyhounds digs up the information that the greyhound racing and gambling industry tries to hide. They have recorded the 120 need needless track deaths and 7,152 injuries that have already happened this year. The estimate 
that the national rate of greyhound breeding in 2020-2021 was about six times the racing industry's capacity to rehome them via its official adoption programs. So today, I am calling on a moratorium on breeding of greyhounds across Australia. If governments are not going to ban this vile industry just yet, they at least need to introduce breeding caps. Ultimately, people in this country want to see an end to greyhound racing. This has to end. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. Early childhood education plays a vital role in our society. I'm a firm believer, and as are my Labor colleagues, in the importance it plays in children's development, for families, particularly mothers, to re-engage in the workforce, and for the economy as a whole. As an auntie to my gorgeous 20-month-old nephew, Ibrahim, I understand the pressures my sister and her husband go through as a young couple to make ends meet. They're both studying full-time and working part-time while having a mortgage to pay, endless bills that pile on, and a baby whose cuteness unfortunately doesn't cover his expenses. To then consider having to pay for early learning causes quite the strain on their household budget. Like many young Australian mothers and fathers out there, my sister deserves to pursue her career while ensuring her child has access to a good educational start that is affordable and provided by educators who are passionate and recognised for their work. In my previous role as, a, as an organiser at United Workers' Union, I heard from educators who didn't feel respected or valued despite the critical role they play. They were overworked with lower ratio of staff to children, feeling burnt out and neglected. This prevented educators from building effective and meaningful relationships with each child, impacting their ability to provide individual attention, which is crucial to developing the child's social and learning skills. COVID-19 definitely exacerbated the already existing issues in the early education sector. It is this workforce of primarily women that care for our children, who can intervene to help in their early years so that disadvantage doesn't follow them. These educators can ensure that Australian children have the best start in life. Unlike some of those on the other side, Labor values, recognises and so will support a high quality early education workforce. I'm proud to be a small part of the change because while I know every educator does what they do based on their passion um, for children and education, they deserve a government which understands and supports them as well. Already we have heard from Minister for Early Childhood Education, Dr Ann Ali, that the work has begun and I'm confident that her commitment to this sector will mean great outcomes for children, families and educators. Unfortunately, the costs of early learning have been growing, eating a hole in household budgets and contributing to the rising cost of living. When early learning is unaffordable for families, then parents have no choice but to stay home instead of rejoining the workforce, and this burden often falls on mothers. In reforming early learning to make it more affordable and accessible, Labor will increase women's participation in the workforce. Labor will help the economy that is struggling with staff shortages, and most importantly, Labor will invest in our nation's <coughs> future by ensuring children get the best start in life. Our reforms will be achieved through a review of the sector through the Productivity Commission, with the aim of implementing a universal 90 per cent childcare subsidy for all families. And the ACCC will design a price regulation mechanism. This plan will make childcare cheaper for 96 per cent of, fa of families who have children in care. Importantly, this economic reform will have far-reaching social impacts and deliver a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. Senator Henderson. Sorry. Thank you very much, Madam President. 
I rise to raise serious concerns about the Albanese government's commitment to regional communications. Labor, when it was in opposition, went to the election promising a $155 million cut to regional communications. $155 million less than the $1.3 billion committed by the coalition, and of course that's on top of the massive expenditure by our government in regional communications to fix mobile black spots, to upgrade connectivity in rural, regional and remote communities, and to deliver better communications in peri-urban areas under the PUMP program. And of course, this is in stark contrast to Labor's failure to deliver $1 when it was last in government, for one mobile black spot. This is the most shameful record. On 19 August, I issued a statement asking whether Labor, was, whether Labor was planning more cruel cuts to regional communications. That's because we had not heard a word from Labor's communications minister, Michelle Rowland, about round two of the coalition's regional connectivity program, uh, un under which we had announced $140 million for 93 projects, including $37 million for Western Australia, $8 million for Tasmania, $9 million for South Australia, uh, $8 million for New South Wales, $43 million for Queensland, $15 million for Northern Territory and Christmas Island, uh, and $14 million for Victoria. This is a very substantial investment in rural, regional and remote communities that deserve better communications. A, a number of days later, the minister released a statement saying the minister has previously confirmed an intention to honour grants awarded under the Regional Connectivity Program, including round two, and formal announcements will be made in due course. Now That was uh, roughly the 23rd of August. It's now nearly the end of September. Where are those projects? Where is that funding? Where is the confirmation that Minister Rowland will deliver as she said she would do? She actually pointed the journalist to The Guardian and said, oh, well, I made, the, I made uh, the announcement or made The Guardian aware of what I was going to do, but in fact she didn't because she only referred to the Regional Connectivity Program, not to Round 2. Uh, Madam President, uh, proudly we've already delivered a whole range of other projects under Round 1 and well before the, the election, as decisions of government, we announced another 93 projects would be funded under round two. And it is extraordinary that we are still waiting. So I call on this minister. I mean, my concern is that she is a soft target for Labor's razor gang. That Labor's razor gang in the lead up to the budget is looking to this program to make savage cuts along with the many other anticipated cuts to regional communities via regional programs that we proudly delivered. And so where is the minister's confirmation that these 93 pr projects will be funded and $140 million will be delivered under the regional connectivity program? We've seen no action on the extension of the peri-urban mobile program to peri-urban areas in regional cities. Uh, we've seen a paltry commitment, frankly, to regional communications, but this uh, is an absolute disgrace. It would be an act of political bastardry if this program was cut. The regions matter. Every community matters. This funding was going into communities which desperately needed upgrades to their connectivity so they could work, so those communities could work so students living in those communities could study, so businesses could function. And so I say shame on this government. Why would the Albanese government leave these communities still waiting, still waiting for certainty after more than four months? It is absolutely appalling, and I again call on the minister to confirm the $140 million for the regional connectivity program immediately and start to demonstrate that the regions across this country matter. Thank you. Thank you Senator Anderson. Senator Roberts. Thank you, As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my topic tonight is nuclear power. The war on the most cost-effective energy source, coal, 
means that nuclear is the only way to overcome problems inherent in wind and solar. Problems around reliability, capacity, cost and technical issues, inertia, frequency and instability. If we do not turn on to nuclear, we will have blackouts and electricity price rises that will decimate industry and employment in this country. In Europe, the quiet nuclear revolution began after conflict with Russia exposed the solar and wind industry's terminal flaws. Despite half a trillion dollars spent across Europe, it became obvious that wind turbines, solar panels and big batteries could not sustain Europe's need for power, ever. You cannot achieve the UN's insane net zero target without going nuclear. The European Union has voted to classify nuclear energy as an environmentally sustainable economic activity. In other words, nuclear is now green energy. While uranium, nuclear fuel, is not renewable, neither are windmills, solar panels and dead batteries. As a supposed problem, nuclear waste is exaggerated. Spent fuel is in part reused in specially designed power plants called breeder reactors. The small amount of remaining waste can be stored safely. Australia's ANSTO is a leader in nuclear waste technology with its SINROC project. For example, American data shows that if nuclear energy provided 100 per cent of their power, waste per person would amount to just 40 grams per person per year. Breeder reactors reduce this waste to a minuscule 4 grams per person per year. For people genuinely worried about the fiery apocalypse of climate variability, if your children are out gluing themselves to inanimate objects, nuclear is the virtuous climate salvation you've all been looking for. More importantly, the physical footprint of a nuclear plant is tiny compared to solar and winds carpet bombing of our beautiful countryside. A 1,000 megawatt nuclear facility requires two and a half square kilometres. That's it. That's all. To, e to equal the same output, a solar plant would need 75 times the land area and wind turbines would need 360 times the land. This is an important when considering how many of these damn things the Greens, Teals and ALP want to build. That would need 3 million solar panels or 430 wind turbines operating at continuous capacity to replace one nuclear plant. An average solar and wind availability, on average solar and wind availability, that would be four times more though, 12 million solar panels, 1,720 wind turbines. A single pellet of uranium, roughly the size of your thumb, produces the same amount of energy as 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, 120 gallons of oil or one tonne of coal. Yet successive governments that claim to rank apocalyptic climate variability as their primary policy consideration ban it. We talk about Australia as a leader in innovation, technical achievement and global solutions. And yet we allow ourselves to fall behind in the nuclear power renaissance. As of 2021, worldwide there are 55 nuclear reactors under construction, 90 on audit or planned, and 300 proposed to be added to the 440 existing operating reactors. Work is being done to increase the lifespan of existing reactors from 40 to 60 years. Any nuclear reactor we build now will be saving Australia from blackouts 50 years after wind, solar and batteries built today will have died and been turned into a toxic landfill. Australia is the number one global holder of uranium reserves with between 28 to 30 per cent or 1.7 million tonnes of the world's known reserves. That's enough to last for generations. There's no safer place too in the world for nuclear than Australia. We are geologically stable, sitting in the middle of a tectonic plate. The issues with old plants in poorly chosen locations overseas do not relate to nuclear power plants like we would build in Australia. The reality is nuclear is one of the world's safest energy generators and, as a bonus, it doesn't rely on child slave labour or on a communist superpower dictatorship with a track record of chucking tantrums when its human rights record is questioned. Nor does it promote the blue economy of destructive deep sea mining for the raw materials needed to produce battery backup for wind and solar. I understand why renewable barons and their pet politicians rally against nuclear. Nuclear invalidates completely the billionaire solar and wind parasites. It poses a catastrophic and fatal threat to crony capitalism and their billion dollar energy portfolios that Greens politics enriches. One Nation stands for reliable, affordable, strategically safe and clean energy for the future, based on science, not fairy tales. We Thank have one you, flag, Senator we Roberts, have one community, we are one nation. Senator Green. Thank you, President. 
Uh, it was certainly clear in the lead up to the Jobs and Skills Summit that was held here in Canberra and throughout that summit and in the um, uh, preceding days that the overwhelming feedback that we received as a government from workers and from employers alike was that the complexity and impracticality of our current bargaining system. It's a system that hasn't delivered real wage increases for workers for almost a decade. And we know that under the Liberal National Government, the system had become so complex and where regulation or legislation dangled the carrot of supposedly fair bargaining, but never delivered for workers. In fact, it never was intended to under the previous government, so cosy with the idea of reducing workers' wages that they joined a case in the High Court to try to overturn a case about same job, same pay. Somehow giving workers the right to fairly bargain under the LNP, but they believe that it would somehow upend business. But the truth is that low wages are hurting businesses and our economy. Now, as senators in this chamber may recall, since I was elected, I've raised on a multiple occasions the plight of workers in central Queensland who have been subject to BHP's so-called in-house labour hire provider called Operation Services. This is an absolute, absolute example of where people are working the same job but not getting paid the same wages. And it's not happened overnight. This has been going on for years. In 2018, BHP set up two $1 shelf companies registered as OSMCAP P2I Limited and OSACPM P2I Limited, really trying to show their cards there by using those letters. These companies are the employing entities of operations service workers. Well, these companies submitted two proposed enterprise agreements to the Fair Work Commission, the Operations Services Maintenance Agreement, the Operations Services Production Agreement 2018, and both agreements were voted on by a small number, a small number of workers in the iron ore industry in WA. In fact, so small, it was about nine people altogether voted on these agreements. Now, that seems to me to really indicate that something wrong was going on here. It is dodgy. But what is even dodgier is that since these agreements have, were made, the full bench of the Fair Work Commission thought that they were dodgy, upheld an appeal by the CFMEU and the AMWU to have un the unfair enterprise agreements thrown out and still BHP maintains that operations services is improving job security. But we know that that simply isn't true. In 2020, I raised the case of workers at one of the mines near Moranbah who were told that they would have to choose to work on Christmas Day and that workers in operations services would be paid a different wage. It is clear to anyone who looks at these agreements that they have been written up and intended to circumvent enterprise agreements that have been fairly bargained. Well, since that time, BHP are now required to form a new agreement with operations service workers, workers. They've been told to go back to the drawing board. And it would be helpful if I could come to this Senate and say, after all these years and after all this time, BHP has decided that they would finally like to do the right thing by their workers. But can I tell you that almost two years later, two years later, they started bargaining for these new agreements in December 2020, they have still refused to put a good faith agreement forward for workers. And for B BMA, um, the other agreement that is being negotiated, they have been bargaining for 15 months. Well, my message to BHP tonight is to bargain fairly with your workers. And my message to those organisers and those delegates and those workers in central Queensland is to stay strong and to stay united. And for a change in this place, you have a government who is on your side 
and you have a government that knows Thank you, Senator that Senator Green. If your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin. From the perspective of an individual seeking redemption, it is by its very nature a deep longing for one's life to be made good through being engaged in a pursuit that is greater than oneself. In essence, it is seeking to renew oneself by a noble action in order to seek forgiveness from those who have wronged. I have followed with interest the public commentary regarding James Hurd's journey seeking redemption by putting himself forward to be the coach of the Essendon Football Club. I wish him well on this journey. He is very qualified for the role. Under his leadership, but not at his specific direction, 34 young men were administered with an experimental drug that had not been approved for human use anywhere in the world. It now appears that the club is willing to consider his return to a leadership role and the AFL has not sought to intervene. Presumably, the argument underpinning the view that he can return to coaching is that he has served out the penalty that was imposed upon him. I accept that this argument has some currency. What has been less discussed is whether he should be chosen to be the coach from a current and past player's perspective. I believe their voices must be heard. Further, the community's perspective on whether he should be appointed must also be taken into account. Sporting clubs only operate in modern Australia with the benefit of social licence. The AFL is assisted by the federal government monies. And so I feel that I can enter this debate even from my eerie in the Senate chamber. For an entity to retain their social licence, they must operate with legitimacy, credibility and with trust. I note that if Heard had demonstrated such leadership failings as a member of the ADF, he would have been discharged with no right of return. Such are the standards of behaviour our community expects from its military leaders. Forgiveness is achieved when an individual assumes responsibility for their wrongdoing. In other words, it occurs when it is acknowledged that a wrong was committed, that it caused harm with the wrongdoer admitting that they were culpable. If Heard is to be seriously considered for a coaching role, he must make it very clear that he seeks forgiveness for a very great wrong. His public comments to date, as reported, do not make this clear. I hope that this is because of poor reporting of his position. Further, Heard must commit himself to leading the club in a completely different manner than he had, has done in the past. The club must make it clear that it will put into place, if it has not done so already, mechanisms that will ensure that, a, that their players are properly protected. But more importantly, it must may be, may be clear to all that evidence past and present players have forgiven Heard. Importantly, current players must be able to leave the club without penalty should they not wish to serve under his leadership. To hold players to their contract will, in my opinion, be oppressive and capricious. Only then can Heard's appointment be entertained, while allowing the AFL and the Essendon Football Club to retain their social licence to operate. To take any other course would be to devalue and degrade the players, as well as undermine Heard's ability to succeed in the role. I wish James Heard well on his journey and every success. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. The Senate stands adjourned and we will meet again on Tuesday, the 25th of October at 12 noon.